Introduction and Plan of the Work of the Wealth of Nations This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith Introduction and Plan of the Work the annual labor of every nation is the fund which originally supplies it with all the necessaries and conveniencies of life which it annually consumes and which consist always either in the immediate produce of that labor or in what is purchased with that produce from other nations according therefore as this produce or what is purchased with it bears a greater or smaller proportion to the number of those who are to consume it the nation will be better or worse supplied with all the necessaries and conveniencies for which it has occasion but this proportion must in every nation be regulated by two different circumstances first by the skill dexterity and judgment with which its labor is generally applied and secondly by the proportion between the number of those who are employed in useful labor and that of those who are not so employed whatever be the soil climate or extent of territory of any particular nation the abundance or scantiness of its annual supply must in that particular situation depend upon those two circumstances the abundance or scantiness of this supply too seems to depend more upon the former of those two circumstances than upon the latter among the savage nations of hunters and fishers every individual who is able to work is more or less employed in useful labor and endeavors to provide as well as he can the necessaries and conveniencies of life for himself and such of his family or tribe as are either too old or too young or too infirm to go a-hunting and fishing such nations however are so miserably poor that from mere want they are frequently reduced or at least think themselves reduced to the necessity sometimes of directly destroying and sometimes of abandoning their infants their old people and those afflicted with lingering diseases to perish with hunger or to be devoured by wild beasts among civilized and thriving nations on the contrary though a great number of people do not labor at all many of whom consume the produce of ten times frequently of a hundred times more labor than the greater part of those who work yet the produce of the whole labor of the society is so great that all are often abundantly supplied and a workman even of the lowest and poorest order if he is frugal and industrious may enjoy a greater share of the necessaries and conveniencies of life than it is possible for any savage to acquire the causes of this improvement in the productive powers of labor and the order according to which its produce is naturally distributed among the different ranks and conditions of men in the society make the subject of the first book of this inquiry whatever be the actual state of the skill dexterity and judgment with which labor is applied in any nation the abundance or scantiness of its annual supply must depend during the continuance of that state upon the proportion between the number of those who are annually employed in useful labor and that of those who are not so employed the number of useful and productive labors it will hereafter appear is everywhere in proportion to the quantity of capital stock which is employed in setting them to work and to the particular way in which it is so employed the second book therefore treats of the nature of capital stock of the manner in which it is gradually accumulated and of the different quantities of labor which it puts into motion according to the different ways in which it is employed nations tolerably well advanced as to skill dexterity and judgment in the application of labor have followed very different plans in the general conduct or direction of it and those plans have not all been equally favorable to the greatness of its produce the policy of some nations has given extraordinary encouragement to the industry of the country that of others to the industry of towns scarce any nation has dealt equally and impartially with every sort of industry since the downfall of the roman empire the policy of europe has been more favorable to arts manufactures and commerce the industry of towns than to agriculture the industry of the country the circumstances which seem to have introduced and established this policy are explained in the third book though these different plans were perhaps first introduced by the private industries and prejudices of particular orders of men without any regard to or foresight of their consequences upon the general welfare of the society yet they have given occasion to very different theories of political economy 
of which some magnify the importance of that industry which is carried on in towns, others of that which is carried on in the country. Those theories have had a considerable influence, not only upon the opinions of men of learning, but upon the public conduct of princes and sovereign states. I have endeavored, in the fourth book, to explain, as fully and distinctly as I can, those different theories, and the principal effects which they have produced in different ages and nations. To explain in what has consisted the revenue of the great body of the people, or what has been the nature of those funds, which, in different ages and nations, have supplied their annual consumption, is the object of these four first books. The fifth and last book treats of the revenue of the sovereign or commonwealth. In this book I have endeavored to show, first, what are the necessary expenses of the sovereign or commonwealth, which of those expenses ought to be defrayed by the general contribution of the whole society, and which of them, by that of some particular part only, or of some particular members of it. Secondly, what are the different methods in which the whole society may be made to contribute towards defraying the expenses incumbent on the whole society, and what are the principal advantages and inconveniences of each of those methods, and, thirdly, and lastly, what are the reasons and causes which have induced almost all modern governments to mortgage some part of this revenue, or to contract debts, and what have been the effects of those debts upon the real wealth, the annual produce of the land and labor of the society. End of Introduction and Plan of the Work Chapter 1 of Book 1 of The Wealth of Nations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Book 1 of the causes of improvement in the productive powers of labor, and of the order according to which its produce is naturally distributed among the different ranks of the people. Chapter 1 of Book 1 Of the Division of Labor The greatest improvements in the productive powers of labor, and the greater part of the skill, dexterity, and judgment with which it is anywhere directed or applied, seem to have been the effects of the division of labor. The effects of the division of labor in the general business of society will be more easily understood by considering in what manner it operates in some particular manufacturers. It is commonly supposed to be carried furthest in some very trifling ones, not perhaps that it is really carried further in them than in others of more importance, but in those trifling manufacturers which are destined to supply the small wants of but a small number of people, the whole number of workmen must necessarily be small and those employed in every different branch of the work can often be collected into the same workhouse and placed at once under the view of the spectator in those great manufactures on the contrary which are destined to supply the great wants of the great body of the people every different branch of the work employs so great a number of workmen that it is impossible to collect them all into the same workhouse we can seldom see more at one time than those employed in one single branch though in such manufactures therefore the work may really be divided into a much greater number of parts than in those of a more trifling nature the division is not near so obvious and has accordingly been much less observed to take an example therefore from a very trifling manufacture but one in which the division of labor has been very often taken notice of the trade of a pen-maker a workman not educated to this business which the division of labor has rendered a distinct trade nor acquainted with the use of the machinery employed in it to the invention of which the same division of labor has probably given occasion could scarce perhaps with his utmost industry make one pen in a day and certainly could not make twenty but in the way in which this business is now carried on not only the whole work is a peculiar trade but it is divided into a number of branches of which the greater part are likewise peculiar trades one man draws out the wire another straights it a third cuts it a fourth points it a fifth grinds it at the top for receiving the head to make the head requires two or three distinct operations to put it on is a peculiar business to whiten the pins is another it is even a trade by itself to put them into the paper, 
and the important business of making a pin is, in this manner, divided into about eighteen distinct operations, which, in some manufactories, are all performed by distinct hands, though in others the same man will sometimes perform two or three of them. I have seen a small manufactory of this kind, where ten men only were employed, and where some of them consequently performed two or three distinct operations. But though they were very poor, and therefore but indifferently accommodated with the necessary machinery, they could, when they exerted themselves, make among them about twelve pounds of pins in a day. There are in a pound upwards of four thousand pins of a middling size. Those ten persons, therefore, could make among them upwards of forty-eight thousand pins in a day. Each person, therefore, making a tenth part of forty-eight thousand pins, might be considered as making four thousand eight hundred pins in a day. But if they had all wrought separately and independently, and without any of them having been educated to this peculiar business, they certainly could not each of them have made twenty, perhaps not one pin in a day, that is certainly not the two hundred and fortieth, perhaps not the four thousand eight hundredth, part of what they are at present capable of performing, in consequence of a proper division and combination of their different operations. In every other art and manufacture, the effects of the division of labor are similar to what they are in this very trifling one, though in many of them the labor can neither be so much subdivided nor reduced to so great a simplicity of operation. The division of labor, however, so far as it can be introduced, occasions in every art a proportionable increase of the productive powers of labor. The separation of different trades and employments from one another seems to have taken place in consequence of this advantage. This separation, too, is generally carried furthest in those countries which enjoy the highest degree of industry and improvement. What is the work of one man, in a rude state of society, being generally that of several in an improved one? In every improved society, the farmer is generally nothing but a farmer, the manufacturer nothing but a manufacturer. The labor, too, which is necessary to produce any one complete manufacture, is almost always divided among a great number of hands. How many different trades are employed in each branch of the linen and woolen manufacturers, from the growers of the flax and the wool, to the bleachers and smoothers of the linen, or to the dyers and dressers of the cloth? The nature of agriculture, indeed, does not admit of so many subdivisions of labor, nor of so complete a separation of one business from another, as manufacturers. It is impossible to separate so entirely the business of the grazier from that of the corn farmer, as the trade of the carpenter is commonly separated from that of the smith. The spinner is almost always a distinct person from the weaver, but the plowman, the harrower, the sower of the seed, and the reaper of the corn are often the same. The occasions for those different sorts of labor returning with the different seasons of the year, it is impossible that one man should be constantly employed in any one of them. This impossibility of making so complete and entire a separation of all the different branches of labor employed in agriculture is perhaps the reason why the improvement of the productive powers of labor in this art does not always keep pace with their improvements in manufactures. The most opulent nations, indeed, generally excel all their nations in agriculture as well as in manufactures, but they are commonly more distinguished by their superiority in the latter than in the former. Their lands are in general better cultivated, and having more labor and expense bestowed upon them, produce more in proportion to the extent and natural fertility of the ground. But this superiority of produce is seldom much more than in proportion to the superiority of labor and expense. In agriculture the labor of the rich country is not always much more productive than that of the poor, or at least it is never so much more productive as it commonly is in manufactures. The corn of the rich country, therefore, will not always, in the same degree of goodness, come cheaper to market than that of the poor. The corn of Poland, in the same degree of goodness, is as cheap as that of France, notwithstanding the superior opulence and improvement of the latter country. The corn of France is, in the corn provinces, fully as good, and in most years nearly about the same price with the corn of England, though in opulence and improvement France is perhaps inferior to England. The corn lands of England, however, are better cultivated than those of France, and the corn lands of France are said to be much better cultivated than those of Poland. But though the poor country, notwithstanding the inferiority of its cultivation, can in some measure rival the rich in the cheapness and goodness of its corn, 
it can pretend to no such competition in its manufacturers, at least if those manufacturers suit the soil, climate, and situation of the rich country. The silks of France are better and cheaper than those of England, because the silk manufacture, at least under the present high duties upon the importation of raw silk, does not so well suit the climate of England as that of France. But the hardware and the coarse woolens of England are beyond all comparison superior to those of France, and much cheaper too, in the same degree of goodness. In Poland there are said to be scarce any manufacturers of any kind, a few of those coarser household manufacturers excepted, without which no country can well subsist. This great increase in the quantity of work, which, in consequence of the division of labor, the same number of people are capable of performing, is owing to three different circumstances. First, to the increase of dexterity in every particular workman. Secondly, to the saving of the time which is commonly lost in passing from one species of work to another. And lastly, to the invention of a great number of machines which facilitate and abridge labor, and enable one man to do the work of many. First, the improvement of the dexterity of the workman necessarily increases the quantity of the work he can perform, and the division of labor, by reducing every man's business to some one simple operation, and by making this operation the sole employment of his life, necessarily increases very much the dexterity of the workman. A common smith, who, though accustomed to handle the hammer, has never been used to make nails, if, upon some particular occasion, he is obliged to attempt it, will scarce, I am assured, be able to make above two or three hundred nails in a day, and those two very bad ones. A smith who has been accustomed to make nails, but whose sole or principal business has not been that of a nailer, can seldom, with his utmost diligence, make more than eight hundred or a thousand nails in a day. I have seen several boys, under twenty years of age, who had never exercised any other trade but that of making nails, and who, when they exerted themselves, could make, each of them, upwards of two thousand three hundred nails in a day. The making of a nail, however, is by no means one of the simplest operations. The same person blows the bellows, stirs or mends the fire as there is occasion, heats the iron, and forges every part of the nail. In forging the head, too, he is obliged to change his tools. The different operations into which the making of a pin or of a metal button is subdivided are all of them much more simple, and the dexterity of the person of whose life it has been the sole business to perform them is usually much greater. The rapidity with which some of the operations of those manufacturers are performed exceeds what the human hand could, by those who had never seen them, be supposed capable of acquiring. Secondly, the advantage which is gained by saving the time commonly lost in passing from one sort of work to another is much greater than we should at first view be apt to imagine it. It is impossible to pass very quickly from one kind of work to another that is carried on in a different place and with quite different tools. A country weaver, who cultivates a small farm, must lose a good deal of time in passing from his loom to the field, and from the field to his loom. When the two trades can be carried on in the same workhouse, the loss of time is, no doubt, much less. It is, even in this case, however, very considerable. A man commonly saunters a little in turning his hand from one sort of employment to another. When he first begins the new work, he is seldom very keen and hearty. His mind, as they say, does not go to it, and for some time he rather trifles than applies to good purpose. The habit of sauntering, and of indolent careless application, which is naturally, or rather necessarily, acquired by every country workman who is obliged to change his work and his tools every half hour, and to apply his hand in twenty different ways almost every day of his life, renders him almost always slothful and lazy, and incapable of any vigorous application, even on the most pressing occasions. Independent, therefore, of his deficiency in point of dexterity, this cause alone must always reduce considerably the quantity of work which he is capable of performing. Thirdly, and lastly, everybody must be sensible how much labor is facilitated and abridged by the application of proper machinery. It is unnecessary to give any example. I shall only observe, therefore, that the invention of all those machines by which labor is so much facilitated and abridged, seems to have been originally owing to the division of labor. Men are much more likely to discover easier and readier methods of attaining any object, when the whole attention of their minds is directed towards that single object, than when it is dissipated among a great variety of things. 
but in consequence of the division of labour the whole of every man's attention comes naturally to be directed towards some one very simple object it is naturally to be accepted therefore that some one or other of those who are employed in each particular branch of labour should soon find out easier and readier methods of performing their own particular work whenever the nature of it admits of such improvement a great part of the machines made use of in those manufactures in which labour is most subdivided were originally the invention of common workmen who being each of them employed in some very simple operation naturally turned their thoughts towards finding out easier and readier methods of performing it whoever has been much accustomed to visit such manufactures most frequently have been shown very pretty machines which were the inventions of such workmen in order to facilitate and quicken their own particular part of the work in the first fire engines a boy was constantly employed to open and shut alternately the communication between the boiler and the cylinder according as the piston either ascended or descended one of those boys who loved to play with his companions observed that by tying a string from the handle of the valve which opened this communication to another part of the machine the valve would open and shut without his assistance and leave him at liberty to divert himself with his playfellows one of the greatest improvements that has been made upon this machine since it was first invented was in this manner the discovery of a boy who wanted to save his own labor all the improvements in machinery however have by no means been the inventions of those who had occasion to use the machines many improvements have been made by the ingenuity of the makers of the machines when to make them became the business of a peculiar trade and some by that of those who are called philosophers or men of speculation whose trade it is not to do anything but to observe everything and who upon that account are often capable of combining together the powers of the most distant and dissimilar objects in the progress of society philosophy or speculation becomes like every other employment the principal or sole trade and occupation of a particular class of citizens like every other employment too it is subdivided into a great number of different branches each of which affords occupation to a peculiar tribe or class of philosophers and this subdivision of employment in a philosophy as well as in every other business improved dexterity and saves time each individual becomes more expert in his own peculiar branch more work is done upon the whole and the quantity of science is considerably increased by it it is the great multiplication of the productions of all the different arts in consequence of the division of labor which occasions in a well-governed society the universal opulence which extends itself to the lowest ranks of the people every workman has a great quantity of his own work to dispose of beyond what he himself has occasion for and every other workman being exactly in the same situation he is enabled to exchange a great quantity of his own goods for a great quantity or what comes to the same thing for the price of a great quantity of theirs he supplies them abundantly with what they have occasion for and they accommodate him as amply with what he has occasion for and a general plenty diffuses itself through all the different ranks of the society observe the accommodation of the most common artificer or day labour in a civilized and thriving country and you will perceive that the number of people of whose industry a part though but a small part has been employed in procuring him this accommodation exceeds all computation the woollen coat for example which covers the day labour as coarse and rough as it may appear is the produce of the joint labour of a great multitude of workmen the shepherd the sorter of the wool the wool comber or carter the dyer the scribbler the spinner the weaver the fuller the dresser with many others must all join their different arts in order to complete even this homely production how many merchants and carriers besides must have been employed in transporting the materials from some of those workmen to others who often live in a very distant part of the country how much commerce and navigation in particular how many shipbuilders sailors sailmakers rope makers must have been employed in order to bring together the different drugs made use of by the dyer which often come from the remotest corners of the world what a variety of labor too is necessary in order to produce the tools of the meanest of those workmen to say nothing of such complicated machines as the ship of the sailor the mill of the fuller or even the loom of the weaver let us consider only what a variety of labor is requisite in order to form that very simple machine the shears with which the shepherd clips the wool the miner the builder of the furnace for smelting the ore the feller of the timber the burner of the charcoal to be made use of in the smelting house the brickmaker the bricklayer the workmen who attend the furnace 
the millwright, the forger, the smith, must all of them join their different arts in order to produce them. Were we to examine in the same manner all the different parts of his dress and household furniture, the coarse linen shirt which he wears next his skin, the shoes which cover his feet, the bed which he lies on, and all the different parts which compose it, the kitchen grate at which he prepares his victuals, the coals which he makes use of for that purpose, dug from the bowels of the earth and brought to him perhaps by a long sea and a long land carriage, all the other utensils of his kitchen, all the furniture of his table, the knives and forks, the earthen or pewter plates upon which he serves up and divides his victuals, the different hands employed in preparing his bread and his beer, the glass window which lets in the heat and the light, and keeps out the wind and the rain, with all the knowledge and art requisite for preparing that beautiful and happy invention, without which these northern parts of the world could scarce have afforded a very comfortable habitation, together with the tools of all the different workmen employed in producing those different conveniencies. If we examine, I say, all these things, and consider what a variety of labor is employed about each of them, we shall be sensible that, without the assistance and cooperation of many thousands, the very meanest person in a civilized country could not be provided, even according to, what we very falsely imagine, the easy and simple manner in which he is commonly accommodated. Compared, indeed, with the more extravagant luxury of the great, his accommodation must no doubt appear extremely simple and easy. And yet it may be true, perhaps, that the accommodation of a European prince does not always so much exceed that of an industrious and frugal peasant, as the accommodation of the latter exceeds that of many an African king, the absolute masters of the lives and liberties of ten thousand naked savages. End of Book One, Chapter One Chapter Two of Book One of the Wealth of Nations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Chapter Two of Book One of the Principle which Gives Occasion to the Division of Labor. This division of labor, from which so many advantages are derived, is not originally the effect of any human wisdom, which foresees and intends that general opulence to which it gives occasion. It is the necessary, though very slow and gradual, consequence of a certain propensity in human nature, which has in view no such extensive utility, the propensity to truck, barter, and exchange one thing for another. Whether this propensity be one of those original principles in human nature of which no further account can be given, or whether, as seems more probable, it be the necessary consequence of the faculties of reason and speech, it belongs not to our present subject to inquire. It is common to all men, and to be found in no other race of animals, which seem to know neither this nor any other species of contracts. Two greyhounds, in running down the same hare, have sometimes the appearance of acting in some sort of concert. Each turns her towards his companion, or endeavors to intercept her when his companion turns her towards himself. This, however, is not the effect of any contract, but of the accidental concurrence of their passions in the same object at that particular time. Nobody ever saw a dog make a fair and deliberate exchange of one bone for another with another dog. Nobody ever saw one animal, by its gestures and natural cries, signify to another, this is mine, that's yours. I'm willing to give this for that. When an animal wants to obtain something either of a man or of another animal, it has no other means of persuasion but to gain the favor of those whose service it requires. A puppy fawns upon its dam, and a spaniel endeavors, by a thousand attractions, to engage the attention of its master who is at dinner when it wants to be fed by him. Man sometimes uses the same arts with his brethren, and when he has no other means of engaging them to act according to his inclinations, endeavors by every servile and fawning intention to obtain their good will. He has not time, however, to do this upon every occasion. In civilized society he stands at all times in need of the cooperation and assistance of great multitudes, while his whole life is scarce sufficient to gain the friendship of a few persons. In almost every other race of animals, each individual, when it is grown up to maturity, is entirely independent, and in its natural state has occasion for the assistance of no other living creature. But man has almost constant occasion for the help of his brethren, and it is in vain for him to expect it from their benevolence only. 
he will be more likely to prevail if he can interest their self-love in his favor, and show them that it is for their own advantage to do for him what he requires of them. Whoever offers to another a bargain of any kind proposes to do this. Give me that which I want, and you shall have this which you want, is the meaning of every such offer. And it is in this manner that we obtain from one another the far greater part of those good offices which we stand in need of. It is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. We address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love, and never talk to them of our own necessities, but of their advantages. Nobody but a beggar chooses to depend chiefly upon the benevolence of his fellow citizens. Even a beggar does not depend upon it entirely. The charity of well-disposed people, indeed, supplies him with the whole fund of his subsistence. But though this principle ultimately provides him with all the necessaries of life which he has occasion for, it neither does nor can provide him with them as he has occasion for them. The greater part of his occasional wants are supplied in the same manner as those of other people, by treaty, by barter, and by purchase. With the money which one man gives him, he purchases food. The old clothes which another bestows upon him, he exchanges for other clothes which suit him better, or for lodging, or for food, or for money, with which he can buy either food, clothes, or lodging, as he has occasion. As it is by treaty, by barter, and by purchase, that we obtain from one another the greater part of those mutual good offices which we stand in need of, so it is this same trucking disposition which originally gives occasion to the division of labor. In a tribe of hunters or shepherds, a particular person makes bows and arrows, for example, with more readiness and dexterity than any other. He frequently exchanges them for cattle or for venison with his companions, and he finds at last that he can, in this manner, get more cattle and venison than if he himself went to the field to catch them. From a regard to his own interest, therefore, the making of bows and arrows grows to be his chief business, and he becomes a sort of armorer. Another excels in making the frames and covers of their little huts or movable houses. He is accustomed to be of use in this way to his neighbors, who reward him in the same manner with cattle and with venison, till at last he finds it his interest to dedicate himself entirely to this employment, and to become a sort of house-carpenter. In the same manner a third becomes a smith or a brazier, a fourth a tanner or dresser of hides or skins, the principal part of the clothing of savages and thus the certainty of being able to exchange all that surplus part of the produce of his own labor which is over and above his own consumption for such parts of the produce of other men's labor as he may have occasion for encourages every man to apply himself to a particular occupation and to cultivate and bring to perfection whatever talent of genius he may possess for that particular species of business the difference of natural talents in different men is in reality much less than we are aware of and the very different genius which appears to distinguish men of different professions when grown up to maturity is not upon many occasions so much the cause as the effect of the division of labor the difference between the most dissimilar characters between a philosopher and a common street porter for example seems to arise not so much from nature as from habit custom and education when they came into the world, and for the first six or eight years of their existence, they were, perhaps, very much alike, and neither their parents nor playfellows could perceive any remarkable difference. About that age, or soon after, they came to be employed in very different occupations. The difference of talents comes then to be taken notice of, and widens by degrees, till at last the vanity of the philosopher is willing to acknowledge scarce any resemblance. But without the disposition to truck, barter, and exchange, every man must have procured to himself every necessary and conveniency of life which he wanted. All must have had the same duties to perform and the same work to do, and there could have been no such difference of employment as could alone give occasion to any great difference of talents. As it is this disposition which forms that difference of talents, so remarkable among men of different professions, so it is this same disposition which renders that difference useful. Many tribes of animals, acknowledged to be all of the same species, derive from nature a much more remarkable distinction of genius than what, antecedent to custom and education, appears to take place among men. By nature a philosopher is not, in genius and disposition, half so different from a street porter, as a mastiff is from a greyhound, or a greyhound from a spaniel, or this last from a shepherd's dog. Those different tribes of animals, however, though all of the same species, are of scarce any use to one another. 
The strength of the mastiff is not in the least supported either by the swiftness of the greyhound, or by the sagacity of the spaniel, or by the docility of the shepherd's dog. The effects of those different geniuses and talents, for want of the power or disposition to barter and exchange, cannot be brought into a common stock, and do not in the least contribute to the better accommodation and conveniency of the species. Each animal is still obliged to support and defend itself, separately and independently, and derives no sort of advantage from that variety of talents with which nature has distinguished its fellows. Among men, on the contrary, the most dissimilar geniuses are of use to one another. The different produces of their respective talents, by the general disposition to truck, barter, and exchange, being brought, as it were, into a common stock, where every man may purchase whatever part of the produce of other men's talents he has occasion for. End of Book 1, Chapter 2《Chapter Three of Book One of the Wealth of Nations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Chapter Three of Book One. That the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market. As it is the power of exchanging that gives occasion to the division of labor, so the extent of this division must always be limited by the extent of that power, or, in other words, by the extent of the market. When the market is very small, no person can have any encouragement to dedicate himself entirely to one employment, for want of the power to exchange all that surplus part of the produce of his own labor, which is over and above his own consumption, for such parts of the produce of other men's labor as he has occasion for. There are some sorts of industry, even of the lowest kind, which can be carried on nowhere but in a great town. A porter, for example, can find employment and subsistence in no other place. A village is by much too narrow a sphere for him. Even an ordinary market town is scarce large enough to afford him constant occupation. In the lone houses and very small villages which are scattered about in so desert a country as the highlands of Scotland, Every farmer must be butcher, baker, and brewer, for his own family. In such situations we can scarce expect to find even a smith, a carpenter, or a mason, within less than twenty miles of another of the same trade. The scattered families that live at eight or ten miles distance from the nearest of them must learn to perform themselves a great number of little pieces of work, for which, in more populous countries, they would call in the assistance of those workmen. Country workmen are almost everywhere obliged to apply themselves to all the different branches of industry that have so much affinity to one another as to be employed about the same sort of materials. A country carpenter deals in every sort of work that is made of wood, a country smith in every sort of work that is made of iron. The former is not only a carpenter, but a joiner, a cabinet maker, and even a carver in wood, as well as a wheelwright, a plowright, a cart, and wagon maker. The employments of the latter are still more various. It is impossible that there should be such a trade as even that of a nailer in the remote and inland parts of the highlands of Scotland. Such a workman at the rate of a thousand nails a day and three hundred working days in the year will make three hundred thousand nails in the year. But in such a situation it would be impossible to dispose of one thousand, that is, of one day's work in the year. As by means of water carriage, a more extensive market is open to every sort of industry than what land carriage alone can afford it. So it is upon the sea coast and along the banks of navigable rivers that industry of every kind naturally begins to subdivide and improve itself, and it is frequently not till a long time after that those improvements extend themselves to the inland parts of the country. A broad-wheeled wagon, attended by two men, and drawn by eight horses, in about six weeks' time carries and brings back between London and Edinburgh near four-ton weight of goods. In about the same time, a ship, navigated by six or eight men, and sailing between the ports of London and Leith, frequently carries and brings back two hundred-ton weight of goods. Six or eight men, therefore, by the help of water carriage, can carry and bring back in the same time the same quantity of goods between London and Edinburgh as fifty broad-wheeled wagons, attended by a hundred men, and drawn by four hundred horses. Upon two hundred tons of goods, therefore, carried by the cheapest land carriage from London to Edinburgh, there must be charged the maintenance of a hundred men for three weeks, and both the maintenance and what is nearly equal to maintenance the wear and tear of four hundred horses, as well as of fifty great wagons. 
whereas upon the same quantity of goods carried by water there is to be charged only the maintenance of six or eight men and the wear and tear of a ship of two hundred tons burthen together with the value of the superior risk or the difference of the insurance between land and water carriage were there no other communication between those two places therefore but by land carriage as no goods could be transported from the one to the other except such whose price was very considerable in proportion to their weight they could carry on but a small part of that commerce which at present subsists between them and consequently could give but a small part of that encouragement which they at present mutually afford to each other's industry there could be little or no commerce of any kind between the distant parts of the world what goods could bear the expense of land carriage between london and calcutta or if there were any so precious as to be able to support this expense with what safety could they be transported through the territories of so many barbarous nations those two cities however at present carry on a very considerable commerce with each other and by mutually affording a market give a good deal of encouragement to each other's industry since such therefore are the advantages of water carriage it is natural that the first improvements of art and industry should be made where this conveniency opens the whole world for a market to the produce of every sort of labour and that they should always be much later in extending themselves into the inland parts of the country the inland parts of the country can for a long time have no other market for the greater part of their goods but the country which lies round about them and separates them from the sea coast and the great navigable rivers the extent of the market therefore must for a long time be in proportion to the riches and populousness of that country and consequently their improvement must always be posterior to the improvement of that country in our north american colonies the plantations have constantly followed either the sea coast or the banks of the navigable rivers and have scarce anywhere extended themselves to any considerable difference from both the nations that according to the best authenticated history appear to have been first civilized were those that dwelt round the coast of the mediterranean sea that sea by far the greatest inlet that is known in the world having no tides nor consequently any waves except such as are caused by the wind only was by the smoothness of its surface as well as by the multitude of its islands and the proximity of its neighboring shores extremely favorable to the infant navigation of the world when from their ignorance of the compass men were afraid to quit the view of the coast and from the imperfection of the art of shipbuilding to abandon themselves to the boisterous waves of the ocean to pass beyond the pillars of hercules that is to sail out of the straits of gibraltar was in the ancient world long considered as a most wonderful and dangerous exploit of navigation it was late before even the phoenicians and carthaginians the most skilful navigators and shipbuilders of those times attempted it and they were for a long time the only nations that did attempt it of all the countries on the coast of the mediterranean sea egypt seems to have been the first in which either agriculture or manufactures were cultivated and improved to any considerable degree upper egypt extends itself nowhere above a few miles from the nile and in lower egypt that great river breaks itself into many different canals which with the assistance of a little art seem to have afforded a communication by water carriage not only between all the great towns but between all the considerable villages and even to many farmhouses in the country nearly in the same manner as the rhine and the mace do in holland at present the extent and easiness of this inland navigation was probably one of the principal causes of the early improvement of egypt the improvements in agriculture and manufactures seem likewise to have been of very great antiquity in the provinces of bengal in the east indies and in some of the eastern provinces of china though the great extent of this antiquity is not authenticated by any histories of whose authority we in this part of the world are well assured in bengal the ganges and several other great rivers form a great number of navigable canals in the same manner as the nile does in egypt in the eastern provinces of china too several great rivers form by their different branches a multitude of canals and by communicating with one another afford an inland navigation much more extensive than that either of the nile or the ganges or perhaps than both of them put together it is remarkable that neither the ancient egyptians nor the indians nor the chinese encouraged foreign commerce but seem all to have derived their great opulence from this inland navigation all the inland parts of africa and all that part of asia which lies any considerable way north of the yuxin and caspian seas 
the ancient Scythia, the modern Tartary and Siberia, seem in all ages of the world to have been in the same barbarous and uncivilized state in which we find them at present. The Sea of Tartary is the frozen ocean, which admits of no navigation, and though some of the greatest rivers in the world run through that country, they are at too great a distance from one another to carry commerce and communication through the greater part of it. There are in Africa none of those great inlets, such as the Baltic and Adriatic seas in Europe, the Mediterranean and Yuxin seas in both Europe and Asia, and the gulfs of Arabia, Persia, India, Bengal, and Siam in Asia, to carry maritime commerce into the interior parts of that great continent. And the great rivers of Africa are at too great a distance from one another to give occasion to any considerable inland navigation. The commerce, besides, which any nation can carry on by means of a river, which does not break itself into any great number of branches or canals, and which runs into another territory before it reaches the sea, can never be very considerable, because it is always in the power of the nations who possess that other territory to obstruct the communication between the upper country and the sea. The navigation of the Danube is of very little use to the different states of Bavaria, Austria, and Hungary, in comparison of what it would be if any of them possessed the whole of its course till it falls into the black sea end of book one chapter three chapter four of book one of the wealth of nations this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Chapter 4 of Book 1 of The Origin and Use of Money. When the division of labor has been once thoroughly established, it is but a very small part of a man's wants which the produce of his own labor can supply. He supplies the far greater part of them by exchanging that surplus part of the produce of his own labor, which is over and above his own consumption for such parts of the produce of other men's labor as he has occasion for. Every man thus lives by exchanging, or becomes in some measure a merchant, and the society itself grows to be what is properly a commercial society. But when the division of labor first began to take place, this power of exchanging must frequently have been very much clogged and embarrassed in its operations. One man, we shall suppose, has more of a certain commodity than he himself has occasion for, while another has less. The former, consequently, would be glad to dispose of, and the latter to purchase, a part of this superfluity. But if this latter should chance to have nothing that the former stands in need of, no exchange can be made between them. The butcher has more meat in his shop than he himself can consume, and the brewer and the baker would each of them be willing to purchase a part of it. But they have nothing to offer in exchange, except the different productions of their respective trades, and the butcher is already provided with all the bread and beer which he has immediate occasion for. No exchange can, in this case, be made between them. He cannot be their merchant, nor they his customers. And they are all of them thus mutually less serviceable to one another. In order to avoid the inconveniency of such situations, every prudent man in every period of society, after the first establishment of the division of labor, must naturally have endeavored to manage his affairs in such a manner as to have at all times by him, besides the peculiar produce of his own industry, a certain quantity of some one commodity or another, such as he imagined few people would be likely to refuse in exchange for the produce of their industry. Many different commodities, it is probable, were successfully both thought of and employed for this purpose. In the rude ages of society, cattle are said to have been the common instrument of commerce, and, though they must have been a most inconvenient one, yet in old times we find things were frequently valued according to the number of cattle which had been given in exchange for them. The armor of Diomede, says Homer, cost only nine oxen, but that of Glaucus cost a hundred oxen. Salt is said to be the common instrument of commerce and exchanges in Abyssinia, a species of shells in some parts of the coast of India, dried cod at Newfoundland, tobacco in Virginia, sugar in some of our West India colonies, hides or dressed leather in some other countries, and there is at this day a village in Scotland where it is not uncommon, I am told, for a workman to carry nails instead of money to the baker's shop or the alehouse. In all countries, however, men seem at last to have been determined by irresistible reasons to give the preference for this employment to metals above every other commodity. 
metals can not only be kept with as little loss as any other commodity, scarce anything being less perishable than they are, but they can likewise, without any loss, be divided into any number of parts, as by fusion those parts can easily be reunited again, a quality which no other equally durable commodities possess, and which, more than any other quality, renders them fit to be the instruments of commerce and circulation. The man who wanted to buy salt, for example, and had nothing but cattle to give in exchange for it, must have been obliged to buy salt to the value of a whole ox, or a whole sheep at a time. He could seldom buy less than this, because what he has to give for it could seldom be divided without loss, and if he had a mind to buy more, he must, for the same reasons, have been obliged to buy double or triple the quantity, the value, to wit of two or three oxen, or of two or three sheep. If, on the contrary, instead of sheep or oxen, he had metals to give in exchange for it, he could easily proportion the quantity of the metal to the precise quantity of the commodity which he had immediate occasion for. Different metals have been made use of by different nations for this purpose. Iron was the common instrument of commerce among the ancient Spartans, copper among the ancient Romans, and gold and silver among all rich and commercial nations. Those metals seem originally to have been made use of for this purpose in rude bars without any stamp or coinage. Thus we are told by Pliny upon the authority of Timaeus, an ancient historian, that till the time of Servius Tullius the Romans had no coined money, but made use of unstamped bars of copper to purchase whatever they had occasion for. These rude bars, therefore, performed at this time the function of money. The use of metals in this rude state was attended with two very considerable inconveniencies, first with the trouble of weighing, and secondly with that of assaying them. In the precious metals, where a small difference in the quantity makes a great difference in the value, even the business of weighing with proper exactness requires at least very accurate weights and scales. The weighing of gold in particular is an operation of some nicety. In the coarser metals, indeed, where a small error would be of little consequence, less accuracy would, no doubt, be necessary. Yet we should find it excessively troublesome if every time a poor man had occasion either to buy or sell a farthing's worth of goods, he was obliged to weigh the farthing. The operation of a saying is still more difficult, still more tedious and unless a part of the metal is fairly melted in the crucible, with proper dissolvents, any conclusion that can be drawn from it is extremely uncertain. Before the institution of coin money, however, unless they went through this tedious and difficult operation, people must always have been liable to the grossest frauds and impositions, and instead of a pound weight of pure silver or pure copper, might receive, in exchange for their goods, an adulterated composition of the coarsest and cheapest materials, which had, however, in their outward appearance, been made to resemble those metals. To prevent such abuses, to facilitate exchanges, and thereby to encourage all sorts of industry and commerce, it has been found necessary, in all countries that have made any considerable advances toward improvement, to affix a public stamp upon certain quantities of such particular metals, as were in those countries commonly made use of to purchase goods. Hence the origin of coin money and of those public offices called mints, institutions exactly of the same nature with those of the allnoggers and stamp masters of woolen and linen cloth. All of them are equally meant to ascertain, by means of a public stamp, the quantity and uniform goodness of those different commodities when brought to market. The first public stamps of this kind that were affixed to the current metals seem in many cases to have been intended to ascertain what it was both most difficult and most important to ascertain, the goodness or fineness of the metal, and to have resembled the sterling mark which is at present affixed to plate and bars of silver, or the Spanish mark which is sometimes affixed to ingots of gold, and which, being struck only upon one side of the piece and not covering the whole surface, ascertains the fineness but not the weight of the metal. Abraham weighs to Ephron the four hundred shekels of silver which he had agreed to pay for the field of Machpelah. They are said, however, to be the current money of the merchant, and yet are received by weight and not by tail, in the same manner as ingots of gold and bars of silver are at present. The revenues of the ancient Saxon kings of England are said to have been paid, not in money, but in kind, that is, in victuals and provisions of all sorts. William the Conqueror introduced the custom of paying them in money. This money, however, was for a long time received at the exchequer by weight and not by tail. The inconveniency and difficulty of weighing those metals with exactness gave occasion to the institution of coins, of which the stamp, covering entirely both sides of the piece, and sometimes the edges too, 
was supposed to ascertain not only the fineness, but the weight of the metal. Such coins, therefore, were received by tail, as at present, without the trouble of weighing. The denominations of those coins seem originally to have expressed the weight or quantity of metal contained in them. In the time of Servius Tullius, who first coined money at Rome, the Roman as, or pondo, contained a Roman pound of good copper. It was divided in the same manner as our Troyes pound into twelve ounces, each of which contained a real ounce of good copper. The English pound sterling, in the time of Edward I, contained a pound, tower weight, of silver of a known fineness. The tower pound seems to have been something more than the Roman pound, and of something less than the Troyes pound. This last was not introduced into the mint of England to the 18th of Henry the Eighth. The French lever contained, in the time of Charlemagne, a pound, Troyes weight, of silver of a known fineness. The fair of Troyes in Champagne was at that time frequented by all the nations of Europe, and the weights and measures of so famous a market were generally known and esteemed. The Scots money pound contained, from the time of Alexander I to that of Robert Bruce, a pound of silver of the same weight and fineness with the English pound sterling. English, French, and Scots pennies, too, contained all of them originally a real penny weight of silver, the twentieth part of an ounce, and the two hundred and fortieth part of a pound. The shilling, too, seems originally to have been the denomination of a weight. When wheat is at twelve shillings the quarter, says an ancient statute of Henry the Third, then wastel bread of a farthing shall weigh eleven shillings and fourpence. The proportion, however, between the shilling and either the penny on the one hand, or the pound on the other, seems not to have been so constant and uniform as that between the penny and the pound. During the first race of the kings of France, the French sou or shilling appears upon different occasions to have contained five, twelve, twenty, and forty pennies. Among the ancient Saxons, a shilling appears at one time to have contained only five pennies, and it is not improbable that it may have been as variable among them as among their neighbors, the ancient Franks. From the time of Charlemagne among the French, and from that of William the Conqueror among the English, the proportion between the pound, the shilling, and the penny seems to have been uniformly the same as at present, though the value of each has been very different, for in every country of the world, I believe, the avarice and injustice of princes and sovereign states, abusing the confidence of their subjects, have by degrees diminished the real quantity of metal which had been originally contained in their coins. The Roman ass, in the latter ages of the Republic, was reduced to the twenty-fourth part of its original value, and, instead of weighing a pound, came to weigh only half an ounce. The English pound and penny contain at present about a third only, the Scots pound and penny about a thirty-sixth, and the French pound and penny about a sixty-sixth part of their original value. By means of those operations, the princes and sovereign states which performed them were enabled, in appearance, to pay their debts and fully their engagements with a smaller quantity of silver than would otherwise have been requisite. It was, indeed, in appearance only, for their creditors were readily defrauded of a part of what was due to them. All other debtors in the state were allowed the same privilege, and might pay with the same nominal sum of the new and debased coin whatever they had borrowed in the old. Such operations, therefore, have always proved favorable to the debtor and ruinous to the creditor, and have sometimes produced a greater and more universal revolution in the fortunes of private persons than could have been occasioned by a very great public calamity. It is in this manner that money has become, in all civilized nations, the universal instrument of commerce, by the intervention of which goods of all kinds are bought and sold or exchanged for one another. What are the rules which men naturally observe in exchanging them either for money or for one another, I shall now proceed to examine. These rules determine what may be called the relative or exchangeable value of goods. The word value, it is to be observed, has two different meanings, and sometimes expresses the utility of some particular object, and sometimes the power of purchasing other goods which the possession of that object conveys. The one may be called value in use, the other value in exchange. The things which have the greatest value in use have frequently little or no value in exchange, and, on the contrary, those which have the greatest value in exchange have frequently little or no value in use. Nothing is more useful than water, but it will purchase scarce anything. Scarce anything can be had in exchange for it. A diamond, on the contrary, has scarce any value in use, but a very great quantity of other goods may frequently be had in exchange for it. 
In order to investigate the principles which regulate the exchangeable value of commodities, I shall endeavour to show, first, what is the real measure of this exchangeable value, or wherein consists the real price of all commodities. Secondly, what are the different parts of which this real price is composed or made up. And lastly, what are the different circumstances which sometimes raise some or all of these different parts of price above, and sometimes sink them below, their natural or ordinary rate? Or what are the causes which sometimes hinder the market price, that is, the actual price of commodities, from coinciding exactly with what may be called their natural price? I shall endeavor to explain as fully and distinctly as I can those three subjects in the three following chapters, for which I must very earnestly entreat both the patience and attention of the reader, his patience in order to examine a detail which may, perhaps, in some places, appear unnecessarily tedious, and his attention in order to understand what may, perhaps, after the fullest explication of what I am capable of giving it, appear still in some degrees obscure. I am always willing to run some hazard of being tedious in order to be sure that I am perspicuous, and, after taking the utmost pains that I can to be perspicuous, some obscurity may still appear to remain upon a subject in its own nature extremely abstracted. End of Book 1, Chapter 4、of Chapter 5 of Book 1 of The Wealth of Nations This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Part I of Chapter V of Book I. Of the Real and Nominal Price of Commodities, or of Their Price in Labor, and Their Price in Money. Every man is rich or poor according to the degree in which he can afford to enjoy the necessaries, conveniencies, and amusements of human life. But after the division of labor has once thoroughly taken place, it is but a very small part of these with which a man's own labor can supply him. The far greater part of them he must derive from the labor of other people, and he must be rich or poor according to the quantity of that labor which he can command, or which he can afford to purchase. The value of any commodity, therefore, to the person who possesses it, and who means not to use or consume it himself, but to exchange it for other commodities, is equal to the quantity of labor which it enables him to purchase or command. Labor, therefore, is the real measure of the exchangeable value of all commodities. The real price of everything, what everything really costs the man who wants to acquire it, is the toil and trouble of acquiring it. What everything is really worth to the man who has acquired it, and who wants to dispose of it, or exchange it for something else, is the toil and trouble which it can save to himself, and which it can impose upon other people. What is bought with money or with goods is purchased by labor, as much as what we acquire by the toil of our own body. That money or those goods indeed save us this toil. They contain the value of a certain quantity of labor, which we exchange for what is supposed at the time to contain the value of an equal quantity. Labor was the first price, the original purchase money that was paid for all things. It was not by gold or by silver, but by labor, that all the wealth of the world was originally purchased. And its value, to those who possess it and who want to exchange it for some new productions, is precisely equal to the quantity of labor which it can enable them to purchase or command. Wealth, as Mr. Hobbes says, is power. But the person who either acquires or succeeds to a great fortune does not necessarily acquire or succeed to any political power, either civil or military. His fortune may, perhaps, afford him the means of acquiring both. But the mere possession of that fortune does not necessarily convey to him either. The power which that possession immediately and directly conveys to him is the power of purchasing a certain command over all the labor, or over all the produce of labor which is then in the market. His fortune is greater or less, precisely in proportion to the extent of this power, or to the quantity either of other men's labor, or what is the same thing, of the produce of other men's labor, which it enables him to purchase or command. The exchangeable value of everything must always be precisely equal to the extent of this power which it conveys to its owner. But though labor be the real measure of the exchangeable value of all commodities, it is not that by which their value is commonly estimated. It is often difficult to ascertain the proportion between two different quantities of labor. The time spent in two different sorts of work will not always alone determine this proportion. 
the different degrees of hardship endured and of ingenuity exercised must likewise be taken into account there may be more labor in an hour's hard work than in two hours easy business or in an hour's application to a trade which it costs ten years labor to learn than in a month's industry at an ordinary and obvious employment but it is not easy to find any accurate measure either of hardship or ingenuity in exchanging indeed the different productions of different sorts of labor for one another some allowance is commonly made for both it is adjusted however not by any accurate measure but by the higgling and bargaining of the market according to that sort of rough equality which though not exact is sufficient for carrying on the business of common life every commodity besides is more frequently exchanged for and thereby compared with other commodities than with labor it is more natural therefore to estimate its exchangeable value by the quantity of some other commodity than by that of the labor which it can produce the greater part of people too understand better what is meant by a quantity of a particular commodity than by a quantity of labor the one is a plain palpable object the other an abstract notion which though it can be made sufficiently intelligible is not altogether so natural and obvious but when barter ceases and money has become the common instrument of commerce every particular commodity is more frequently exchanged for money than for any other commodity the butcher seldom carries his beef or his mutton to the baker or the brewer in order to exchange them for bread or for beer but he carries them to the market where he exchanges them for money and afterwards exchanges that money for bread and for beer the quantity of money which he gets for them regulates too the quantity of bread and beer which he can afterwards purchase it is more natural and obvious to him therefore to estimate their value by the quantity of money the commodity for which he immediately exchanges them than by that of bread and beer the commodities for which he can exchange them only by the intervention of another commodity and rather to say that his butcher's meat is worth three pence or four pence a pound than it is worth three or four pounds of bread or three or four quarts of small beer hence it comes to pass that the exchangeable value of every commodity is more frequently estimated by the quantity of money than by the quantity either of labor or of any other commodity which can be had in exchange for it gold and silver however like every other commodity vary in their value are sometimes cheaper and sometimes dearer sometimes of easier and sometimes of more difficult purchase the quantity of labor which any particular quantity of them can purchase or command or the quantity of other goods which it will exchange for depends always upon the fertility or barrenness of the mines which happen to be known about the time when such exchanges are made the discovery of the abundant mines of america reduced in the sixteenth century the value of gold and silver in europe to about a third of what it had been before as it cost less labor to bring those metals from the mine to the market so when they were brought thither they could purchase or command less labor and this revolution in their value though perhaps the greatest is by no means the only one of which history gives some account but as a measure of quantity such as the natural foot fathom or handful which is continually varying in its own quantity can never be an accurate measure of the quantity of other things so a commodity which is itself continually varying in its own value can never be an accurate measure of the value of other commodities equal quantities of labor at all times and places may be said to be of equal value to the laborer in his ordinary state of health strength and spirits in the ordinary degree of his skill and dexterity he must always lay down the same portion of his ease his liberty and his happiness the price which he pays must always be the same whatever may be the quantity of goods which he receives in return for it of these indeed it may sometimes purchase a greater and sometimes a smaller quantity but it is their value which varies not that of the labor which purchases them at all times and places that is dear which it is difficult to come at or which it costs much labor to acquire and that cheap which is to be had easily or with very little labor labor alone therefore never varying in its own value is alone the ultimate and real standard by which the value of all commodities can at all times and places be estimated and compared it is their real price money is their nominal price only but though equal quantities of labor are always of equal value to the laborer yet to the person who employs him they appear sometimes to be of greater and sometimes of smaller value he purchases them sometimes with a greater and sometimes with a smaller quantity of goods and to him the price of labor seems to vary like that of all other things it appears to him dear in the one case and cheap in the other in reality however it is the goods which are cheap in the one case and dear in the other in this popular sense therefore labor like commodities may be said to have a real and nominal price 
its real price may be said to consist in the quantity of the necessaries and conveniencies of life which are given for it its nominal price in the quantity of money the labourer is rich or poor is well or ill rewarded in proportion to the real not the nominal price of his labour the distinction between the real and the nominal price of commodities in labour is not a matter of mere speculation but may sometimes be of considerable use in practice the same real price is always of the same value but on account of the variations in the value of gold and silver the same nominal price is sometimes of very different values when a landed estate therefore is sold with a reservation of a perpetual rent if it is intended that this rent should always be of the same value it is of importance to the family in whose favour it is reserved that it should not consist in a particular sum of money its value would in this case be liable to variations of two different kinds first to those which arise from the different quantities of gold and silver which are contained at different times in coin of the same denomination and secondly to those which arise from the different values of equal quantities of gold and silver at different times princes and sovereign states have frequently fancied that they had a temporary interest to diminish the quantity of pure metal contained in their coins but they seldom have fancied that they had any to augment it the quantity of metal contained in the coins i believe of all nations has accordingly been almost continually diminishing and hardly ever augmenting such variations therefore tend almost always to diminish the value of a money rent the discovery of the mines of america diminished the value of gold and silver in europe this diminution it is commonly supposed though i apprehend without any certain proof is still going on gradually and is likely to continue to do so for a long time upon this supposition therefore such variations are more likely to diminish than to augment the value of a money rent even though it should be stipulated to be paid not in such a quantity of coin money of such a denomination in so many pounds sterling for example but in so many ounces either of pure silver or of silver of a certain standard the rents which have been reserved in corn have preserved their value much better than those which have been reserved in money even where the denomination of the coin has not been altered by the eighteenth of elizabeth it was enacted that a third of the rent of all college leases should be reserved in corn to be paid either in kind or according to the current prices at the nearest public market the money arising from this corn rent though originally but a third of the whole is in the present times according to dr blackstone commonly near double of what arises from the other two-thirds the old money rents of colleges must according to this account have sunk almost to a fourth part of their ancient value or are worth little more than a fourth part of the corn which they were formerly worth but since the reign of philip and mary the denomination of the english coin has undergone little or no alteration and the same number of pounds shillings and pence have contained very nearly the same quantity of pure silver this degradation therefore in the value of the money rents of colleges has arisen altogether from the degradation in the price of silver when the degradation in the value of silver is combined with the diminution of the quantity of it contained in the coin of the same denomination the loss is frequently still greater in scotland where the denomination of the coin has undergone much greater alterations than it ever did in england and in france where it has undergone still greater than it ever did in scotland some ancient rents originally of considerable value have in this manner been reduced almost to nothing equal quantities of labour will at distant times be purchased more nearly with equal quantities of corn the subsistence of the labourer than with equal quantities of gold and silver or perhaps of any other commodity equal quantities of corn therefore will at distant times be more nearly of the same real value or enable the possessor to purchase or command more nearly the same quantity of the labour of other people they will do this i say more nearly than equal quantities of almost any other commodity for even equal quantities of corn will not do it exactly the subsistence of the labourer or the real price of labour as i shall endeavour to show hereafter is very different upon different occasions more liberal in a society advancing to opulence than in one that is standing still and in one that is standing still than in one that is going backwards every other commodity however will at any particular time purchase a greater or smaller quantity of labour in proportion to the quantity of subsistence which it can purchase at that time a rent therefore reserved in corn is liable only to the variations in the quantity of labour which a certain quantity of corn can purchase but a rent reserved in any other commodity is liable not only to the variations in the quantity of labour which any particular quantity of corn can purchase but to the variations in the quantity of corn which can be purchased by any particular quantity of that commodity 
Though the real value of a corn rent, it is to be observed, however, varies much less from century to century than that of a money rent, it varies much more from year to year. The money price of labor, as I shall endeavor to show hereafter, does not fluctuate from year to year with the money price of corn, but seems to be everywhere accommodated, not to the temporary or occasional, but to the average or ordinary price of that necessary of life. The average or ordinary price of corn, again, is regulated, as I shall likewise endeavor to show hereafter, by the value of silver, by the richness or barrenness of the mines which supply the market with that metal, or by the quantity of labor which must be employed, and consequently of corn which must be consumed, in order to bring any particular quantity of silver from the mine to the market. But the value of silver, though it sometimes varies greatly from century to century, seldom varies much from year to year, but frequently continues the same, or very nearly the same, for half a century or a century together. The ordinary or average money price of corn, therefore, may, during so long a period, continue the same, or very nearly the same, too, and along with it the money price of labor, provided, at least, the society continues in other respects in the same, or nearly in the same, condition. In the meantime, the temporary and occasional price of corn may frequently be double one year of what it had been the year before, or fluctuate, for example, from five and twenty to fifty shillings the quarter. But when corn is at the latter price, not only the nominal, but the real value of a corn rent, will be double of what it is when at the former, or will command double the quantity either of labor or of the greater part of other commodities. The money price of labor, and along with it that of most other things, continue in the same during all these fluctuations. Labor, therefore, it appears evidently, is the only universal, as well as the only accurate, measure of value, or the only standard by which we can compare the values of different commodities at all times and at all places. We cannot estimate, it is allowed, the real value of different commodities from century to century by the quantities of silver which were given for them. We cannot estimate it from year to year by the quantities of corn. By the quantities of labor we can, with the greatest accuracy, estimate it both from century to century and from year to year. From century to century, corn is a better measure than silver, because, from century to century, equal quantities of corn will command the same quantity of labor more nearly than equal quantities of silver. From year to year, on the contrary, silver is a better measure than corn, because equal quantities of it will more nearly command the same quantity of labor. But though in establishing perpetual rents, or even in letting very long leases, it may be of use to distinguish between real and nominal price, it is of none in buying and selling the more common and ordinary transactions of human life. At the same time and place, the real and the nominal price of all commodities are exactly in proportion to one another. The more or less money you get for any commodity in the London market, for example, the more or less labor it will at that time and place enable you to purchase or command. At the same time and place, therefore, money is the exact measure of the real exchangeable value of all commodities. Though at distant places there is no regular proportion between the real and the money price of commodities, yet the merchant who carries goods from the one to the other has nothing to consider but the money price, or the difference between the quantity of silver for which he buys them, and that for which he is likely to sell them. Half an ounce of silver at Canton, in China, may command a greater quantity both of labor and of the necessaries and conveniencies of life than an ounce at London. A commodity, therefore, which sells for half an ounce of silver at Canton, may there be really dear, of more real importance to the man who possesses it there, than a commodity which sells for an ounce at London is to the man who possesses it at London. If a London merchant, however, can buy at Canton for half an ounce of silver a commodity which he can afterwards sell at London for an ounce, he gains a hundred percent by the bargain, just as much as if an ounce of silver was at London exactly of the same value as at Canton. It is of no importance to him that half an ounce of silver at Canton would have given him the command of more labor and of a greater quantity of the necessaries and conveniencies of life than an ounce can do at London. An ounce at London will always give him the command of double the quantity of all these, which half an ounce could have done there, and this is precisely what he wants. As it is the nominal or money price of goods, therefore, which finally determines the prudence or imprudence of all purchases and sales, and thereby regulates almost the whole business of common life in which price is concerned, we cannot wonder that it should have been so much more attended to than the real price. In such a work as this, however, it may sometimes be of use to compare the different real values of a particular commodity at different times and places, or the different degrees of power over the labor of other people which it may, upon different occasions, have given to those who possessed it. We must in this case compare not so much the different quantities of silver for which it was commonly sold, 
as the different quantities or labor which those different quantities of silver could have purchased. But the current prices of labor at distant times and places can scarce ever be known with any degree of exactness. Those of corn, though they have in few places been regularly recorded, are in general better known, and have been more frequently taken notice of by historians and other writers. We must generally, therefore, content ourselves with them, not as being always exactly in the same proportion as the current prices of labor, but as being the nearest approximation which can commonly be had to that proportion. I shall hereafter have occasion to make several comparisons of this kind. End of Book 1 Chapter 5, Part 1part 2 of chapter 5 of book 1 of the wealth of nations this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by stephen escalera the wealth of nations by adam smith part 2 of chapter 5 of book 1 of the real and nominal price of commodities or of their price in labor and their price in money in the progress of industry, commercial nations have found it convenient to coin several different metals into money, gold for larger payments, silver for purchases of moderate value, and copper or some other coarse metal for those of still smaller consideration. They have always, however, considered one of those metals as more peculiarly the measure of value than any of the other two. And this preference seems generally to have been given to the metal which they happen first to make use of as the instrument of commerce. Having once begun to use it as their standard, which they must have done when they had no other money, they have generally continued to do so even when the necessity was not the same. The Romans are said to have had nothing but copper money till within five years before the first Punic War, when they first began to coin silver. Copper, therefore, appears to have continued always the measure of value in that republic. At Rome all accounts appear to have been kept, and the value of all estates to have been computed, either in asses or in sesterti. The as was always the denomination of a copper coin. The word sestertius signifies two asses and a half. Though the sestertius, therefore, was originally a silver coin, its value was estimated in copper. At Rome, one who owed a great deal of money was said to have a great deal of other people's copper. The northern nations who established themselves upon the ruins of the Roman Empire seem to have had silver money from the first beginning of their settlements, and not to have known either gold or copper coins for several ages thereafter. There were silver coins in England in the time of the Saxons, but there was little gold coin till the time of Edward the Third, nor any copper till that of James the First of Great Britain. In England, therefore, and for the same reason, I believe, in all other modern nations of Europe, all accounts are kept, and the value of all goods and of all estates is generally computed in silver. And when we mean to express the amount of a person's fortune, we seldom mention the number of guineas, but the number of pounds sterling which we suppose would be given for it. Originally, in all countries, I believe, a legal tender of payment could be made only in the coin of that metal which was peculiarly considered as the standard or measure of value. In England, gold was not considered as a legal tender for a long time after it was coined into money. The proportion between the values of gold and silver money was not fixed by any public law or proclamation, but was left to be settled by the market. If a debtor offered payment in gold, the creditor might either reject such payment altogether, or accept of it at such a valuation of the gold as he and his debtor could agree upon. Copper is not at present a legal tender, except in the chains of the smaller silver coins. In this state of things, the distinction between the metal which was the standard and that which was not the standard was something more than a nominal distinction. In process of time, and as people became gradually more familiar with the use of the different metals and coin, and consequently better acquainted with the proportion between their respective values, it has, in most countries, I believe, been found convenient to ascertain this proportion, and to declare by a public law that a guinea, for example, of such a weight and fineness should exchange for one and twenty shillings or be a legal tender for a debt of that amount. In this state of things, and during the continuance of any one regulated proportion of this kind, the distinction between the metal, which is the standard, and that which is not the standard, becomes little more than a nominal distinction. In consequence of any change, however, in this regulated proportion, this distinction becomes, or at least seems to become, something more than nominal again. If the regulated value of a guinea, for example, was either reduced to twenty or raised to two and twenty shillings, 
all accounts being kept, and almost all obligation for debt being expressed in silver money, the greater part of payments could, in either case, be made with the same quantity of silver money as before, but would require very different quantities of gold money, a greater in the one case, and a smaller in the other. Silver would appear to be more invariable in its value than gold. Silver would appear to measure the value of gold, and gold would not appear to measure the value of silver. The value of gold would seem to depend upon the quantity of silver which it would exchange for, and the value of silver would not seem to depend upon the quantity of gold which it would exchange for. This difference, however, would be altogether owing to the custom of keeping accounts, and of expressing the amount of all great and small sums rather in silver than in gold money. One of Mr. Drummond's notes for five and twenty, or fifty guineas, would, after an alteration of this kind, be still payable with five and twenty, or fifty guineas, in the same manner as before. It would, after such an alteration, be payable with the same quantity of gold as before, but with very different quantities of silver. In the payment of such a note, gold would appear to be more invariable in its value than silver. Gold would appear to measure the value of silver, and silver would not appear to measure the value of gold. If the custom of keeping accounts and of expressing promissory notes and other obligations for money in this manner should ever become general, gold, and not silver, would be considered as the metal which was peculiarly the standard or measure of value. In reality, during the continuance of any one regulated proportion between the respective values of the different metals in coin, the value of the most precious metal regulates the value of the whole coin. Twelve copper pence contain half a pound avoirdupois of copper of not the best quality which before it is coined is seldom worth seven pence in silver but as by the regulation twelve such pence are ordered to exchange for a shilling they are in the market considered as worth a shilling and a shilling can at any time be had for them even before the late reformation of the gold coin of great britain the gold that part of it at least which circulated in london and its neighbourhood was in general less degraded below its standard weight than the greater part of the silver one and twenty worn and defaced shillings, however, were considered as equivalent to a guinea, which, perhaps indeed, was worn and defaced too, but seldom so much so. The late regulations have brought the gold coin as near, perhaps, to its standard weight as it is possible to bring the current coin of any nation, and the order to receive no gold at the public offices but by weight is likely to preserve it so as long as that order is enforced. The silver coin still continues in the same worn and degraded state as before the reformation of the cold coin. In the market, however, one and twenty shillings of this degraded silver coin are still considered as worth a guinea of this excellent gold coin. The reformation of the gold coin has evidently raised the value of the silver coin which can be exchanged for it. In the English mint, a pound weight of gold is coined into forty-four guineas and a half, which at one and twenty shillings the guinea is equal to forty-six pounds, fourteen shillings, and sixpence. An ounce of such gold coin, therefore, is worth three pounds, seventeen shillings, and ten pence halfpenny in silver. In England, no duty or seigneurage is paid upon the coinage, and he who carries a pound weight or an ounce weight of standard gold bullion to the mint gets back a pound weight or an ounce weight of gold and coin, without any deduction. Three pounds, seventeen shillings, and ten pence halfpenny an ounce, therefore, is said to be the mint price of gold in England, or the quantity of gold coin which the mint gives in return for standard gold bullion. Before the reformation of the gold coin, the price of standard gold bullion in the market had, for many years, been upwards of three pounds, eighteen shillings, sometimes three pounds, nineteen shillings, and very frequently four pounds an ounce. That sum, it is probable, in the worn and degraded gold coin, seldom containing more than an ounce of standard gold. Since the reformation of the gold coin, the market price of standard gold bullion seldom exceeds three pounds seventeen shillings seven pence an ounce. Before the reformation of the gold coin, the market price was always more or less above the mint price. Since that reformation, the market price has been constantly below the mint price. But that market price is the same whether it is paid in gold or in silver coin. The late reformation of the gold coin, therefore, has raised not only the value of the gold coin, but likewise that of the silver coin in proportion to gold bullion, and probably, too, in proportion to all other commodities. Though the price of the greater part of other commodities being influenced by so many other causes, the rise in the value of either gold or silver coin in proportion to them may not be so distinct and sensible. In the English mint, a pound weight of standard silver bullion is coined into sixty-two shillings, containing in the same manner a pound weight of standard silver. Five shillings and two pence an ounce, therefore, is said to be the mint price of silver in England, 
or the quantity of silver coin which the mint gives in return for standard silver bullion. Before the reformation of the gold coin, the market price of standard silver bullion was, upon different occasions, five shillings and fourpence, five shillings and fivepence, five shillings and sixpence, five shillings and sevenpence, and very often five shillings and eightpence an ounce. Five shillings and sevenpence, however, seems to have been the most common price. Since the reformation of the gold coin, the market price of standard silver bullion has fallen occasionally to five shillings and threepence, five shillings and fourpence, and five shillings and fivepence an ounce, which last price it has scarce ever exceeded. Though the market price of silver bullion has fallen considerably since the reformation of the gold coin, it has not fallen so low as the mint price. In the proportion between the different metals in the English coin, as copper is rated very much above its real value, so silver is rated somewhat below it. In the market of Europe, in the French coin, and in the Dutch coin, an ounce of fine gold exchanges for about 14 ounces of fine silver. In the English coin, it exchanges for about 15 ounces, that is, for more silver than it is worth, according to the common estimation of Europe. But as the price of copper in bars is not, even in England, raised by the high price of copper in English coin, so the price of silver in bullion is not sunk by the low rate of silver in English coin. Silver in bullion still preserves its proper proportion to gold, for the same reason that copper in bars preserves its proper proportion to silver. Upon the reformation of the silver coin in the reign of William the Third, the price of silver bullion still continued to be somewhat above the mint price. Mr. Locke imputed this high price to the permission of exporting silver bullion and to the prohibition of exporting silver coin. This permission of exporting, he said, rendered the demand for silver bullion greater than the demand for silver coin. But the number of people who want silver coin for the common uses of buying and selling at home is surely much greater than that of those who want silver bullion, either for the use of exportation or for any other use. There subsists at present a like permission of exporting gold bullion and a like prohibition of exporting gold coin, and yet the price of gold bullion has fallen below the mint price. But in the English coin, silver was then, in the same manner as now, underrated in proportion to gold, and the gold coin, which at that time too was not supposed to require any reformation, regulated then, as well as now, the real value of the whole coin. As the reformation of the silver coin did not then reduce the price of silver bullion to the mint price, it is not very probable that a like reformation will do so now. Were the silver coin brought back as near to its standard weight as the gold, a guinea, it is probable, would, according to the present proportion, exchange for more silver and coin than it would purchase in bullion. The silver coin containing its full standard weight, there would in this case be a profit in melting it down, in order, first, to sell the bullion for gold coin, and afterwards to exchange this gold coin for silver coin, to be melted down in the same manner. Some alteration in the present proportion seems to be the only method of preventing this inconveniency. The inconveniency, perhaps, would be less if silver was rated in the coin as much above its proper proportion to gold as it is at present rated below it, provided it was at the same time enacted that silver should not be a legal tender for more than the change of a guinea, in the same manner as copper is not a legal tender for more than the change of a shilling. No creditor could, in this case, be cheated in consequence of the high valuation of silver and coin, as no creditor can at present be cheated in consequence of the high valuation of copper. The bankers only would suffer by this regulation. When a run comes upon them, they sometimes endeavor to gain time by paying in sixpences, and they would be precluded by this regulation from this discreditable method of evading immediate payment. They would be obliged, in consequence, to keep at all times in their coffers a greater quantity of cash than at present, and though this might, no doubt, be a considerable inconveniency to them, it would, at the same time, be a considerable security to their creditors. Three pounds, seventeen shillings, and ten pence halfpenny, the mint price of gold, certainly does not contain, even in our present excellent gold coin, more than an ounce of standard gold, and it may be thought, therefore, should not purchase more standard bullion. But gold in coin is more convenient than gold in bullion, and though in England the coinage is free, yet the gold which is carried in bullion to the mint can seldom be returned in coin to the owner till after a delay of several weeks. In the present hurry of the mint it could not be returned till after a delay of several months. This delay is equivalent to a small duty, and renders gold in coin somewhat more valuable than an equal quantity of gold in bullion. 
if in the english coin silver was rated according to its proper proportion to gold the price of silver bullion would probably fall below the mint price even without any reformation of the silver coin the value even of the present worn and defaced silver coin being regulated by the value of the excellent gold coin for which it can be changed a small seigneurage or duty upon the coinage of both gold and silver would probably increase still more the superiority of those metals in coin above an equal quantity of either of them in bullion the coinage would in this case increase the value of the metal coined in proportion to the extent of this small duty for the same reason that the fashion increases the value of plate in proportion to the price of that fashion the superiority of coin above bullion would prevent the melting down of the coin and would discourage its exportation if upon any public exigency it should become necessary to export the coin the greater part of it would soon return again of its own accord abroad it could sell only for its weight in bullion at home it would buy more than that weight there would be a profit therefore in bringing it home again in france a seigneurage of about eight per cent is imposed upon the coinage and the french coin when exported is said to return home again of its own accord the occasional fluctuations in the market price of gold and silver bullion arise from the same causes as the like fluctuations in that of all other commodities the frequent loss of those metals from various accidents by sea and by land the continual waste of them in gilding and plating in lace and embroidery in the wear and tear of coin and in that of plate require in all countries which possess no mines of their own a continual importation in order to repair this loss and this waste the merchant importers like all other merchants we may believe endeavour as well as they can to suit their occasional importations to what they judge is likely to be the immediate demand with all their attention however they sometimes overdo the business and sometimes underdo it when they import more bullion than is wanted rather than incur the risk and trouble of exporting it again they are sometimes willing to sell a part of it for something less than the ordinary or average price when on the other hand they import less than is wanted they get something more than this price but when under all those occasional fluctuations the market price either of gold or silver bullion continues for several years together steadily and constantly either more or less above or more or less below the mint price we may be assured that this steady and constant either superiority or inferiority of price is the effect of something in the state of the coin which at that time renders a certain quantity of coin either of more value or of less value than the precise quantity of bullion which it ought to contain the constancy and steadiness of the effect supposes a proportional constancy and steadiness in the cause the money of any particular country is at any particular time and place more or less an accurate measure or value according as the current coin is more or less exactly agreeable to its standard or contains more or less exactly the precise quantity of pure gold or pure silver which it ought to contain if in england for example forty-four guineas and a half contained exactly a pound weight of standard gold or eleven ounces of fine gold and one ounce of alloy the gold coin of england would be as accurate a measure of the actual value of goods at any particular time and place as the nature of the thing would admit but if by rubbing and wearing forty-four guineas and a half generally contain less than a pound weight of standard gold the diminution however being greater in some pieces than in others the measure of value comes to be liable to the same sort of uncertainty to which all other weights and measures are commonly exposed as it rarely happens that these are exactly agreeable to their standard the merchant adjusts the price of his goods as well as he can not to what those weights and measures ought to be but to what upon an average he finds by experience they actually are in consequence of a like disorder in the coin the price of goods comes in the same manner to be adjusted not to the quantity of pure gold or silver which the coin ought to contain but to that which upon an average it is found by experience it actually does contain by the money price of goods it is to be observed i understand always the quantity of pure gold or silver for which they are sold without any regard to the denomination of the coin six shillings and eightpence for example in the time of edward i i consider as the same money price with a pound sterling in the present times because it contained as nearly as we can judge the same quantity of pure silver end of book one chapter five part two Chapter 6 of Book 1 of The Wealth of Nations. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Chapter 6 of Book 1. Of the Component Part of the Price of Commodities. In that early and rude state of society which precedes both the accumulation of stock and the appropriation of land, the proportion between the quantities of labor necessary for acquiring different objects seems to be the only circumstance which can afford any rule for exchanging them for one another. If among a nation of hunters, for example, it usually costs twice the labor to kill a beaver which it does to kill a deer, one beaver should naturally exchange for or be worth two deer. It is natural that what is usually the produce of two days or two hours' labor should be worth double of what is usually the produce of one day's or one hour's labor. If the one species of labor should be more severe than the other, some allowance will naturally be made for this superior hardship, and the produce of one hour's labor in the one way may frequently exchange for that of two hours' labor in the other. Or if the one species of labor requires an uncommon degree of dexterity and ingenuity, the esteem which men have for such talents will naturally give a value to their produce, superior to what would be due to the time employed about it. Such talents can seldom be acquired, but in consequence of long application, and the superior value of their produce may frequently be no more than a reasonable compensation for the time and labor which must be spent in acquiring them. In the advanced state of society, allowances of this kind, for superior hardship and superior skill, are commonly made in the wages of labor and something of the same kind must probably have taken place in its earliest and rudest period. In this state of things the whole produce of labor belongs to the laborer, and the quantity of labor commonly employed in acquiring or producing any commodity is the only circumstance which can regulate the quantity of labor which it ought commonly to purchase, command, or exchange for. As soon as stock has accumulated in the hands of particular persons, some of them will naturally employ it in setting to work industrious people, whom they will supply with materials and subsistence, in order to make a profit by the sale of their work, or by what their labor adds to the value of the materials. In exchanging the complete manufacturer, either for money, for labor, or for other goods, over and above what may be sufficient to pay the price of the materials, and the wages of the workmen, something must be given for the profits of the undertaker of the work, who hazards his stock in his adventure. The value which the workmen add to the materials, therefore, resolves itself in this case into two parts, of which the one pays their wages, the other the profits of their employer upon the whole stock of materials and wages which he advanced. He could have no interest to employ them unless he expected from the sale of their work something more than what was sufficient to replace his stock to him. And he could have no interest to employ a great stock rather than a small one unless his profits were to bear some proportion to the extent of his stock. The profits of stock, it may perhaps be thought, are only a different name for the wages of a particular sort of labor, the labor of inspection and direction. They are, however, altogether different, are regulated by quite different principles, and bear no proportion to the quantity, the hardship, or the ingenuity of this supposed labor of inspection and direction. They are regulated altogether by the value of the stock employed, and are greater or smaller in proportion to the extent of this stock. Let us suppose, for example, that in some particular place where the common annual profits of manufacturing stock are 10%, there are two different manufacturers, in each of which twenty workmen are employed, at the rate of fifteen pounds a year each, or at the expense of three hundred a year in each manufactory. Let us suppose, too, that the coarse materials annually wrought up in the one cost only seven hundred pounds, while the finer materials in the other cost seven thousand. The capital annually employed in the one will, in this case, amount only to one thousand pounds, whereas that employed in the other will amount to seven thousand three hundred pounds. At the rate of 10%, therefore, the undertaker of the one will expect a yearly profit of about 100 pounds only, while that of the other will expect about 730 pounds. But though their profits are so very different, their labor of inspection and direction may be either altogether or very nearly the same. In many great works, almost the whole labor of this kind is committed to some principal clerk. His wages properly express the value of this labor of inspection and direction. Though in settling them some regard is had commonly not only to his labor and skill, but to the trust which is reposed in him, yet they never bear any regular proportion to the capital of which he oversees the management. And the owner of this capital, though he is thus discharged of almost all labor, still expects that his profit should bear a regular proportion to his capital. 
In the price of commodities, therefore, the profits of stock constitute a component part altogether different from the wages of labour, and regulated by quite different principles. In this state of things, the whole produce of labour does not always belong to the labourer. He must, in most cases, share it with the owner of the stock which employs him. Neither is the quantity of labour commonly employed in acquiring or producing any commodity, the only circumstance which can regulate the quantity which it ought commonly to purchase, command, or exchange for. An additional quantity, it is evident, must be due for the profits of the stock which advance the wages and furnish the materials of that labour. As soon as the land of any country has all become private property, the landlords, like all other men, love to reap where they never sowed, and demand a rent even for its natural produce. The wood of the forest, the grass of the field, and all the natural fruits of the earth, which, when land was in common, cost the labour only the trouble of gathering them, come, even to him, to have an additional price fixed upon them. He must then pay for the license to gather them, and must give up to the landlord a portion of what his labour either collects or produces. This portion, or what comes to the same thing, the price of this portion, constitutes the rent of land, and in the price of the greater part of commodities makes a third component part. The real value of all the different component parts of price, it must be observed, is measured by the quantity of labour which they can, each of them, purchase or command. Labor measures the value, not only of that part of price which resolves itself into labor, but of that which resolves itself into rent, and of that which resolves itself into profit. In every society, the price of every commodity finally resolves itself into some one or other, or all of those three parts. And in every improved society, all the three enter, more or less, as component parts into the price of the far greater part of commodities. In the price of corn, for example, one part pays the rent of the landlord, another pays the wages or maintenance of the laborers and laboring cattle employed in producing it, and the third pays the profit of the farmer. These three parts seem either immediately or ultimately to make up the whole price of corn. A fourth part, it may perhaps be thought, is necessary for replacing the stock of the farmer, or for compensating the wear and tear of his laboring cattle and other instruments of husbandry. But it must be considered that the price of any instrument of husbandry, such as a laboring horse, is itself made up of the same time parts. The rent of the land upon which he is reared, the labor of tending and rearing him, and the profits of the farmer, who advances both the rent of this land and the wages of this labor. Though the price of the corn, therefore, may pay the price as well as the maintenance of the horse, the whole price still resolves itself, either immediately or ultimately, into the same three parts of rent, labor, and profit. In the price of flour or meal, we must add to the price of the corn, the profits of the miller and the wages of his servants. In the price of bread, the profits of the baker and the wages of his servants. And in the price of both, the labor of transporting the corn from the house of the farmer to that of the miller, and from that of the miller to that of the baker, together with the profits of those who advance the wages of that labor. The price of flax resolves itself into the same three parts as that of corn, in the price of linen we must add to this price the wages of the flax dresser, of the spinner, of the weaver, of the bleacher, etc., together with the profits of their respective employers. As any particular commodity comes to be more manufactured, that part of the price which resolves itself into wages and profit comes to be greater in proportion to that which resolves itself into rent. In the progress of the manufacture, not only the number of profits increase, but every subsequent profit is greater than the foregoing because the capital from which it is derived must always be greater. The capital which employs the weavers, for example, must be greater than that which employs the spinners, because it not only replaces that capital with its profits, but pays besides the wages of the weavers, and the profits must always bear some proportion to the capital. In the most improved societies, however, there are always a few commodities of which the price resolves itself into two parts only, the wages of labor and the profits of stock and a still smaller number in which it consists altogether in the wages of labor. In the price of sea-fish, for example, one part pays the labor of the fishermen, and the other the profits of the capital employed in the fishery. Rent very seldom makes any part of it, though it does sometimes, as I shall show hereafter. It is otherwise, at least through the greater part of Europe, in river fisheries. A salmon fishery pays a rent, and rent, though it cannot well be called the rent of the land, makes a part of the price of a salmon, as well as wares and profit. In some parts of Scotland, a few poor people make a trade of gathering, along the seashore, those little variegated stones commonly known by the name of Scotch pebbles. The price which is paid to them by the stone-cutter is altogether the wages of their labor. Neither rent nor profit makes any part of it. 
but the whole price of any commodity must still finally resolve itself into some one or other or all of those three parts as whatever part of it remains after paying the rent of the land and the price of the whole labour employed in raising manufacturing and bringing it to market must necessarily be profit to somebody as the price or exchangeable value of every particular commodity taken separately resolves itself into some one or other or all of those three parts so that of all the commodities which compose the whole annual produce of the labour of every country taken complexly must resolve itself into the same three parts and be parcelled out among different inhabitants of the country either as the wages of their labour the profits of their stock or the rent of their land the whole of what is annually either collected or produced by the labour of every society or what comes to the same thing the whole price of it is in this manner originally distributed among some of its different members wages profit and rent are the three original sources of all revenue as well as of all exchangeable value all other revenue is ultimately derived from some one or other of these whoever derives his revenue from a fund which is his own must draw it either from his labour from his stock or from his land the revenue derived from labour is called wages that derived from stock by the person who manages or employs it is called profit that derived from it by the person who does not employ it himself but lends it to another is called the interest or the use of money it is the compensation which the borrower pays to the lender for the profit which he has an opportunity of making by the use of the money part of that profit naturally belongs to the borrower who runs the risk and takes the trouble of employing it and part to the lender who affords him the opportunity of making this profit the interest of money is always a derivative revenue which if it is not paid from the profit which is made by the use of the money must be paid from some other source of revenue unless perhaps the borrower is a spendthrift who contracts a second debt in order to pay the interest of the first the revenue which proceeds altogether from land is called rent and belongs to the landlord the revenue of the farmer is derived partly from his labour and partly from his stock to him land is only the instrument which enables him to earn the wages of this labour and to make the profits of this stock all taxes and all the revenue which is founded upon them all salaries pensions and annuities of every kind are ultimately derived from some one or other of those three original sources of revenue and are paid either immediately or mediately from the wages of labour the profits of stock or the rent of land when those three different sorts of revenue belong to different persons they are readily distinguished but when they belong to the same they are sometimes confounded with one another at least in common language a gentleman who farms a part of his own estate after paying the expense of cultivation should gain both the rent of the landlord and the profit of the farmer he is apt to denominate however his whole gain profit and thus confounds rent with profit at least in common language the greater part of our north american and west indian planters are in this situation they farm the greater part of them their own estates and accordingly we seldom hear of the rent of a plantation but frequently of its profit common farmers seldom employ any overseer to direct the general operations of the farm they generally too work a good deal with their own hands as ploughmen harrowers etc what remains of the crop after paying the rent therefore should not only replace to them their stock employed in cultivation together with its ordinary profits but pay them the wages which are due to them both as labourers and overseers whatever remains however after paying the rent and keeping up the stock is called profit but wages evidently make a part of it the farmer by saving these wages must necessarily gain them wages therefore are in this case confounded with profit an independent manufacturer who has stock enough both to purchase materials and to maintain himself till he can carry his work to market should gain both the wages of a journeyman who works under a master and the profit which that master makes by the sale of that journeyman's work his whole gains however are commonly called profit and wages are in this case too confounded with profit a gardener who cultivates his own garden with his own hands unites in his own person the three different characters of landlord farmer and labourer his produce therefore should pay him the rent of the first the profit of the second and the wages of the third the whole however is commonly considered as the earnings of his labour both rent and profit are in this case confounded with wages as in a civilized country there are but few commodities of which the exchangeable value arises from labour only rent and profit contributing largely to that of the far greater part of them so the annual produce of its labour will always be sufficient to purchase or command a much greater quantity of labour than what was employed in raising preparing and bringing that produce to market 
if the society were annually to employ all the labor which it can annually purchase as the quantity of labor would increase greatly every year so the produce of every succeeding year would be of vastly greater value than that of the foregoing but there is no country in which the whole annual produce is employed in maintaining the industrious the idle everywhere consume a great part of it and according to the different proportions in which it is annually divided between those two different orders of people its ordinary or average value must either annually increase or diminish or continue the same from one year to another end of book one chapter six chapter seven of book one of the wealth of nations this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by stephen escalera the wealth of nations by adam smith chapter seven of book one of the natural and market price of commodities there is in every society or neighborhood an ordinary or average rate both of wages and profit in every different employment of labor and stock this rate is naturally regulated as i shall show hereafter partly by the general circumstances of the society their riches or poverty their advancing stationary or declining condition and partly by the particular nature of each employment there is likewise in every society or neighborhood an ordinary or average rate of rent which is regulated too as i shall show hereafter partly by the general circumstances of the society or neighborhood in which the land is situated and partly by the natural or improved fertility of the land these ordinary or average rates may be called the natural rates of wages profit and rent at the time and place in which they commonly prevail when the price of any commodity is neither more nor less than what is sufficient to pay the rent of the land the wages of the labor and the profits of the stock employed in raising preparing and bringing it to market according to their natural rates the commodity is then sold for what may be called its natural price the commodity is then sold precisely for what it is worth or for what it really costs the person who brings it to market for though in common language what is called the prime cost of any commodity does not comprehend the profit of the person who is to sell it again yet if he sells it at a price which does not allow him the ordinary rate of profit in his neighborhood he is evidently a loser by the trade since by employing his stock in some other way he might have made that profit his profit besides is his revenue the proper fund of his subsistence as while he is preparing and bringing the goods to market he advances to his workmen their wages or their subsistence so he advances to himself in the same manner his own subsistence which is generally suitable to the profit which he may reasonably expect from the sale of his goods unless they yield him this profit therefore they do not repay him what they may very properly be said to have really cost him though the price therefore which leaves him this profit is not always the lowest at which a dealer may sometimes sell his goods it is the lowest at which he is likely to sell them for any considerable time at least where there is perfect liberty or where he may change his trade as often as he pleases the actual price at which any commodity is commonly sold is called its market price it may either be above or below or exactly the same with its natural price the market price of every particular commodity is regulated by the proportion between the quantity which is actually brought to market and the demand of those who are willing to pay the natural price of the commodity or the whole value of the rent labor and profit which must be paid in order to bring it thither such people may be called the effectual demanders and their demand the effectual demand since it may be sufficient to effectuate the bringing of the commodity to the market it is different from the absolute demand a very poor man may be said in some sense to have a demand for a coach and six he may like to have it but his demand is not an effectual demand as the commodity can never be brought to market in order to satisfy it when the quantity of any commodity which is brought to market falls short of the effectual demand all those who are willing to pay the whole value of the rent wages and profit which must be paid in order to bring it thither cannot be supplied with the quantity which they want rather than want it altogether some of them will be willing to give more a competition will immediately begin among them and the market price will rise more or less above the natural price according as either the greatness of the deficiency or the wealth and wanton luxury of the competitors happen to animate more or less the eagerness of the competition among competitors of equal wealth and luxury the same deficiency will generally occasion a more or less eager competition according as the acquisition of the commodity happens to be of more or less importance to them hence the exorbitant price of the necessaries of life during the blockade of a town or in a famine 
when the quantity brought to market exceeds the effectual demand it cannot be all sold to those who are willing to pay the whole value of the rent wages and profit which must be paid in order to bring it thither some part must be sold to those who are willing to pay less and the low price which they give for it must reduce the price of the whole the market price will sink more or less below the natural price according as the greatness of the excess increases more or less the competition of the sellers or according as it happens to be more or less important to them to get immediately rid of the commodity the same excess in the importation of perishable will occasion a much greater competition than in that of durable commodities in the importation of oranges for example than in that of old iron when the quantity brought to market is just sufficient to supply the effectual demand and no more the market price naturally comes to be either exactly or as nearly as can be judged of the same with the natural price the whole quantity upon hand can be disposed of for this price and cannot be disposed of for more the competition of the different dealers obliges them all to accept of this price but does not oblige them to accept of less the quantity of every commodity brought to market naturally suits itself to the effectual demand it is in the interest of all those who employ their land labor or stock in bringing any commodity to market that the quantity never should exceed the effectual demand and it is the interest of all other people that it never should fall short of that demand if at any time it exceeds the effectual demand some of the component parts of its price must be paid below their natural rate if it is rent the interest of the landlords will immediately prompt them to withdraw a part of their land and if it is wages or profit the interest of the laborers in the one case and of their employers in the other will prompt them to withdraw a part of their labor or stock from this employment the quantity brought to market will soon be no more than sufficient to supply the effectual demand all the different parts of its price will rise to their natural rate and the whole price to its natural price if on the contrary the quantity brought to market should at any time fall short of the effectual demand some of the component parts of its price must rise above their natural rate if it is rent the interest of all other landlords will naturally prompt them to prepare more land for the raising of this commodity if it is wages or profit the interest of all other laborers and dealers will soon prompt them to employ more labor and stock in preparing and bringing it to market the quantity brought thither will soon be sufficient to supply the effectual demand all the different parts of its price will soon sink to their natural rate and the whole price to its natural price the natural price therefore is as it were the central price to which the prices of all commodities are continually gravitating different accidents may sometimes keep them suspended a good deal above it and sometimes force them down even somewhat below it but whatever may be the obstacles which hinder them from settling in this centre of repose and continuance they are constantly tending towards it the whole quantity of industry annually employed in order to bring any commodity to market naturally suits itself in this manner to the effectual demand it naturally aims at bringing always that precise quantity thither which may be sufficient to supply and no more than supply that demand but in some employments the same quantity of industry will in different years produce very different quantities of commodities while in others it will produce always the same or very nearly the same the same number of laborers in husbandry will in different years produce very different quantities of corn wine oil hops etc but the same number of spinners or weavers will every year produce the same or very nearly the same quantity of linen and woolen cloth it is only the average produce of the one species of industry which can be suited in any respect to the effectual demand and as its actual produce is frequently much greater and frequently much less than its average produce the quantity of the commodities brought to market will sometimes exceed a good deal and sometimes fall short a good deal of the effectual demand even though that demand therefore should continue always the same their market price will be liable to great fluctuations will sometimes fall a good deal below and sometimes rise a good deal above their natural price in the other species of industries the produce of equal quantities of labor being always the same or very nearly the same it can be more exactly suited to the effectual demand while that demand continues the same therefore the market price of the commodities is likely to do so too and to be either altogether or as nearly as can be judged of the same with the natural price that the price of linen and woolen cloth is liable neither to such frequent nor to such great variations as the price of corn every man's experience will inform him the price of the one species of commodities varies only with the variations in the demand that of the other varies not only with the variations in the demand but with the much greater and more frequent variations in the quantity of what is brought to market in order to supply that demand 
The occasional and temporary fluctuations in the market price of any commodity fall chiefly upon those parts of its price which resolve themselves into wages and profit. That part which resolves itself into rent is less affected by them. A rent, certain in money, is not in the least affected by them, either in its rate or in its value. A rent which consists either in a certain proportion or in a certain quantity of the rude produce is no doubt affected in its yearly value by all the occasional and temporary fluctuations in the market price of that rude produce, but it is seldom affected by them in its yearly rate. In settling the terms of the lease, the landlord and farmer endeavor, according to their best judgment, to adjust that rate, not to the temporary and occasional, but to the average and ordinary price of the produce. Such fluctuations affect both the value and the rate, either of wages or of profit, according as the market happens to be either overstocked or understocked with the commodities, or with labor, with work done, or with work to be done. A public mourning raises the price of black cloth, with which the market is almost always understocked upon such occasions, and augments the profits of the merchants who possess any considerable quantity of it. It has no effect upon the wages of the weavers. The market is understocked with commodities, not with labor, with work done, not with work to be done. It raises the wages of journeymen tailors. The market is here understocked with labor. There is an effectual demand for more labor, for more work to be done, than can be had. It sinks the price of colored silks and cloths, and thereby reduces the profits of the merchants who have any considerable quantity of them upon hand. It sinks, too, the wages of the workmen employed in preparing such commodities, for which all demand is stopped for six months, perhaps for a twelve-month. The market is here overstocked both with commodities and with labor. But though the market price of every particular commodity is in this manner continually gravitating, if one may say so, towards the natural price, yet sometimes particular accidents, sometimes natural causes, and sometimes particular regulations of policy, may, in many commodities, keep up the market price, for a long time together, a good deal above the natural price. When, by an increase in the effectual demand, the market price of some particular commodity happens to rise a good deal above the natural price, those who employ their stocks in supplying that market are generally careful to conceal this change. If it was commonly known, their great profit would tempt so many new rivals to employ their stocks in the same way that, the effectual demand being fully supplied, the market price would soon be reduced to the natural price, and perhaps for some time even below it. If the market is at a great distance from the residence of those who supply it, they may sometimes be able to keep the secret for several years together, and may so long enjoy their extraordinary profits without any new rivals. Secrets of this kind, however, it must be acknowledged, can seldom be long kept, and the extraordinary profit can last very little longer than they are kept. Secrets in manufactures are capable of being longer kept than secrets in trade. A dyer who has found the means of producing a particular color with materials which cost only half the price of those commonly made use of, may, with good management, enjoy the advantage of his discovery as long as he lives, and even leave it as a legacy to his posterity. His extraordinary gains arise from the high price which is paid for his private labor. They properly consist in the high wages of that labor. But as they are repeated upon every part of his stock, and as their whole amount bears, upon that account, a regular proportion to it, they are commonly considered as extraordinary profits of stock. Such enhancements on the market price are evidently the effects of particular accidents, of which, however, the operation may sometimes last for many years together. Some natural productions require such a singularity of soil and situation that all the land in a great country, which is fit for producing them, may not be sufficient to supply the effectual demand. The whole quantity brought to market, therefore, may be disposed of to those who are willing to give more than what is sufficient to pay the rent of the land which produced them, together with the wages of the labor and the profits of the stock which were employed in preparing and bringing them to market according to their natural rates. Such commodities may continue for whole centuries together to be sold at this high price, and that part of it which resolves itself into the rent of land is in this case the part which is generally paid above its natural rate. The rent of the land which affords such singular and esteemed productions, like the rent of some vineyards in France of a peculiarly happy soil and situation, bears no regular proportion to the rent of other equally fertile and equally well cultivated land in its neighborhood. The wages of the labor and the profits of the stock employed in bringing such commodities to market, on the contrary, are seldom out of their natural proportion to those of the other employments of labor and stock in their neighborhood. Such enhancements on the market price are evidently the effect of natural causes, which may hinder the effectual demand from ever being fully supplied, and which may continue, therefore, to operate forever. 
a monopoly granted either to an individual or to a trading company has the same effect as a secret in trade or manufactures. The monopolists, by keeping the market constantly under stock, by never fully supplying the effectual demand, sell their commodities much above the natural price, and raise their emolument, whether they consist in wages or profit, greatly above their natural rate. The price of monopoly is upon every occasion the highest which can be got. The natural price, or the price of free competition, on the contrary, is the lowest which can be taken, not upon every occasion indeed, but for any considerable time together. The one is upon every occasion the highest which can be squeezed out of the buyers, or which it is supposed they will consent to give. The other is the lowest which the sellers can commonly afford to take, and at the same time continue their business. The exclusive privileges of corporations, statutes of apprenticeship, and all those laws which restrain in particular employments, the competition to a smaller number than might otherwise go into them have the same tendency though in a less degree they are a sort of enlarged monopolies and may frequently for ages together and in whole classes of employments keep up the market price of particular commodities above the natural price and maintain both the wages of the labour and the profits of the stock employed about them somewhat above their natural rate such enhancements of the market price may last as long as the regulations of policy which give occasion to them the market price of any particular commodity, though it may continue long above, can seldom continue long below its natural price. Whatever part of it was paid below the natural rate, the persons whose interest it affected would immediately feel the loss, and would immediately withdraw either so much land, or so much labor, or so much stock from being employed about it, that the quantity brought to market would soon be no more than sufficient to supply the effectual demand. Its market price, therefore, would soon rise to the natural rate, this at least would be the case where there was perfect liberty the same statutes of apprenticeship and other corporation laws indeed which when a manufacturer is in prosperity enable the workman to raise his wages a good deal above their natural rate sometimes oblige him when it decays to let them down a good deal below it as in the one case they exclude many people from his employment so in the other they exclude him from many employments the effect of such regulations, however, is not near so durable in sinking the workmen's wages below as in raising them above their natural rate. Their operation in the one way may endure for many centuries, but in the other it can last no longer than the lives of some of the workmen who are bred to the business in the time of its prosperity. When they are gone, the number of those who are afterwards educated to the trade will naturally suit itself to the effectual demand. The policy must be as violent as that of Indostan or ancient Egypt, where every man was bound by a principle of religion to follow the occupation of his father, and was supposed to commit the most horrid sacrilege if he changed it for another, which can, in any particular employment, and for several generations together, sink either the wages of labor or the profits of stock below their natural rate. This is all that I think necessary to be observed at present concerning the deviations, whether occasional or permanent, of the market price of commodities from the natural price. The natural price itself varies with the natural rate of each of its component parts, of wages, profit, and rent, and in every society this rate varies according to their circumstances, according to their riches or poverty, their advancing, stationary, or declining condition. I shall, in the four following chapters, endeavor to explain as fully and distinctly as I can the causes of those different variations. First I shall endeavor to explain what are the circumstances which naturally determine the rate of wages, and in what manner those circumstances are affected by the riches or poverty, by the advancing, stationary, or declining state of the society. Secondly, I shall endeavor to show what are the circumstances which naturally determine the rate of profit, and in what manner, too, those circumstances are affected by the like variations in the state of the society. Though pecuniary wages and profits are very different in the different employments of labor and stock, yet a certain proportion seems commonly to take place between both the pecuniary wages in all the different employments of labor and the pecuniary profits in all the different employments of stock. This proportion, it will appear hereafter, depends partly upon the nature of the different employments, and partly upon the different laws and policy of the society in which they are carried on. But though in many respects dependent upon the laws and policy, this proportion seems to be little affected by the riches or poverty of that society, by its advancing, stationary, or declining condition, but to remain the same, or very nearly the same, in all those different states. I shall, in the third place, endeavor to explain all the different circumstances which regulate this proportion. In the fourth and last place, I shall endeavor to show what are the circumstances which regulate the rent of land, and which either raise or lower the real price of all the different substances which it produces. End of Book 1, Chapter 7
Part One of Chapter Eight of Book One of The Wealth of Nations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Part One of Chapter Eight of Book One of the wages of labor the produce of labor constitutes the natural recompense or wages of labor in that original state of things which precedes both the appropriation of land and the accumulation of stock the whole produce of labor belongs to the laborer he has neither landlord nor master to share with him had this state continued the wages of labor would have augmented with all those improvements in its productive powers to which the division of labor gives occasion all things would gradually have become cheaper they would have been produced by a smaller quantity of labor, and, as the commodities produced by equal quantities of labor would naturally in this state of things be exchanged for one another, they would have been purchased likewise with the produce of a smaller quantity. But though all things would have become cheaper in reality, in appearance many things might have become dearer than before, or have been exchanged for a greater quantity of other goods. Let us suppose, for example, that in the greater part of employments the productive powers of labor had been improved to tenfold, or that a day's labor could produce ten times the quantity of work which it had done originally, but that in a particular employment they had been improved only to double, or that a day's labor could produce only twice the quantity of work which it had done before. In exchanging the produce of a day's labor in the greater part of employments for that of a day's labor in this particular one, ten times the original quantity of work in them would purchase only twice the original quantity in it. Any particular quantity in it, therefore, a pound weight, for example, would appear to be five times dearer than before. In reality, however, it would be twice as cheap. Though it required five times the quantity of other goods to purchase it, it would require only half the quantity of labor either to purchase or to produce it. The acquisition, therefore, would be twice as easy as before. But this original state of things, in which the laborer enjoyed the whole produce of his own labor, could not last beyond the first introduction of the appropriation of land and the accumulation of stock. It was at an end, therefore, long before the most considerable improvements were made in the productive powers of labor. And it would be to no purpose to trace further what might have been its effects upon the recompense or wages of labor. As soon as land becomes private property, the landlord demands a share of almost all the produce which the laborer can either raise or collect from it. His rent makes the first deduction from the produce of the labor which is employed upon land. It seldom happens that the person who tills the ground has wherewithal to maintain himself till he reaps the harvest. His maintenance is generally advanced to him from the stock of a master, the farmer who employs him, and who would have no interest to employ him unless he was to share in the produce of his labor, or unless his stock was to be replaced to him with a profit. This profit makes a second deduction from the produce of the labor which is employed upon land. The produce of almost all other labor is liable to the like deduction of profit. In all arts and manufactures, the great part of the workmen stand in need of a master, to advance them the materials of their work and their wages and maintenance, till it be completed. He shares in the produce of their labor, or in the value which it adds to the materials upon which it is bestowed, and in this share consists his profit. It sometimes happens, indeed, that a single independent workman has stock sufficient both to purchase the materials of his work and to maintain himself till it be completed. He is both master and workman, and enjoys the whole produce of his own labor, or the whole value which it adds to the materials upon which it is bestowed. It includes what are usually two distinct revenues, belonging to two distinct persons, the profits of stock and the wages of labor. Such cases, however, are not very frequent and in every part of Europe twenty workmen serve under a master for one that is independent, and the wages of labor are everywhere understood to be what they usually are when the laborer is one person and the owner of the stock which employs him another. What are the common wages of labor depends everywhere upon the contract usually made between those two parties, whose interests are by no means the same. The workmen desire to get as much, the masters to give as little as possible. The former are disposed to combine in order to raise, the latter in order to lower, the wages of labor. It is not, however, difficult to foresee which of the two parties must, upon all ordinary occasions, have the advantage in the dispute, and force the other into a compliance with their terms. The masters, being few in number, can combine much more easily, and the law, besides, authorizes, or at least does not prohibit their combinations, while it prohibits those of the workmen. We have no acts of Parliament against combining to lower the price of work, but many against combining to raise it. In all such disputes the masters can hold out much longer. 
a landlord a farmer a master manufacturer or merchant though they did not employ a single workman could generally live a year or two upon the stocks which they have already acquired many workmen could not subsist a week few could subsist a month and scarce any a year without employment in the long run the workman may be as necessary to his master as his master is to him but the necessity is not so immediate we rarely hear it has been said of the combinations of masters though frequently of those of workmen but whoever imagines upon this account that masters rarely combine is as ignorant of the world as of the subject masters are always and everywhere in a sort of tacit but constant and uniform combination not to raise the wages of labor above their actual rate to violate this combination is everywhere a most unpopular action and a sort of reproach to a master among his neighbors and equals we seldom indeed hear of this combination because it is the usual and one may say the natural state of things which nobody ever hears of masters too sometimes enter into particular combinations to sink the wages of labor even below this rate these are always conducted with the utmost silence and secrecy till the moment of execution and when the workmen yield as they sometimes do without resistance though severely felt by them they are never heard of by other people such combinations however are frequently resisted by a contrary defensive combination of the workmen who sometimes too without any provocation of this kind combine of their own accord to raise tile price of their labor their usual pretenses are sometimes the high price of provisions sometimes the great profit which their masters make by their work but whether their combinations be offensive or defensive they are always abundantly heard of in order to bring the point to a speedy decision they have always recourse to the loudest clamor and sometimes to the most shocking violence and outrage they are desperate and act with the folly and extravagance of desperate men who must either starve or frighten their masters into an immediate compliance with their demands the masters upon these occasions are just as clamorous upon the other side and never cease to call aloud for the assistance of the civil magistrate and the rigorous execution of those laws which have been enacted with so much severity against the combination of servants laborers and journeymen the workmen accordingly very seldom derive any advantage from the violence of those tumultuous combinations which partly from the interposition of the civil magistrate partly from the superior steadiness of the masters partly from the necessity which the greater part of the workmen are under of submitting for the sake of present subsistence generally end in nothing but the punishment or ruin of the ringleaders but though in disputes with their workmen masters must generally have the advantage there is however a certain rate below which it seems impossible to reduce for any considerable time the ordinary wages even of the lowest species of labor a man must always live by his work and his wages must at least be sufficient to maintain him they must even upon most occasions be somewhat more otherwise it would be impossible for him to bring up a family and the race of such workmen could not last beyond the first generation mr cantillon seems upon this account to suppose that the lowest species of common laborers must everywhere earn at least double their own maintenance in order that one with another they may be enabled to bring up two children the labor of the wife on account of her necessary attendance on the children being supposed no more than sufficient to provide for herself but one half the children born it is computed die before the age of manhood the poorest laborers therefore according to this account must one with another attempt to rear at least four children in order that two may have an equal chance of living to that age but the necessary maintenance of four children it is supposed may be nearly equal to that of one man the labor of an able-bodied slave the same author adds is computed to be worth double his maintenance and that of the meanest laborer he thinks cannot be worth less than that of an able-bodied slave thus far at least seems certain that in order to bring up a family the laborer of the husband and wife together must even in the lowest species of common labor be able to earn something more than what is precisely necessary for their own maintenance but in what proportion whether in that above mentioned or many other i shall not take upon me to determine there are certain circumstances however which sometimes give the laborers an advantage and enable them to raise their wages considerably above this rate evidently the lowest which is consistent with common humanity when in any country the demand for those who live by wages laborers journeymen servants of every kind is continually increasing when every year furnishes employment for a greater number than had been employed the year before the workmen have no occasion to combine in order to raise their wages the scarcity of hands occasions a competition among masters who bid against one another in order to get workmen and thus voluntarily break through the natural combination of masters not to raise wages the demand for those who live by wages it is evident cannot increase but in proportion to the increase of the funds which are destined to the payment of wages these funds are of two kinds 
first, the revenue which is over and above what is necessary for the maintenance, and secondly, the stock which is over and above what is necessary for the employment of their masters. When the landlord, annuitant, or moneyed man has a greater revenue than what he judges sufficient to maintain his own family, he employs either the whole or a part of the surplus in maintaining one or more menial servants. Increase the surplus, and he will naturally increase the number of those servants. When an independent workman, such as a weaver or shoemaker, has got more stock than what is sufficient to purchase the materials of his own work, and to maintain himself till he can dispose of it, he naturally employs one or more journeymen with the surplus, in order to make a profit by their work. Increase this surplus, and he will naturally increase the number of his journeymen. The demand for those who live by wages, therefore, necessarily increases with the increase of the revenue and stock of every country, and cannot possibly increase without it. The increase of revenue and stock is the increase of national wealth. The demand for those who live by wages, therefore, naturally increases with the increase of national wealth, and cannot possibly increase without it. It is not the actual greatness of national wealth, but its continual increase, which occasions a rise in the wages of labor. It is not, accordingly, in the richest countries, but in the most thriving, or in those which are growing rich the fastest, that the wages of labor are highest. England is certainly, in the present times, a much richer country than any part of North America. The wages of labor, however, are much higher in North America than in any part of England. In the province of New York, common laborers earned in 1773, before the commencement of the late disturbances, three shillings and sixpence currency, equal to two shillings sterling a day. Ship carpenters, ten shillings and sixpence currency, with a pint of rum worth sixpence sterling, equal in all to six shillings and sixpence sterling. House carpenters and bricklayers, eight shillings currency, equal to four shillings and sixpence sterling. Journeyman tailors, five shillings currency, equal to about two shillings and ten pence sterling. These prices are all above the London price, and wages are said to be as high in the other colonies as in New York. The price of provisions is everywhere in North America much lower than in England. A dearth has never been known there. In the worst seasons they have always had a sufficiency for themselves, though less for exportation. If the money price of labor, therefore, be higher than it is anywhere in the mother country, its real price, the real command of the necessaries and conveniencies of life which it conveys to the laborer, must be higher in a still greater proportion. But though North America is not yet so rich as England, it is much more thriving, and advancing with much greater rapidity to the further acquisition of riches. The most decisive mark of the prosperity of any country is the increase of the number of its inhabitants. In Great Britain, and most other European countries, they are not supposed to double in less than five hundred years. In the British colonies in North America, it has been found that they double in twenty or five and twenty years. Nor in the present times is this increase principally owing to the continual importation of new inhabitants, but to the great multiplication of the species. Those who live to old age, it is said, frequently see there from fifty to a hundred, and sometimes many more, descendants from their own body. Labor is there so well rewarded that a numerous family of children, instead of being a burden, is a source of opulence and prosperity to the parents. The labor of each child, before it can leave their house, is computed to be worth a hundred pounds clear gain to them. A young widow with four or five young children, who, among the middling or inferior ranks of people in Europe, would have so little chance for a second husband, is there frequently courted as a sort of fortune. The value of children is the greatest of all encouragements to marriage. We cannot, therefore, wonder that the people in North America should generally marry very young. Notwithstanding the great increase occasioned by such early marriages, there is a continual complaint of the scarcity of hands in North America. The demand for laborers, the funds destined for maintaining them increase, it seems, still faster than they can find laborers to employ. Though the wealth of a country should be very great, yet if it has been long stationary, we must not expect to find the wages of labor very high in it. The funds destined for the payment of wages, the revenue and stock of its inhabitants, may be of the greatest extent, but if they have continued for several centuries of the same, or very nearly of the same extent, the number of laborers employed every year could easily supply, and even more than supply, the number wanted the following year. There could seldom be any scarcity of hands, nor could the masters be obliged to bid against one another in order to get them. The hands, on the contrary, would in this case naturally multiply beyond their employment. There would be a constant scarcity of employment, and the laborers would be obliged to bid against one another in order to get it. If in such a country the wages of labor had ever been more than sufficient to maintain the labor, and to enable him to bring up a family, the competition of the laborers and the interest of the masters would soon reduce them to the lowest rate which is consistent with common humanity. 
China has been long one of the richest, that is, one of the most fertile, best cultivated, most industrious, and most populous countries in the world. It seems, however, to have been long stationary. Marco Polo, who visited it more than 500 years ago, describes its cultivation, industry, and populousness almost in the same terms in which they are described by travelers in the present times. It had, perhaps, even long before his time, acquired that full complement of riches which the nature of its laws and institutes permits it to acquire. The accounts of all travelers, inconsistent in many other respects, agree in the low wages of labor and in the difficulty which a laborer finds in bringing up a family in China. If by digging the ground a whole day he can get what will purchase a small quantity of rice in the evening, he is contented. The condition of artificers is, if possible, still worse. Instead of waiting indolently in their workhouses for the calls of their customers, as in Europe, they are continually running about the streets with the tools of their respective trades, offering their services, and, as it were, begging employment. The poverty of the lower ranks of people in China far surpasses that of the most beggarly nations in Europe. In the neighborhood of Canton, many hundred, it is commonly said, many thousand families have no habitation on the land, but live constantly in little fishing boats upon the rivers and canals. The subsistence which they find there is so scanty that they are eager to fish up the nastiest garbage thrown overboard from any European ship. Any carrion, the carcass of a dead dog or cat, for example, though half putrid and stinking, is as welcome to them as the most wholesome food to the people of other countries. Marriage is encouraged in China, not by the profitableness of children, but by the liberty of destroying them. In all great towns, several are every night exposed in the street or drowned like puppies in the water. The performance of this horrid office is even said to be the avowed business by which some people earn their subsistence. China, however, though it may perhaps stand still, does not seem to go backwards. Its towns are nowhere deserted by the inhabitants. The lands which had once been cultivated are nowhere neglected. The same, or very nearly the same, annual labor must therefore continue to be performed, and the funds destined for maintaining it must not, consequently, be sensibly diminished. The lowest class of laborers, therefore, notwithstanding their scanty subsistence, must some way or another make shift to continue their race so far as to keep up their usual numbers. But it would be otherwise in a country where the funds destined for the maintenance of labor were sensibly decaying. Every year the demand for servants and laborers would, in all the different classes of employments, be less than it had been the year before. Many who had been bred in the superior classes, not being able to find employment in their own business, would be glad to seek it in the lowest. The lowest class, being not only overstocked with its own workmen, but with the overflowings of all the other classes, the competition for employment would be so great in it as to reduce the wages of labor to the most miserable and scanty subsistence of the laborer. Many would not be able to find employment even upon these hard times, but would either starve or be driven to seek a subsistence either by begging or by the perpetuation, perhaps, of the greatest enormities. Want, famine, and mortality would immediately prevail in that class, and from thence extend themselves to all the superior classes, till the number of inhabitants in the country was reduced to what could easily be maintained by the revenue and stock which maintained in it, and which had escaped either the tyranny or calamity which had destroyed the rest. This, perhaps, is nearly the present state of Bengal, and of some other of the English settlements in the East Indies. In a fertile country, which had before been much depopulated, where subsistence, consequently, should not be very difficult, and where, notwithstanding, three or four hundred thousand people die of hunger in one year, we may be assured that the funds destined for the maintenance of the laboring poor are fast decaying. The difference between the genius of the British Constitution, which protects and governs North America, and that of the mercantile company which oppresses and domineers in the East Indies, cannot perhaps be better illustrated than by the different state of those countries. The liberal reward of labor, therefore, as it is the necessary effect, so it is the necessary symptom of increasing national wealth. The scanty maintenance of the laboring poor, on the other hand, is the natural symptom that things are at a stand, and their starving condition that they are going fast backwards. In Great Britain the wages of labor seem, in the present times, to be evidently more than what is precisely necessary to enable the laborer to bring up a family. In order to satisfy ourselves upon this point, it will not be necessary to enter into any tedious or doubtful calculation of what may be the lowest sum upon which it is possible to do this. There are many plain symptoms that the wages of labor are nowhere in this country regulated by the lowest rate, which is consistent with common humanity. First, in almost every part of Great Britain there is a distinction, even in the lowest species of labor, between summer and winter wages. Summer wages are always highest. But, on account of the extraordinary expense of fuel, the maintenance of a family is most expensive in winter. 
Wages, therefore, being highest when this expense is lowest, it seems evident that they are not regulated by what is necessary for this expense, but by the quantity and supposed value of the work. A labourer, it may be said, indeed, ought to save part of his summer wages in order to defray his winter expense, and that, through the whole year, they do not exceed what is necessary to maintain his family through the whole year. A slave, however, or one absolutely dependent on us for immediate subsistence, would not be treated in this manner. His daily subsistence would be proportioned to his daily necessities. Secondly, the wages of labour do not, in Great Britain, fluctuate with the price of provisions. These vary everywhere from year to year, frequently from month to month. But in many places the money price of labour remains uniformly the same, sometimes for half a century together. If in these places, therefore, the labouring poor can maintain their families in dear years, they must be at their ease in times of moderate plenty, and in affluence in those of extraordinary cheapness. The high price of provisions during these ten years past has not, in many parts of the kingdom, been accompanied with any sensible rise in the money price of labour. It has, indeed, in some, owing probably more to the increase of the demand for labour than to that of the price of provisions. Thirdly, as the price of provisions varies more from year to year than the wages of labour, so, on the other hand, the wages of labour vary more from place to place than the price of provisions. The prices of bread and butcher's meat are generally the same, or very nearly the same, through the greater part of the United Kingdom. These, and most other things which are sold by retail, the way in which the labouring poor buy all things, are generally fully as cheap or cheaper in great towns than in the remoter parts of the country, for reasons which I shall have occasion to explain hereafter. But the wages of labour in a great town and its neighbourhood are frequently a fourth or a fifth part, twenty or five and twenty per cent higher than at a few miles distance. Eighteen pence a day may be reckoned the common price of labour in London and its neighbourhood. At a few miles distance it falls to fourteen and fifteen pence. Ten pence may be reckoned its price in Edinburgh and its neighbourhood. At a few miles distance it falls to eight pence, the usual price of common labour through the greater part of the low country of Scotland, where it varies a good deal less than in England. Such a difference of prices, which, it seems, is not always sufficient to transport a man from one parish to another, would necessarily occasion so great a transportation of the most bulky commodities, not only from one parish to another, but from one end of the kingdom, almost from one end of the world to the other, as would soon reduce them more nearly to a level. After all that has been said of the levity and inconstancy of human nature, it appears evidently from experience that man is, of all sorts of luggage, the most difficult to be transported. If the labouring poor, therefore, can maintain their families in those parts of the kingdom where the price of labour is lowest, they must be in affluence where it is highest. Fourthly, the variations in the price of labour not only do not correspond, either in place or time, with those in the price of provisions, but they are frequently quite opposite. Grain, the food of the common people, is dearer in Scotland than in England, whence Scotland receives almost every year very large supplies. But English corn must be sold dearer in Scotland, the country to which it is brought, than in England, the country from which it comes. And in proportion to its quality, it cannot be sold dearer in Scotland than the Scotch corn that comes to the same market in competition with it. The quality of grain depends chiefly upon the quantity of flour or meal which it yields at the mill. And in this respect, English grain is so much superior to the Scotch, that though often dearer in appearance, or in proportion to the measure of its bulk, it is generally cheaper in reality, or in proportion to its quality, or even to the measure of its weight. The price of labour, on the contrary, is dearer in England than in Scotland. If the labouring poor, therefore, can maintain their families in the one part of the United Kingdom, they must be in affluence in the other. Oatmeal, indeed, supplies the common people in Scotland with the greatest and the best part of their food, which is, in general, much inferior to that of their neighbours of the same rank in England. This difference, however, in the mode of their subsistence is not the cause, but the effect of their difference in their wages, though by a strange misapprehension I have frequently heard it represented as the cause. It is not because one man keeps a coach while his neighbour walks a foot that the one is rich and the other poor but because the one is rich he keeps a coach and because the other is poor he walks afoot during the course of the last century taking one year from another grain was dearer in both parts of the united kingdom than during that of the present this is a matter of fact which cannot now admit of any reasonable doubt and the proof of it is if possible still more decisive with regard to scotland than with regard to england it is in Scotland, supported by the evidence of the public fires, annual valuations made upon oath, according to the actual state of the markets, of all the different sorts of grain in every different county of Scotland. 
if such direct proof could require any collateral evidence to confirm it i would observe that this has likewise been the case in france and probably in most other parts of europe with regard to france there is the clearest proof but though it is certain that in both parts of the united kingdom grain was somewhat dearer in the last century than in the present it is equally certain that labour was much cheaper if the labouring poor therefore could bring up their families then they must be much more at their ease now in the last century the most usual day wages of common labour through the greater part of scotland were sixpence in summer and fivepence in winter three shillings a week the same price very nearly still continues to be paid in some parts of the highlands and western islands through the greater part of the low country the most usual wages of common labour are now eightpence a day tenpence sometimes a shilling about edinburgh in the counties which border upon england probably on account of that neighbourhood and in a few other places where there has lately been a considerable rise in the demand for labour about glasgow carron ayrshire etc in england the improvements of agriculture manufactures and commerce began much earlier than in scotland the demand for labour and consequently its price must necessarily have increased with those improvements in the last century accordingly as well as in the present the wages of labour were higher in england than in scotland they have risen too considerably since that time though on account of the greater variety of wages paid there in different places it is more difficult to ascertain how much in sixteen fourteen the pay of a foot soldier was the same as in the present times eight pence a day when it was first established it would naturally be regulated by the usual wages of common labourers the rank of people from which foot soldiers are commonly drawn lord chief justice hales who wrote in the time of charles the second computes the necessary expense of a labourer's family consisting of six persons the father and mother two children able to do something and two not able at ten shillings a week or twenty six pounds a year if they cannot earn this by their labour they must make it up he supposes either by begging or stealing he appears to have inquired very carefully into this subject in sixteen eighty eight mr gregory king whose skill in political arithmetic is so much extolled by dr davenet computed the ordinary income of labourers and out servants to be fifteen pounds a year to a family which he supposed to consist one with another of three and a half persons his calculation therefore though different in appearance corresponds very nearly at bottom with that of judge hales both supposed the weekly expense of such families to be about twenty pence a head both the pecuniary income and expense of such families have increased considerably since that time through the greater part of the kingdom in some places more and in some less though perhaps scarce anywhere so much as some exaggerated accounts of the present wages of labour have lately represented them to the public the price of labour it must be observed cannot be ascertained very accurately anywhere different prices being often paid at the same place and for the same sort of labour not only according to the different abilities of the workmen but according to the easiness and hardness of the masters where wages are not regulated by law all that we can pretend to determine is what are the most usual and experience seems to show that law can never regulate them properly though it has often pretended to do so end of book one chapter eight part one part two of chapter eight of book one of the wealth of nations this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Part 2 of Chapter 8 of Book 1 of The Wages of Labor. The real recompense of labor, the real quantity of the necessaries and conveniencies of life which it can procure to the laborer, has, during the course of the present century, increased, perhaps in a still greater proportion than its money price not only grain has become somewhat cheaper but many other things from which the industrious poor derive an agreeable and wholesome variety of food have become a great deal cheaper potatoes for example do not at present through the greater part of the kingdom cost half the price which they used to do thirty or forty years ago the same thing may be said of turnips carrots cabbages things which were formerly never raised but by the spade but which are now commonly raised by the plough all sort of garden stuff too has become cheaper the greater part of the apples and even of the onions consumed in great britain were in the last century imported from flanders the great improvements in the coarser manufactories of both linen and woollen cloth furnish the labourers with cheaper and better clothing and those in the manufactories of the coarser materials with cheaper and better instruments of trade as well as with many agreeable and convenient pieces of household furniture soap salt candles leather and fermented liquors have indeed become a good deal dearer 
chiefly from the taxes which have been laid upon them. The quantity of these, however, which the labouring poor are under any necessity of consuming, is so very small that the increase in their price does not compensate the diminution in that of so many other things. The common complaint, that luxury extends itself even to the lowest ranks of the people, and that the labouring poor will not now be contented with the same food, clothing, and lodging which satisfied them in former times, may convince us that it is not the money price of labour only, but its real recompense which has augmented. Is this improvement in the circumstances of the lower ranks of the people to be regarded as an advantage, or as an inconveniency to the society? The answer seems at first abundantly plain. Servants, laborers, and workmen of different kinds make up the far greater part of every great political society. But what improves the circumstances of the greater part can never be regarded as any inconveniency to the whole. No society can surely be flourishing and happy of which the far greater part of the members are poor and miserable. It is but equity besides that they who feed, clothe, and lodge the whole body of the people should have such a share of the produce of their own labor as to be themselves tolerably well fed, clothed, and lodged. Poverty, though it no doubt discourages, does not always prevent marriage. It seems even to be favorable to generation. A half-starved highland woman frequently bears more than twenty children, while a pampered fine lady is often incapable of bearing any, and is generally exhausted by two or three. Barrenness, so frequent among women of fashion, is very rare among those of inferior station. Luxury, in the fair sex, while it inflames, perhaps the passion for enjoyment, seems also to weaken, and frequently to destroy altogether, the powers of generation. But poverty, though it does not prevent the generation, is extremely unfavorable to the rearing of children. The tender plant is produced, but in so cold a soil and so severe a climate soon withers and dies. It is not uncommon, I have been frequently told, in the highlands of Scotland, for a mother who has borne twenty children not to have two alive. Several officers of great experience have assured me that, so far from recruiting their regiment, they have never been able to supply it with drums and fifes from all the soldiers' children that were born in it. A greater number of fine children, however, is seldom seen anywhere than about a barrack of soldiers. Very few of them, it seems, arrive at the age of thirteen or fourteen. In some places, one half the children die before they are four years of age, in many places before they are seven, and in almost all places before they are nine or ten. This great mortality, however, will everywhere be found chiefly among the children of the common people, who cannot afford to tend them with the same care as those of better station. Though their marriages are generally more fruitful than those of people of fashion, a smaller proportion of their children arrive at maturity. In founding hospitals, and among the children brought up by parish charities, the mortality is still greater than among those of the common people. Every species of animals naturally multiplies in proportion to the means of their subsistence, and no species can ever multiply beyond it. But in civilized society it is only among the inferior ranks of people that the scantiness of subsistence can set limits to the further multiplication of the human species, and it can do so in no other way than by destroying a great part of the children which their fruitful marriages produce. The liberal reward of labor, by enabling them to provide better for their children, and consequently to bring up a greater number, naturally tends to widen and extend those limits. It deserves to be remarked, too, that it necessarily does this as nearly as possible in the proportion which the demand for labor requires. If this demand is continually increasing, the reward of labor must necessarily encourage in such a manner the marriage and multiplication of labors, as may enable them to supply that continually increasing demand by a continually increasing population. If the reward should at any time be less than what was requisite for this purpose, the deficiency of hands would soon raise it and if it should at any time be more, their excessive multiplication would soon lower it to this necessary rate. The market would be so much understocked with labor in the one case, and so much overstocked in the other, as would soon force back its price to that proper rate which the circumstances of the society required. It is in this manner that the demand for men, like that for any other commodity, necessarily regulates the production of men, quickens it when it goes on too slowly, and stops it when it advances too fast. It is this demand which regulates and determines the state of propagation in all the different countries of the world, in North America, in Europe, and in China, which renders it rapidly progressive in the first, slow and gradual in the second, and altogether stationary in the last. The wear and tear of a slave, it has been said, is at the expense of his master, but that of a free servant is at his own expense. The wear and tear of the latter, however, is in reality as much at the expense of his master as that of the former. 
the wages paid to journeymen and servants of every kind must be such as may enable them one with another to continue the race of journeymen and servants according as the increase diminishing or stationary demand of the society may happen to require but though the wear and tear of a free servant be equally at the expense of his master it generally costs him much less than that of a slave the fund destined for replacing or repairing if i may say so the wear and tear of the slave is commonly managed by a negligent master or careless overseer that destined for performing the same office with regard to the free man is managed by the free man himself the disorders which generally prevail in the economy of the rich naturally introduce themselves into the management of the former the strict frugality and parsimonious attention of the poor as naturally establish themselves in that of the latter under such different management the same purpose must require very different degrees of expense to execute it it appears accordingly from the experience of all ages and nations i believe that the work done by freemen comes cheaper in the end than that performed by slaves it is found to do so even at boston new york and philadelphia where the wages of common labor are so very high the liberal reward of labor therefore as it is the effect of increasing wealth so it is the cause of increasing population to complain of it is to lament over the necessary cause and effect of the greatest public prosperity it deserves to be remarked perhaps that it is in the progressive state while the society is advancing to the further acquisition rather than when it has acquired its full complement of riches that the condition of the labouring poor of the great body of the people seems to be the happiest and the most comfortable it is hard in the stationary and miserable in the declining state the progressive state is in reality the cheerful and the hearty state to all the different orders of the society the stationary is dull the declining melancholy the liberal reward of labor as it encourages the propagation so it increases the industry of the common people the wages of labor are the encouragement of industry which like every other human quality improves in proportion to the encouragement it receives a plentiful subsistence increases the bodily strength of the laborer and the comfortable hope of bettering his condition and of ending his days perhaps in ease and plenty animates him to exert that strength to the utmost where wages are high accordingly we shall always find the workmen more active diligent and expeditious than where they are low in england for example than in scotland in the neighbourhood of great towns than in remote country places some workmen indeed when they can earn in four days what will maintain them through the week will be idle the other three this however is by no means the case with the greater part workmen on the contrary when they are liberally paid by the peace are very apt to overwork themselves and to ruin their health and constitution in a few years a carpenter in london and in some other places is not supposed to last in his utmost vigour above eight years something of the same kind happens in many other trades in which the workmen are paid by the piece as they generally are in manufactures and even in country labour wherever wages are higher than ordinary almost every class of artificers is subject to some peculiar infirmity occasioned by excessive application to their peculiar species of work Ramazzini, an eminent Italian physician, has written a particular book concerning such diseases. We do not reckon our soldiers the most industrious set of people among us. Yet when soldiers have been employed in some particular sorts of work, and liberally paid by the peace, their officers have frequently been obliged to stipulate with the undertaker that they should not be allowed to earn above a certain sum every day, according to the rate at which they were paid. Till this stipulation was made, mutual emulation and the desire of greater gain frequently prompted them to overwork themselves, and to hurt their health by excessive labor. Excessive application during four days of the week is frequently the real cause of the idleness of the other three, so much and so loudly complained of. Great labor, either of mind or body, continued for several days together, is, in most men, naturally followed by a great desire of relaxation, which, if not restrained by force, or by some strong necessity, is almost irresistible it is the call of nature which requires to be relieved by some indulgence sometimes of ease only but sometimes too of dissipation and diversion if it is not complied with the consequences are often dangerous and sometimes fatal and such as almost always sooner or later bring on the peculiar infirmity of the trade if masters would always listen to the dictates of reason and humanity they have frequently occasion rather to moderate than to animate the application of many of their workmen it will be found i believe in every sort of trade that the man who works so moderately as to be able to work constantly not only preserves his health the longest but in the course of the year executes the greatest quantity of work in cheap years it is pretended workmen are generally more idle and in dear times more industrious than ordinary a plentiful subsistence therefore it has been concluded relaxes and a scanty one quickens their industry that a little more plenty than ordinary may render some workmen idle cannot be well doubted 
but that it should have this effect upon the greater part, or that men in general should work better when they are ill-fed than when they are well-fed, when they are disheartened than when they are in good spirits, when they are frequently sick than when they are generally in good health, seems not very probable. Years of dearth, it is to be observed, are generally among the common people years of sickness and mortality, which cannot fail to diminish the produce of their industry. In years of plenty, servants frequently leave their masters and trust their subsistence to what they can make by their own industry. But the same cheapness of provisions, by increasing the fund which is destined for the maintenance of servants, encourages masters, farmers especially, to employ a greater number. Farmers, upon such occasions, expect more profit from their corn by maintaining a few more laboring servants than by selling it at a low price in the market. The demand for servants increases, while the number of those who offer to supply that demand diminishes. The price of labor, therefore, frequently rises in cheap years. In years of scarcity, the difficulty and uncertainty of subsistence make all such people eager to return to service. But the high price of provisions, by diminishing the funds destined for the maintenance of servants, disposes masters rather to diminish than to increase the number of those they have. In dear years, too, poor independent workmen frequently consume the little stock with which they had used to supply themselves with the materials of their work, and are obliged to become journeymen for subsistence. More people want employment than easily get it. Many are willing to take it upon lower terms than ordinary, and the wages of both servants and journeymen frequently sink in dear years. Masters of all sorts, therefore, frequently make better bargains with their servants in dear than in cheap years, and find them more humble and dependent in the former than in the latter. They naturally, therefore, commend the former as more favorable to industry. Landlords and farmers, besides, two of the largest classes of masters, have another reason for being pleased with dear years. The rents of the one and the profits of the other depend very much upon the price of provisions. Nothing can be more absurd, however, than to imagine that men in general should work less when they work for themselves than when they work for other people. A poor independent workman will generally be more industrious than even a journeyman who works by the piece. The one enjoys the whole produce of his own industry, the other shares it with his master. The one, in his separate independent state, is less liable to the temptations of bad company, which, in large manufactories, so frequently ruin the morals of the other. The superiority of the independent workmen over those servants who are hired by the month or by the year, and whose wages and maintenance are the same, whether they do much or do little, is likely to be still greater. Cheap years tend to increase the proportion of independent workmen to journeymen and servants of all kinds, and dear years to diminish it. A French author of great knowledge and ingenuity, Mr. Massance, receiver of the tallies in the election of St. Etienne, endeavors to show that the poor do more work in cheap than in dear years, by comparing the quantity and value of the goods made upon those different occasions in three different manufactures, one of coarse woolens carried on in Elbeuf, one of linen, and another of silk, both which extend through the whole generality of Rouen. It appears from his account, which is copied from the registers of the public offices, that the quantity and value of the goods made in all those three manufactories has generally been greater in cheap than in dear years, and that it has always been greatest in the cheapest and least in the dearest years. All the three seem to be stationary manufactures, or which, though their produce may vary somewhat from year to year, are, upon the whole, neither going backwards nor forwards. The manufacture of linen in Scotland and that of coarse woolens in the West Riding of Yorkshire are growing manufactures, of which the produce is generally, though with some variations, increasing both in quantity and value. Upon examining, however, the accounts which have been published of their annual produce, I have not been able to observe that its variations have had any sensible connection with the dearness or cheapness of the seasons. In 1740, a year of great scarcity, both manufactures, indeed, appear to have declined very considerably. But in 1756, another year of great scarcity, the Scotch manufacturers made more than ordinary advances. The Yorkshire manufacture, indeed, declined, and its produce did not rise to what it had been in 1755 till 1766, after the repeal of the American Stamp Act. In that and the following year, it greatly exceeded what it had ever been before, and it has continued to advance ever since. The produce of all great manufacturers for distant sale must necessarily depend not so much upon the dearness or cheapness of the seasons in the countries where they are carried on, as upon the circumstances which affect the demand in the countries where they are consumed, upon peace or war, upon the prosperity or declension of other rival manufacturers, and upon the good or bad humor of their principal customers. A great part of the extraordinary work besides which is probably done in cheap years never enters the public registers of manufacturers. The men-servants, who leave their masters, become independent laborers. 
the women return to their parents and commonly spin in order to make clothes for themselves and their families even the independent workmen do not always work for public sale but are employed by some of their neighbours in manufactures for family use the produce of their labour therefore frequently makes no figure in those public registers of which the records are sometimes published with so much parade and from which our merchants and manufacturers would often vainly pretend to announce the prosperity or declension of the greatest empires though the variations in the price of labour not only do not always correspond with those in the price of provisions but are frequently quite opposite we must not upon this account imagine that the price of provisions has no influence upon that of labour the money price of labour is necessarily regulated by two circumstances the demand for labour and the price of the necessaries and conveniencies of life the demand for labour according as it happens to be increasing stationary or declining or to require an increasing stationary or declining population determines the quantities of the necessaries and conveniencies of life which must be given to the labourer and the money price of labour is determined by what is requisite for purchasing this quantity though the money price of labour therefore is sometimes high where the price of provisions is low it would be still higher the demand continuing the same if the price of provisions was high it is because the demand for labour increases in years of sudden and extraordinary plenty and diminishes in those of sudden and extraordinary scarcity that the money price of labour sometimes rises in the one and sinks in the other in a year of sudden and extraordinary plenty there are funds in the hands of many of the employers of industry sufficient to maintain and employ a greater number of industrious people than had been employed the year before and this extraordinary number cannot always be bad those masters therefore who want more workmen bid against one another in order to get them which sometimes raises both the real and the money price of their labour the contrary of this happens in a year of sudden and extraordinary scarcity the funds destined for employing industry are less than they had been the year before a considerable number of people are thrown out of employment who bid one against another in order to get it which sometimes lowers both the real and the money price of labour in seventeen forty a year of extraordinary scarcity many people were willing to work for bare subsistence in the succeeding years of plenty it was more difficult to get labourers and servants the scarcity of a dear year by diminishing the demand for labour tends to lower its price as the high price of provisions tends to raise it the plenty of a cheap year on the contrary by increasing the demand tends to raise the price of labour as the cheapness of provisions tends to lower it in the ordinary variations of the prices of provisions those two opposite causes seem to counterbalance one another which is probably in part the reason why the wages of labour are everywhere so much more steady and permanent than the price of provisions the increase in the wages of labour necessarily increases the price of many commodities by increasing that part of it which resolves itself into wages and so far tends to diminish their consumption both at home and abroad the same cause however which raises the wages of labour the increase of stock tends to increase its productive powers and to make a smaller quantity of labour produce a greater quantity of work the owner of the stock which employs a great number of labourers necessarily endeavours for his own advantage to make such a proper division and distribution of employment that they may be enabled to produce the greatest quantity of work possible for the same reason he endeavours to supply them with the best machinery which either he or they can think of what takes place among the labourers in a particular workhouse takes place for the same reason among those of a great society the greater their number the more they naturally divide themselves into different classes and subdivisions of employment more heads are occupied in inventing the most proper machinery for executing the work of each and it is therefore more likely to be invented there are many commodities therefore which in consequence of these improvements come to be produced by so much less labour than before that the increase of its price is more than compensated by the diminution of its quantity end of book one chapter eight part two chapter nine of book one of the wealth of nations this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by stephen escalera the wealth of nations by adam smith chapter nine of book one of the profits of stock the rise and fall in the profits of stock depend upon the same causes with the rise and fall in the wages of labor the increasing or declining state of the wealth of the society but those causes affect the one and the other very differently the increase of stock which raises wages tends to lower profit when the stocks of many rich merchants are turned into the same trade their mutual competition naturally tends to lower its profits 
and when there is a like increase of stock in all the different trades carried on in the same society, the same competition must produce the same effect in them all. It is not easy, it has already been observed, to ascertain what are the average wages of labor, even in a particular place and at a particular time. We can, even in this case, seldom determine more than what are the most usual wages. But even this can seldom be done with regard to the profits of stock. Profit is so very fluctuating that the person who carries on a particular trade cannot always tell you himself what is the average of his annual profit. It is affected not only by every variation of price in the commodities which he deals in, but by the good or bad fortune both of his rivals and of his customers, and by a thousand other accidents to which goods, when carried either by sea or by land, or even when stored in a warehouse, are liable. It varies, therefore, not only from year to year, but from day to day, and almost from hour to hour, to ascertain what is the average profit of all the different trades carried on in a great kingdom must be much more difficult, and to judge of what it may have been formerly, or in remote periods of time, with any degree of precision, must be altogether impossible. But though it may be impossible to determine, with any degree of precision, what are or were the average profits of stock, either in the present or in ancient times, some notion may be formed of them from the interest of money. It may be laid down as a maxim, that wherever a great deal can be made by the use of money, a great deal will commonly be given for the use of it, and that, wherever little can be made by it, less will commonly be given for it. Accordingly, therefore, as the usual market rate of interest varies in any country, we may be assured that the ordinary profits of stock must vary with it, must sink as it sinks, and rise as it rises. The progress of interest, therefore, may lead us to form some notion of the progress of profit. By the 37th of Henry the Eighth, all interest above 10% was declared unlawful. More, it seems, had sometimes been taken before that. In the reign of Edward the Sixth, religious zeal prohibited all interest. This prohibition, however, like all others of the same kind, is said to have produced no effect, and probably rather increased than diminished the evil of usury. The statute of Henry the Eighth was revived by the 13th of Elizabeth, cap 8, and 10% continued to be the legal rate of interest till the 21st of James I, when it was restricted to 8%. It was reduced to 6% soon after the restoration, and by the 12th of Queen Anne to 5%. All these different statutory regulations seem to have been made with great propriety. They seem to have followed, and not to have gone before, the market rate of interest, or the rate at which people of good credit usually borrowed. Since the time of Queen Anne, five per cent seems to have been rather above than below the market rate. Before the late war, the government borrowed at three per cent, and people of good credit in the capital, and in many other parts of the kingdom, at three and a half, four, and four and a half per cent. Since the time of Henry the Eighth, the wealth and revenue of the country have been continually advancing, and in the course of their progress their pace seems rather to have been gradually accelerating than retarded. They seem to not only have been going on, but to have been going on faster and faster. The wages of labor have been continually increasing during the same period, and in the greater part of the different branches of trade and manufactures, the profits of stock have been diminishing. It generally requires a greater stock to carry on any sort of trade in a great town than in a country village. The great stocks employed in every branch of trade, and the number of rich competitors, generally reduce the rate of profit in the former below what is in the latter. But the wages of labor are generally higher in a great town than in a country village. In a thriving town, the people who have great stocks to employ frequently cannot get the number of workmen they want, and therefore bid against one another in order to get as many as they can, which raises the wages of labor and lowers the profits of stock. In the remote parts of the country there is frequently not stock sufficient to employ all the people, who therefore bid against one another in order to get employment, which lowers the wages of labor and raises the profits of stock. In Scotland, though the legal rate of interest is the same as in England, the market rate is rather higher. People of the best credit there seldom borrow under 5%. Even private bankers in Edinburgh give 4% upon their promissory notes, of which payment, either in whole or in part, may be demanded at pleasure. Private bankers in London give no interest for the money which is deposited with them. There are few trades which cannot be carried on with a similar stock in Scotland than in England. The common rate of profit, therefore, must be somewhat greater. The wages of labor, it has already been observed, are lower in Scotland than in England. The country, too, is not only much poorer, but the steps by which it advances to a better condition, for it is evidently advancing, seem to be much slower and more tardy. 
the legal rate of interest in france has not during the course of the present century been always regulated by the market rate in seventeen twenty interest was reduced from the twentieth to the fiftieth penny or from five to two per cent in seventeen twenty four it was raised to the thirtieth penny or to three and a third per cent in seventeen twenty five it was again raised to the twentieth penny or to five per cent in seventeen sixty six during the administration of mr laverty it was reduced to the twenty fifth penny or to four per cent the abbe terre raised it afterwards to the old rate of five per cent the supposed purpose of many of those violent reductions of interest was to prepare the way for reducing that of the public debts a purpose which has sometimes been executed france is perhaps in the present times not so rich a country as england and though the legal rate of interest has in france frequently been lower than in england the market rate has generally been higher for there as in other countries they have several very safe and easy methods of evading the law the profits of trade i have been assured by british merchants who had traded in both countries are higher in france than in england and it is no doubt upon this account that many british subjects choose rather to employ their capitals in a country where trade is in disgrace than in one where it is highly respected the wages of labour are lower in france than in england when you go from scotland to england the difference which you may remark between the dress and countenance of the common people in the one country and in the other sufficiently indicates the difference in their condition the contrast is still greater when you return from france france though no doubt a richer country than scotland seems not to be going forward so fast it is a common and even a popular opinion in the country that it is going backwards an opinion which i apprehend is ill-founded even with regard to france but which nobody can possibly entertain with regard to scotland who sees the country now and who saw it twenty or thirty years ago the province of holland on the other hand in proportion to the extent of its territory and the number of its people is a richer country than england the government there borrow at two per cent and private people of good credit at three the wages of labour are said to be higher in holland than in england and the dutch it is well known trade upon lower profits than any people in europe the trade of holland it has been pretended by some people is decaying and it may perhaps be true that some particular branches of it are so but these symptoms seem to indicate sufficiently that there is no general decay when profit diminishes merchants are very apt to complain that trade decays though the diminution of profit is the natural effect of its prosperity or of a greater stock being employed in it than before during the late war the dutch gained the whole carrying trade of france of which they still retain a very large share the great property which they possess both in french and english funds about forty millions it is said in the latter in which i suspect however there is a considerable exaggeration the great sums which they lend to private people in countries where the rate of interest is higher than in their own are circumstances which no doubt demonstrate the redundancy of their stock or that it has increased beyond what they can employ with tolerable profit in the proper business of their own country but they do not demonstrate that that business has decreased as the capital of a private man though acquired by a particular trade may increase beyond what he can employ in it and yet that trade continue to increase too so may likewise the capital of a great nation in our north american and west indian colonies not only the wages of labour but the interest of money and consequently the profits of stock are higher than in england in the different colonies both the legal and the market rate of interest run from six to eight per cent high wages of labour and high profits of stock however are things perhaps which scarce ever go together except in the peculiar circumstances of new colonies a new colony must always for some time be more understocked in proportion to the extent of its territory and more underpeopled in proportion to the extent of its stock than the greater part of other countries they have more land than they have stock to cultivate what they have therefore is applied to the cultivation only of what is most fertile and most favourably situated the land near the seashore and along the banks of navigable rivers such land too is frequently purchased at a price below the value even of its natural produce stock employed in the purchase and improvement of such lands must yield a very large profit and consequently afford to pay a very large interest its rapid accumulation in so profitable an employment enables the planter to increase the number of his hands faster than he can find them in a new settlement those whom he can find therefore are very liberally rewarded as the colony increases the profits of stock gradually diminish when the most fertile and best situated lands have been all occupied less profit can be made by the cultivation of what is inferior both in soil and situation and less interest can be afforded for the stock which is so employed in the greater part of our colonies accordingly both the legal and the market rate of interest have been considerably reduced during the course of the present century 
As riches, improvement, and population have increased, interest has declined. The wages of labour do not sink with the profits of stock. The demand for labour increases with the increase of stock, whatever be its profits, and after these are diminished, stock may not only continue to increase, but to increase much faster than before. It is with industrious nations, who are advancing in the acquisition of riches, as with industrious individuals. A great stock, though with small profits, generally increases faster than a small stock with great profits. Money, says the proverb, makes money. When you have got a little, it is often easy to get more. The great difficulty is to get that little. The connection between the increase of stock and that of industry, or of the demand for useful labor, has partly been explained already, but will be explained more fully hereafter in treating of the accumulation of stock. The acquisition of new territory, or of new branches of trade, may sometimes raise the profits of stock, and with them the interest of money, even in a country which is fast advancing in the acquisition of riches. The stock of the country, not being sufficient for the whole accession of business which such acquisitions present to the different people among whom it is divided, is applied to those particular branches only which afford the greatest profit. Part of what had been before employed in other trades is necessarily withdrawn from them, and turned into some of the new and more profitable ones. In all those old trades, therefore, the competition comes to be less than before. The market comes to be less fully supplied with many different sorts of goods. Their profit necessarily rises more or less, and yields a greater profit to those who deal in them, who can, therefore, afford to borrow at a higher interest rate. Their price necessarily rises more or less, and yields a greater profit to those who deal in them, who can, therefore, afford to borrow at a higher interest. For some time after the conclusion of the late war, not only private people of the best credit, but some of the greatest companies in London, commonly borrowed at five per cent, who before that had not been used to pay more than four and four and a half per cent. The great accession both of territory and trade by our acquisitions in North America and the West Indies will sufficiently account for this, without supposing any diminution in the capital stock of the society. So great an accession of new business to be carried on by the old stock must necessarily have diminished the quantity employed in a great number of particular branches, in which the competition being less, the profits must have been greater. I shall hereafter have occasion to mention the reasons which dispose me to believe that the capital stock of Great Britain was not diminished even by the enormous expense of the late war. The diminution of the capital stock of the society, or of the funds destined for the maintenance of industry, however, as it lowers the wages of labor, so it raises the profits of stock, and consequently the interest of money. By the wages of labor being lowered, the owners of what stock remains in the society can bring their goods at less expense to market than before, and less stock being employed in supplying the market than before, they can sell them dearer. Their goods cost them less, and they get more for them. Their profits, therefore, being augmented at both ends, can well afford a large interest. The great fortune so suddenly and so easily acquired in Bengal and the other British settlements in the East Indies may satisfy us that as the wages of labor are very low, so the profits of stock are very high in those ruined countries. The interest of money is proportionably so. In Bengal, money is frequently lent to the farmers at forty, fifty, and sixty per cent, and the succeeding crop is mortgaged for the payment. As the profits which can afford such an interest must eat up almost the whole rent of the landlord, so such enormous usury must in its turn eat up the greater part of those profits. Before the fall of the Roman Republic, a usury of the same kind seems to have been common in the provinces, under the ruinous administration of their proconsuls. The virtuous Brutus lent money in Cyprus at eight and forty per cent, as we learn from the letters of Cicero. In a country which had acquired that full complement of riches which the nature of its soil and climate, and its situation with respect to other countries, allowed it to acquire, which could, therefore, advance no further, and which was not going backwards, both the wages of labor and the profits of stock would probably be very low. In a country fully peopled, in proportion to what either its territory could maintain, or its stock employ, the competition for employment would necessarily be so great as to reduce the wages of labor to what was barely sufficient to keep up with the number of labors, and the country being already fully peopled, that number could never be augmented. In a country fully stocked, in proportion to all the business it had to transact, as great a quantity of stock would be employed in every particular branch as the nature and extent of the trade would admit. The competition, therefore, would everywhere be as great, and, consequently, the ordinary profit as low as possible. But, perhaps, no country has ever yet arrived at this degree of opulence. 
China seems to have been long stationary, and had, probably, long ago acquired that full complement of riches which is consistent with the nature of its laws and institutions. But this complement may be much inferior to what, with other laws and institutions, the nature of its soil, climate, and situation might admit of. A country which neglects or despises foreign commerce, and which admits the vessel of foreign nations into one or two of its ports only, cannot transact the same quantity of business which it might do with different laws and institutions. In a country, too, where, though the rich or the owners of large capitals enjoy a good deal of security, the poor or the owners of small capitals enjoy scarce any, but are liable, under the pretense of justice, to be pillaged and plundered at any time by the inferior mandarins, the quantity of stock employed in all the different branches of business transacted within it can never be equal to what the nature and extent of that business might admit. In every different branch, the oppression of the poor must establish the monopoly of the rich, who, by engrossing the whole trade to themselves, will be able to make very large profits. Twelve percent, accordingly, is said to be the common interest of money in China, and the ordinary profits of stock must be sufficient to afford this large interest. A defect in the law may sometimes raise the rate of interest considerably above what the condition of the country, as to wealth or poverty, would require. When the law does not enforce the performance of contracts, it puts all borrowers nearly upon the same footing with bankrupts, or people of doubtful credit, in better regulated countries. The uncertainty of recovering his money makes the lender exact the same usurious interest which is usually required from bankrupts. Among the barbarous nations who overran the western provinces of the Roman Empire, their performance of contracts was left for many ages to the faith of the contracting parties. The courts of justice of their kings seldom intermeddled in it. The high rate of interest which took place in those ancient times may, perhaps, be partly accounted for from this cause. When the law prohibits interest altogether, it does not prevent it. Many people must borrow, and nobody will lend without such a consideration for the use of their money as is suitable, not only to what can be made by the use of it, but to the difficulty and danger of evading the law. The high rate of interest among all Mahometan nations is accounted for by M. Montesquieu, not from their poverty, but partly from this, and partly from the difficulty of recovering the money. The lowest ordinary rate of profit must always be something more than what is sufficient to compensate the occasional losses to which every employment of stock is exposed. It is this surplus only which is neat or clear profit. What is called gross profit comprehends frequently not only this surplus, but what is retained for compensating such extraordinary losses. The interest which the borrower can afford to pay is in proportion to the clear profit only. The lowest ordinary rate of interest must, in the same manner, be something more than sufficient to compensate the occasional losses to which lending, even with tolerable prudence, is exposed. Were it not, mere charity or friendship could be the only motives for lending. In a country which had acquired its full complement of riches, where, in every particular branch of business, there was the greatest quantity of stock that could be employed in it, as the ordinary rate of clear profit would be very small, so the usual market rate of interest which could be afforded out of it would be so low as to render it impossible for any but the very wealthiest people to live upon the interest of their money. All people of small or middling fortunes would be obliged to superintend themselves the employment of their own stocks. It would be necessary that almost every man should be a man of business, or engage in some sort of trade. The province of Holland seems to be approaching near to this state. It is, therefore, unfashionable not to be a man of business. Necessity makes it usual for almost every man to be so, and custom everywhere regulates fashion. As it is ridiculous not to dress, so is it, in some measure, not to be employed like other people. As a man of a civil profession seems awkward in a camp or a garrison, or is even in some danger of being despised there, so does an idle man among men of business. The highest ordinary rate of profit may be such as, in the price of the greater part of commodities, eats up the whole of what should go to the rent of the land, and leaves only what is sufficient to pay the labor of preparing and bringing them to market, according to the lowest rate at which labor can anywhere be paid, the bare subsistence of the laborer. The workman must always have been fed in some way or other while he was about the work, but the landlord may not always have been paid. The profits of the trade which the servants of the East India Company carry on at Bengal may not, perhaps, be very far from this rate. The proportion which the usual market rate of interest ought to bear to the ordinary rate of clear profit necessarily varies as profit rises or falls. Double interest is in Great Britain reckoned what the merchants call a good, moderate, reasonable profit terms which, I apprehend, mean no more than a common and usual profit. 
in a country where the ordinary rate of clear profit is eight or ten per cent it may be reasonable that one half of it should go to interest wherever business is carried on with borrowed money the stock is at the risk of the borrower who as it were insures it to the lender and four or five per cent may in the greater part of trades be both a sufficient profit upon the risk of this insurance and a sufficient recompense for the trouble of employing the stock but the proportion between interest and clear profit might not be the same in countries where the ordinary rate of profit was either a good deal lower or a good deal higher if it were a good deal lower one half of it perhaps could not be afforded for interest and more might be afforded if it were a good deal higher in countries which are fast advancing to riches the low rate of profit may in the price of many commodities compensate the high wages of labour and enable those countries to sell as cheap as their less thriving neighbours among whom the wages of labour may be lower in reality high profits tend much more to raise the price of work than high wages if in the linen manufacture for example the wages of the different working people the flax dressers the spinners the weavers etc should all of them be advanced two pence a day it would be necessary to heighten the price of a piece of linen only by a number of two pences equal to the number of people that had been employed about it multiplied by the number of days during which they had been so employed that part of the price of the commodity which resolved itself into the wages would through all the different stages of the manufacture rise only in arithmetical proportion to this rise of wages but if the profits of all the different employers of those working people should be raised five per cent that part of the price of the commodity which resolved itself into profit would through all the different stages of the manufacture rise in geometrical proportion to this rise of profit the employer of the flax dressers would in selling his flax require an additional five per cent upon the whole value of the materials and wages which he advanced to his workmen the employer of the spinners would require an additional five per cent both upon the advanced price of the flax and upon the wages of the spinners and the employer of the weavers would require alike five per cent both upon the advanced price of the linen yarn and upon the wages of the weavers in raising the price of commodities the rise of wages operates in the same manner as simple interest does in the accumulation of debt the rise of profit operates like compound interest our merchants and master manufacturers complain much of the bad effects of high wages in raising the price and thereby lessening the sale of their goods both at home and abroad they say nothing concerning the bad effects of high profits they are silent with regard to the pernicious effects of their own gains they complain only of those of other people End of Book 1, Chapter 9part one of chapter ten of Book One of the Wealth of Nations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Part one of chapter ten of book one of wages and profit in the different employments of labor and stock the whole of the advantages and disadvantages of the different employments of labor and stock must in the same neighborhood be either perfectly equal or continually tending to equality if in the same neighborhood there was any employment evidently either more or less advantageous than the rest so many people would crowd into it in the one case and so many would desert it in the other that its advantages would soon return to the level of other employments this at least would be the case in a society where things were left to follow their natural course where there was perfect liberty and where every man was perfectly free both to choose what occupation he thought proper and to change it as often as he thought proper every man's interest would prompt him to seek the advantageous and to shun the disadvantageous employment pecuniary wages and profit indeed are everywhere in europe extremely different according to the different employments of labour and stock but this difference arises partly from certain circumstances in the employments themselves which either really or at least in the imagination of men make up for a small pecuniary gain in some and counterbalance a great one in others and partly from the policy of europe which nowhere leaves things at perfect liberty the particular consideration of those circumstances and of that policy will divide this chapter into two parts part one inequalities arising from the nature of the employments themselves the five following are the principal circumstances which so far as i have been able to observe make up for a small pecuniary gain in some employments and counterbalance a great one in others first the agreeableness or disagreeableness of the employments themselves 
secondly the easiness and cheapness or the difficulty and expense of learning them thirdly the constancy or inconstancy of employment in them fourthly the small or great trust which must be reposed in those who exercise them and fifthly the probability or improbability of success in them first the wages of labour vary with the ease or hardship the cleanliness or dirtiness the honourableness or dishonourableness of the employment thus in most places take the year round a journeyman tailor earns less than a journeyman weaver his work is much easier a journeyman weaver earns less than a journeyman smith his work is not always easier but it is much cleanlier a journeyman blacksmith though an artificer seldom earns so much in twelve hours as a collier who is only a labourer does in eight his work is not quite so dirty is less dangerous and is carried on in daylight and above ground honour makes a great part of the reward of all honourable professions in point of pecuniary gain all things considered they are generally under recompensed as i shall endeavour to show by and by disgrace has the contrary effect the trade of a butcher is a brutal and an odious business, but it is in most places more profitable than the greater part of common trades. The most detestable of all employments, that of public executioner, is, in proportion to the quantity of work done, better paid than any common trade whatever. Hunting and fishing, the most important employments of mankind in the rude state of society, become, in its advanced state, their most agreeable amusements, and they pursue for pleasure what they once followed from necessity. In the advanced state of society, therefore, they are all very poor people who follow as a trade what other people pursue as a pastime. Fishermen have been so since the time of Theocritus. A poacher is everywhere a very poor man in Great Britain. In countries where the rigor of the law suffers no poachers, the licensed hunter is not in a much better condition. The natural taste for those employments makes more people follow them than can live comfortably by them, and the produce of their labor, in proportion to its quantity, comes always too cheap to market to afford anything but the most scanty subsistence to the laborers. Disagreeableness and disgrace affect the profits of stock in the same manner as the wages of labor. The keeper of an inn or tavern, who is never master of his own house, and who is exposed to the brutality of every drunkard, exercises neither a very agreeable nor a very creditable business. But there is scarce any common trade in which a small stock yields so great a profit. Secondly, the wages of labor vary with the easiness and cheapness, or the difficulty and expense of learning the business. When any expensive machine is erected, the extraordinary work to be performed by it before it is worn out, it must be expected, will replace the capital laid out upon it, with at least the ordinary profits. A man educated at the expense of much labor and time to any of those employments which require extraordinary dexterity and skill may be compared to one of those expensive machines. The work which he learns to perform, it must be expected, over and above the usual wages of common labor, will replace to him the whole expense of his education with at least the ordinary profits of an equally valuable capital. It must do this, too, in a reasonable time, regard being had to the very uncertain duration of human life, in the same manner as to the more certain duration of the machine. The difference between the wages of skilled labor and those of common labor is founded upon this principle. The policy of Europe considers the labor of all mechanics, artificers, and manufacturers as skilled labor, and that of all country laborers as common labor. It seems to suppose that of the former to be of a more nice and delicate nature than that of the latter. It is so, perhaps, in some cases, but in the greater part it is quite otherwise, as I shall endeavor to show by and by. The laws and customs of Europe, therefore, in order to qualify any person for exercising the one species of labor, impose the necessity of an apprenticeship, though with different degrees of rigor in different places. They leave the other free and open to everybody. During the continuance of the apprenticeship, the whole labor of the apprentice belongs to his master. In the meantime, he must, in many cases, be maintained by his parents or relations, and in almost all cases must be clothed by them some money too is commonly given to the master for teaching him his trade they who cannot give money give time or become bound for more than the usual number of years a consideration which though it is not always advantageous to the master on account of the usual idleness of apprentices is always disadvantageous to the apprentice in country labor on the contrary the laborer while he is employed about the easier learns the more difficult parts of his business and his own labor maintains him through all the different stages of his employment 
It is reasonable, therefore, that in Europe the wages of mechanics, artificers, and manufacturers should be somewhat higher than those of common laborers. They are so accordingly, and their superior gains make them, in most places, be considered as a superior rank of people. This superiority, however, is generally very small. The daily or weekly earnings of a journeyman in the more common sorts of manufactures, such as those of plain linen and woolen cloth, computed at an average, are, in most places, very little more than the day wages of common laborers. Their employment, indeed, is more steady and uniform, and the superiority of their earnings, taking the whole year together, may be somewhat greater. It seems evidently, however, to be no greater than what is sufficient to compensate the superior expense of their education. Education in the ingenious arts and in the liberal professions is still more tedious and expensive. The pecuniary recompense, therefore, of painters and sculptors, of lawyers and physicians, ought to be much more liberal, and it is so accordingly. The profits of stock seem to be very little affected by the easiness or difficulty of learning the trade in which it is employed. All the different ways in which stock is commonly employed in great towns seem, in reality, to be almost equally easy and equally difficult to learn. One branch, either of foreign or domestic trade, cannot well be a much more intricate business than another. Thirdly, the wages of labor in different occupations vary with the constancy or inconstancy of employment. Employment is much more constant in some trades than in others. In the greater part of manufactures, a journeyman may be pretty sure of employment almost every day in the year that he is able to work. A mason or bricklayer, on the contrary, can work neither in hard frost nor in foul weather, and his employment at all other times depends upon the occasional calls of his customers. He is liable, in consequence, to be frequently without any. What he earns, therefore, while he is employed, must not only maintain him while he is idle, but make him some compensation for those anxious and desponding moments which the thought of so precarious a situation must sometimes occasion. Where the computed earnings of the greater part of manufacturers, accordingly, are nearly upon a level with the day wages of common laborers, those of masons and bricklayers are generally from one-half more to double those wages. Where common laborers earn four or five shillings a week, masons and bricklayers frequently earn seven and eight. Where the former earn six, the latter often earn nine and ten. And where the former earn nine and ten, as in London, the latter commonly earn fifteen and eighteen. No species of skilled labor, however, seems more easy to learn than that of masons and bricklayers. Chairmen in London, during the summer season, are said sometimes to be employed as bricklayers. The high wages of those workmen, therefore, are not so much the recompense of their skill as the compensation for the inconstancy of their employment. A house carpenter seems to exercise rather a nicer and a more ingenious trade than a mason. In most places, however, for it is not universally so, his day wages are somewhat lower. His employment, though it depends much, does not depend so entirely upon the occasional call of his customers, and it is not liable to be interrupted by the weather. When the trades which generally afford constant employment happen in a particular place not to do so, the wages of the workmen always rise a good deal above their ordinary proportion to those of common labor. In London, almost all journeymen artificers are liable to be called upon and dismissed by their masters from day to day, and from week to week, in the same manner as day laborers in other places. The lowest order of artificers, journeymen tailors, accordingly, earn their half a crown a day, though eighteen pence may be reckoned the wages of common labor. In small towns and country villages, the wages of journeymen tailors frequently scarce equal those of common labor, but in London they are often many weeks without employment, particularly during the summer. When the inconstancy of employment is combined with the hardship, disagreeableness, and dirtiness of the work, it sometimes raises the wages of the most common labor above those of the most skillful artificers. A collier working by the piece is supposed at Newcastle to earn commonly about double, and, in many parts of Scotland, about three times the wages of common labor. His high wages arise altogether from the hardship, disagreeableness, and dirtiness of his work. His employment may, upon most occasions, be as constant as he pleases. The coal-heavers in London exercise a trade which, in hardship, dirtiness, and disagreeableness, almost equals that of colliers, and, from the unavoidable irregularity in the arrivals of coal-ships, the employment of the greater part of them is necessarily very inconstant. If colliers, therefore, commonly earn double and triple the wages of common labor, it ought not to seem unreasonable that coal-heavers should sometimes earn four and five times those wages. In the inquiry made into their condition a few years ago, it was found that, at the rate at which they were then paid, they could earn from six to ten shillings a day. 
six shillings are about four times the wages of common labour in london and in every particular trade the lowest common earnings may always be considered as those of the far greater number how extravagant soever those earnings may appear if they were more than sufficient to compensate all the disagreeable circumstances of the business there would soon be so great a number of competitors as in a trade which has no exclusive privilege would quickly reduce them to a lower rate the constancy or inconstancy of employment cannot affect the ordinary profits of stock in any particular trade whether the stock is or is not constantly employed depends not upon the trade but the trader fourthly the wages of labour vary accordingly to the small or great trust which must be reposed in the workmen the wages of goldsmiths and jewellers are everywhere superior to those of many other workmen not only of equal but of much superior ingenuity on account of the precious materials with which they are entrusted we trust our health to the physician our fortune and sometimes our life and reputation to the lawyer and attorney such confidence could not safely be reposed in people of a very mean or low condition their reward must be such therefore as may give them that rank in the society which so important a trust requires the long time and the great expense which must be laid out in their education when combined with this circumstance necessarily enhance still further the price of their labour when a person employs only his own stock and trade there is no trust and the credit which he may get from other people depends not upon the nature of the trade but upon their opinion of his fortune probity and prudence the different rates of profit therefore in the different branches of trade cannot arise from the different degrees of trust reposed in the traders fifthly the wages of labour in different employments vary according to the probability or improbability of success in them the probability that any particular person shall ever be qualified for the employments to which he is educated is very different in different occupations in the greatest part of mechanic trades success is almost certain but very uncertain in the liberal professions put your son apprentice to a shoemaker there is little doubt of his learning to make a pair of shoes but send him to study the law it is at least twenty to one if he ever makes such proficiency as will enable him to live by the business in a perfectly fair lottery those who draw the prizes ought to gain all that is lost by those who draw the blanks in a profession where twenty fail for one that succeeds that one ought to gain all that should have been gained by the unsuccessful twenty the counsellor at law who perhaps at near forty years of age begins to make something by his profession ought to receive the retribution not only of his own so tedious and expensive education but of that of more than twenty others who are never likely to make anything by it how extravagant soever the fees of counsellors at law may sometimes appear their real retribution is never equal to this compute in any particular place what is likely to be annually gained and what is likely to be annually spent by all the different workmen in any common trade such as that of shoemakers or weavers and you will find that the former sum will generally exceed the latter but make the same computation with regard to all the counsellors and students of law in all the different ends of court and you will find that their annual gains bear but a very small proportion to their annual expense even though you rate the former as a high and the latter as low as can well be done the lottery of the law therefore is very far from being a perfectly fair lottery and that as well as many other liberal and honourable professions is in point of pecuniary gain evidently under recompensed those professions keep their level however with other occupations and notwithstanding these discouragements all the most generous and liberal spirits are eager to crowd into them two different causes contribute to recommend them first the desire of the reputation which attends upon superior excellence in any of them and secondly the natural confidence which every man has more or less not only in his own abilities but in his own good fortune to excel in any profession in which but few arrive at mediocrity it is the most decisive mark of what is called genius or superior talents the public admiration which attends upon such distinguished abilities makes always a part of their reward a greater or smaller in proportion as it is higher or lower in degree it makes a considerable part of that reward in the profession of physic a still greater perhaps in that of law in poetry and philosophy it makes almost the whole there are some very agreeable and beautiful talents of which the possession commands a certain sort of admiration but of which the exercise for the sake of gain is considered whether from reason or prejudice as a sort of public prostitution the pecuniary recompense therefore of those who exercise them in this manner must be sufficient not only to pay for the time labour and expense of acquiring the talents but for the discredit which attends the employment of them as the means of subsistence 
the exorbitant rewards of players, opera singers, opera dancers, etc., are founded upon those two principles, the rarity and beauty of the talents, and the discredit of employing them in this manner. It seems absurd at first sight that we should despise their persons and yet reward their talents with the most profuse liberality. While we do the one, however, we must of necessity do the other. Should the public opinion or prejudice ever alter with regard to such occupations, their pecuniary recompense would quickly diminish. More people would apply to them, and the competition would quickly reduce the price of their labor. Such talents, though far from being common, are by no means so rare as imagined. Many people possess them in great perfection, who disdain to make this use of them, and many more are capable of acquiring them, if anything could be made honorably by them. The overweening conceit which the greater part of men have of their own abilities is an ancient evil remarked by the philosophers and moralists of all ages. Their absurd presumption in their own good fortune has been less taken notice of. It is, however, if possible, still more universal. There is no man living who, when in tolerable health and spirits, has not some share of it. The chance of gain is by every man more or less overvalued, and the chance of loss is by most men undervalued, and by scarce any man who is in tolerable health and spirits valued more than it is worth. That the chance of gain is naturally overvalued we may learn from the universal success of lotteries. The world neither ever saw nor ever will see a perfectly fair lottery, or one in which the whole gain compensated the whole loss, because the undertaker could make nothing by it. In the state lotteries, the tickets are really not worth the price which is paid by the original subscribers, and yet commonly sell in the market for twenty, thirty, and sometimes forty per cent advance. The vain hopes of gaining some of the great prizes is the sole cause of this demand. The soberest people scarce look upon it as a folly to pay a small sum for the chance of gaining ten or twenty thousand pounds, though they know that even that small sum is perhaps twenty or thirty per cent more than the chance is worth. In a lottery in which no prize exceeded twenty pounds, though in other respects it approached much nearer to a perfectly fair one than the common state lotteries, there would not be the same demand for tickets. In order to have a better chance for some of the great prizes, some people purchase several tickets, and others small shares in a still greater number. There is not, however, a more certain proposition in mathematics than that the more tickets you adventure upon, the more likely you are to be a loser. Adventure upon all the tickets in the lottery, and you lose for certain, and the greater the number of your tickets, the nearer you approach to this certainty. That the chance of loss is frequently undervalued, and scarce ever valued more than it is worth, we may learn from the very moderate profit of insurers. In order to make insurance, either from fire or sea risk, a trade at all, the common premium must be sufficient to compensate the common losses, to pay the expense of management, and to afford such a profit as might have been drawn from an equal capital employed in any common trade. The person who pays no more than this evidently pays no more than the real value of the risk, or the lowest price at which he can reasonably expect to insure it. But though many people have made a little money by insurance, very few have made a great fortune, and, from this consideration alone, it seems evident enough that the ordinary balance of profit and loss is not more advantageous in this than in other common trades, by which so many people make fortunes. Moderate, however, as the premium of insurance commonly is, many people despise the risk too much to care to pay it. Taking the whole kingdom at an average, nineteen houses in twenty, or rather perhaps ninety-nine in a hundred, are not insured from fire. Sea risk is more alarming to the greater part of people, and the proportion of ships insured to those not insured is much greater. Many sail, however, at all seasons, and even in time of war, without any insurance. This may sometimes, perhaps, be done without any imprudence. When a great company, or even a great merchant, has twenty or thirty ships at sea, they may, as it were, insure one another. The premium saved upon them all may more than compensate such losses as they are likely to meet within the common course of chances. The neglect of insurance upon shipping, however, in the same manner as upon houses, is, in most cases, the effect of no such nice calculation, but of mere thoughtless rashness and presumptuous contempt of the risk. The contempt of risk and the presumptuous hope of success are, in no period of life, more active than at the age at which young people choose their professions. How little the fear of misfortune is then capable of balancing the hope of good luck appears still more evidently in the readiness of the common people to enlist as soldiers or to go to sea than in the eagerness of those of better fashion to enter into what are called the liberal professions. What a common soldier may lose is obvious enough. 
without regarding the danger however young volunteers never enlist so readily as at the beginning of a new war and though they have scarce any chance of preferment they figure to themselves in their youthful fancies a thousand occasions of acquiring honour and distinction which never occur these romantic hopes make the whole price of their blood their pay is less than that of common labourers and in actual service their fatigues are much greater End of Book 1, Chapter 10, Part 1Part 2 of Chapter 10 of Book 1 of The Wealth of Nations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Part 2 of Chapter 10 of Book 1 of Wages and Profit in the Different Employments of Labor and Stock. The lottery of the sea is not altogether so disadvantageous as that of the army. The son of a creditable laborer or artificer may frequently go to sea with his father's consent. But if he enlists as a soldier, it is always without it. Other people see some chance of his making something by the one trade. Nobody but himself sees any of his making anything by the other. The great admiral is less the object of public admiration than the great general, and the highest success in the sea service promises a less brilliant fortune and reputation than equal success in the land. The same difference runs through all the inferior ranks of preferment in both. By the rules of precedency, a captain in the navy ranks with a colonel in the army, but he does not rank with him in the common estimation. As the great prizes in the lottery are less, the smaller ones must be more numerous. Common sailors, therefore, more frequently get some fortune and preferment than common soldiers, and the hope of those prizes is what principally recommends the trade. Though their skill and dexterity are much superior to that of almost any artificer, and though their whole life is one continual scene of hardship and danger, yet for all this dexterity and skill, for all those hardships and dangers, while they remain in the condition of common sailors, they receive scarce any other recompense but the pleasure of exercising the one and of surmounting the other. Their wages are not greater than those of common laborers at the port which regulates the rate of seamen's wages. As they are continually going from port to port, the monthly pay of those who sail from all the different ports of Great Britain is more nearly upon a level than that of any other workman in those different places, and the rate of the port to and from which the greatest number sail, that is, the port of London, regulates that of all the rest. At London, the wages of the greater part of the different classes of workmen are about double those of the same classes in Edinburgh but the sailors who sail from the port of london seldom earn above three or four shillings a month more than those who sail from the port of leith and the difference is frequently not so great in time of peace and in the merchant service the london price is from a guinea to about seven and twenty shillings the calendar month a common labourer in london at the rate of nine or ten shillings a week may earn in the calendar month from forty to five and forty shillings the sailor indeed over and above his pay is supplied with provisions their value, however, may not perhaps always exceed the difference between his pay and that of the common labourer, and though it sometimes should, the excess will not be clear gain to the sailor, because he cannot share it with his wife and family, whom he must maintain out of his wages at home. The dangers and hairbreadth escapes of a life of adventures, instead of disheartening young people, seem frequently to recommend a trade to them. A tender mother, among the inferior ranks of people, is often afraid to send her son to school at a seaport town, lest the sight of ships and the conversation and adventures of the sailors should entice him to go to sea. The distant prospect of hazards, from which we can hope to extricate ourselves by courage and address, is not disagreeable to us, and does not raise the wages of labor in any employment. It is otherwise with those in which courage and address can be of no avail. In trades which are known to be very unwholesome, the wages of labor are always remarkably high. Unwholesomeness is a species of disagreeableness, and its effects upon the wages of labor are to be ranked under that general head. In all the different employments of stock, the ordinary rate of profit varies more or less with the certainty or uncertainty of the returns. These are, in general, less uncertain in the inland than in the foreign trade, and in some branches of foreign trade than in others in the trade to North America, for example, than in that to Jamaica. The ordinary rate of profit always rises more or less with the risk. It does not, however, seem to rise in proportion to it, or so as to compensate it quickly. Bankruptcies are most frequent in the most hazardous trades. 
the most hazardous of all trades that of a smuggler though when the adventure succeeds it is likewise the most profitable is the infallible road to bankruptcy the presumptuous hope of success seems to act here as upon all other occasions and to entice so many adventurers into those hazardous trades that their competition reduces the profit below what is sufficient to compensate the risk to compensate it completely, the common returns ought, over and above the ordinary profits of stock, not only to make up for all occasional losses, but to afford a surplus profit to the adventures of the same nature with the profit of insurers. But if the common returns were sufficient for all this, bankruptcies would not be more frequent in these than in other trades. Of the five circumstances, therefore, which vary the wages of labor, two only affect the profits of stock the agreeableness or disagreeableness of the business, and the risk or security with which it is attended. In point of agreeableness or disagreeableness, there is little or no difference in the far greater part of the different employments of stock, but a great deal in those of labor, and in the ordinary profit of stock, though it rises with the risk, does not always seem to rise in proportion to it. It should follow from all this that, in the same society or neighborhood, the average and ordinary rates of profit in the different employments of stock should be more nearly upon a level than the pecuniary wages of the different sorts of labor. They are so accordingly. The difference between the earnings of a common laborer and those of a well-employed lawyer or physician is evidently much greater than that between the ordinary profits in any two different branches of trade. The apparent difference, besides, in the profits of different trades, is generally a deception arising from our not always distinguishing what ought to be considered as wages, from what ought to be considered as profit. Apothecary's profit is become a byword, denoting something uncommonly extravagant. This great apparent profit, however, is frequently no more than the reasonable wages of labor. The skill of an apothecary is a much nicer and more delicate matter than that of any artificer whatever, and the trust which is reposed in him is of much greater importance. He is the physician of the poor in all cases, and of the rich when the distress or danger is not very great. His reward, therefore, ought to be suitable to his skill and his trust, and it arises generally from the price at which he sells his drugs. But the whole drugs which the best employed apothecary in a large market town will sell in a year may not perhaps cost him above thirty or forty pounds. Though he should sell them, therefore, for three or four hundred, or at a thousand percent profit, this may frequently be no more than the reasonable wages of his labor, charged, in the only way in which he can charge them, upon the price of his drugs. The greater part of the apparent profit is real wages disguised in the garb of profit. In a small seaport town, a little grocer will make forty or fifty per cent upon a stock of a single hundred pounds, while a considerable wholesale merchant in the same place will scarce make eight or ten per cent upon a stock of ten thousand. The trade of the grocer may be necessary for the conveniency of the inhabitants, and the narrowness of the market may not admit the employment of a larger capital in the business. The man, however, must not only live by his trade, but live by it suitably to the qualifications which it requires. Besides possessing a little capital, he must be able to read, write, and account, and must be a tolerable judge, too, of perhaps fifty or sixty different sorts of goods, their prices, qualities, and the markets where they are to be had cheapest. He must have all the knowledge, in short, that is necessary for a great merchant, which nothing hinders him from becoming but the want of a sufficient capital. Thirty or forty pounds a year cannot be considered as too great a recompense for the labor of a person so accomplished deduct this from the seemingly great profits of his capital and little more will remain perhaps than the ordinary profits of stock the greater part of the apparent profit is in this case too real wages the difference between the apparent profit of the retail and that of the wholesale trade is much less in the capital than in small towns and country villages where ten thousand pounds can be employed in the grocery trade the wages of the grocer's labor must be a very trifling addition to the real profits of so great a stock the apparent profits of the wealthy retailer, therefore, are there more nearly upon a level with those of the wholesale merchant. It is upon this account that goods sold by retail are generally as cheap, and frequently much cheaper, in the capital than in small towns and country villages. Grocery goods, for example, are generally much cheaper. Bread and butcher's meat frequently as cheap. It costs no more to bring grocery goods to the great town than to the country village, but it costs a great deal more to bring corn and cattle, as the greater part of them must be brought from a much greater distance. The prime cost of grocery goods, therefore, being the same in both places, they are cheapest where the least profit is charged upon them. The prime cost of bread and butcher's meat is greater in the great town than in the country village, and though the profit is less, therefore they are not always cheaper there, but often equally cheap. 
in such articles as bread and butcher's meat, the same cause which diminishes apparent profit increases prime cost. The extent of the market by giving employment to greater stocks diminishes apparent profit, but by requiring supplies from a greater distance it increases prime cost. This diminution of the one and increase of the other seem in most cases nearly to counterbalance one another, which is probably the reason that, though the prices of corn and capital are commonly very different in different parts of the kingdom, those of bread and butcher's meat are generally very nearly the same through the greater part of it. Though the profits of stock, both in the wholesale and retail trade, are generally less in the capital than in small towns and country villages, yet great fortunes are frequently acquired from small beginnings in the former, and scarce ever in the latter. In small towns and country villages, on account of the narrowness of the market, trade cannot always be extended as stock extends. In such places, therefore, though the rate of a particular person's profits may be very high, the sum or amount of them can never be very great, nor consequently that of his annual accumulation. In great towns, on the contrary, trade can be extended as stock increases, and the credit of a frugal and thriving man increases much faster than his stock. His trade is extended in proportion to the amount of both, and the sum or amount of his profits is in proportion to the extent of his trade, and his annual accumulation in proportion to the amount of his profits. It seldom happens, however, that great fortunes are made, even in great towns, by any one regular, established, and well-known branch of business, but in consequence of a long life of industry, frugality, and attention. Sudden fortunes, indeed, are sometimes made in such places by what is called the trade of speculation, the speculative merchant exercises no one regular, established, or well-known branch of business. He is a corn merchant this year, and a wine merchant the next, and a sugar, tobacco, or tea merchant the year after. He enters into every trade when he foresees that it is likely to lie more than commonly profitable, and he quits it when he foresees that its profits are likely to return to the level of other trades. His profits and losses, therefore, can bear no regular proportion to those of any one established and well-known branch of business. A bold adventurer may sometimes acquire a considerable fortune by two or three successful speculations, but is just as likely to lose one by two or three unsuccessful ones. This trade can be carried on nowhere but in great towns. It is only in places of the most extensive commerce and correspondence that the intelligence requisite for it can be had. The five circumstances above mentioned, though they occasion considerable inequalities in the wages of labor and profits of stock, occasion none in the whole of the advantages and disadvantages, real or imaginary, of the different employments of either. The nature of those circumstances is such that they make up for a small pecuniary gain in some, and counterbalance a great one in others. In order, however, that this equality may take place in the whole of their advantages or disadvantages, three things are requisite, even where there is the most perfect freedom. First, the employments must be well known and long established in the neighborhood. Secondly, they must be in their ordinary, or what may be called their natural state. And thirdly, they must be the sole or principal employments of those who occupy them. First, this equality can take place only in those employments which are well known and have been long established in the neighborhood. Where all other circumstances are equal, wages are generally higher in new than in old trades. When a projector attempts to establish a new manufacture, he must at first entice his workmen from other employments, by higher wages than they can either earn in their own trades, or than the nature of his work would otherwise require, and a considerable time must pass away before he can venture to reduce them to the common level. Manufactures for which the demand arises altogether from fashion and fancy are continually changing, and seldom last long enough to be considered as old established manufactures. Those, on the contrary, for which the demand arises chiefly from use or necessity, are less liable to change, and the same form or fabric may continue in demand for whole centuries together. The wages of labor, therefore, are likely to be higher in manufactures of the form than in those of the latter kind. Birmingham deals chiefly in manufactures of the former kind, Sheffield in those of the latter, and the wages of labor in those two different places are said to be suitable to this difference in the nature of their manufactures. The establishment of any new manufacture, of any new branch of commerce, or of any new practice in agriculture is always a speculation from which the projector promises himself extraordinary profits. These profits sometimes are very great, and sometimes more frequently, perhaps, they are quite otherwise. But, in general, they bear no regular proportion to those of other old trades in the neighborhood. If the project succeeds, they are commonly at first very high. When the trade or practice becomes thoroughly established and well known, the competition reduces them to the level of other trades. 
Secondly, this equality in the whole of the advantages and disadvantages of the different employments of labour and stock can take place only in the ordinary, or what may be called the natural state of those employments. The demand for almost every different species of labour is sometimes greater, and sometimes less than usual. In the one case, the advantages of the employment rise above, in the other they fall below the common level. The demand for country labour is greater at hay time and harvest than during the greater part of the year, and wages rise with the demand. In time of war, when forty or fifty thousand sailors are forced from the merchant service into that of the king, the demand for sailors to merchant ships necessarily rises with their scarcity and their wages, upon such occasions, commonly rise from a guinea and seven and twenty shillings to forty shillings and three pounds a month. In a decaying manufacture, on the contrary, many workmen, rather than quit their own trade, are contented with smaller wages than would otherwise be suitable to the nature of their employment. The profits of stock vary with the price of the commodities in which it is employed. As the price of any commodity rises above the ordinary or average rate, the profits of at least some part of the stock that is employed in bringing it to market rise above their proper level, and as it falls they sink below it. All commodities are more or less liable to variations of price, but some are much more so than others. In all commodities which are produced by human industry, the quantity of industry annually employed is necessarily regulated by the annual demand, in such a manner that the average annual produce may, as nearly as possible, be equal to the average annual consumption. In some employments, it has already been observed, the same quantity of industry will always produce the same, or very nearly the same quantity of commodities. In the linen or woolen manufactures, for example, the same number of hands will annually work up very nearly the same quantity of linen and woolen cloth. The variations in the market price of such commodities, therefore, can arise only from some accidental variation in the demand. A public mourning raises the price of black cloth, but as the demand for most sorts of plain linen and woolen cloth is pretty uniform, so is likewise the price. But there are other employments in which the same quantity of industry will not always produce the same quantity of commodities. The same quantity of industry, for example, will, in different years, produce very different quantities of corn, wine, hops, sugar, tobacco, etc. The price of such commodities, therefore, varies not only with the variations of demand, but with the much greater and more frequent variations of quantity, and is consequently extremely fluctuating but the profit of some of the dealers must necessarily fluctuate with the price of the commodities. The operations of the speculative merchant are principally employed about such commodities. He endeavors to buy them up when he foresees that their price is likely to rise, and to sell them when it is likely to fall. Thirdly, this equality in the whole of the advantages and disadvantages of the different employments of labor and stock can take place only in such as are the sole or principal employments of those who occupy them. When a person derives his subsistence from one employment which does not occupy the greater part of his time, in the intervals of his leisure he is often willing to work at another for less wages than would otherwise suit the nature of the employment. There still subsists in many parts of Scotland a set of people called cotters, or cottagers, though they were more frequent some years ago than they are now. They are a sort of out-servants of the landlords and farmers. The usual reward which they receive from their master is a house, a small garden for pot herbs, as much grass as will feed a cow, and perhaps an acre or two of bad arable land. When their master has occasion for their labor, he gives them, besides, two pecks of oatmeal a week, worth about sixteen pence sterling. During a great part of the year he has little or no occasion for their labor, and the cultivation of their own little possession is not sufficient to occupy the time which is left at their own disposal. When such occupiers were more numerous than they are at present, they are said to have been willing to give their spare time for a very small recompense to anybody, and to have wrought for less wages than other laborers. In ancient times they seem to have been common all over Europe. In countries ill-cultivated and worse inhabited, the greater part of landlords and farmers could not otherwise provide themselves with the extraordinary number of hands which country labor requires at certain seasons. The daily or weekly recompense which such laborers occasionally received from their masters was evidently not the whole price of their labor. Their small tenement made a considerable part of it. This daily or weekly recompense, however, seems to have been considered as the whole of it by many writers who have collected the prices of labor and provisions in ancient times, and who have taken pleasure in representing both as wonderfully low. The produce of such labor comes frequently cheaper to market than would otherwise be suitable to its nature. Stockings in many parts of Scotland are knit much cheaper than they can anywhere be wrought upon the loom. 
They are the work of servants and laborers who derive the principal part of their subsistence from other employment. More than a thousand pair of Shetland stockings are annually imported into Leith, of which the price is from five pence to seven pence a pair. At Lerwick, the small capital of the Shetland Islands, ten pence a day, I have been assured, is a common price of common labor. In the same islands they knit worsted stockings to the value of a guinea a pair and upwards. The spinning of linen yarn is carried on in Scotland nearly in the same way as the knitting of stockings by servants who are chiefly hired for other purposes. They earn but a very scanty subsistence, who endeavour to get their livelihood by either of those trades. In most parts of Scotland she is a good spinner who can earn twenty pence a week. In opulent countries the market is generally so extensive that any one trade is sufficient to employ the whole labour and stock of those who occupy it. Instances of people living by one employment, and at the same time deriving some little advantage from another, occur chiefly in poor countries. The following instance, however, of something of the same kind, is to be found in the capital of a very rich one. There is no city in Europe, I believe, in which house rent is dearer than in London, and yet I know no capital in which a furnished apartment can be hired so cheap. Lodging is not only much cheaper in London than in Paris, it is much cheaper than in Edinburgh, of the same degree of goodness, and what may seem extraordinary, the dearness of house rent is the cause of the cheapness of lodging. The dearness of house rent in London arises not only from those causes which render it dear in all great capitals, the dearness of labour, the dearness of all the materials of building, which must be generally brought from a great distance, and above all the dearness of ground rent, every landlord acting the part of a monopolist, and frequently exacting a higher rent for a single acre of bad land in a town, than can be had for a hundred of the best in the country but it arises in part from the peculiar manners and customs of the people which oblige every master of a family to hire a whole house from top to bottom a dwelling-house in england means everything that is contained under the same roof in france scotland and many other parts of europe it frequently means no more than a single story a tradesman in london is obliged to hire a whole house in that part of the town where his customers live his shop is upon the ground floor and he and his family sleep in the garret and he endeavours to pay a part of his house rent by letting the two middle stories to lodgers. He expects to maintain his family by his trade, and not by his lodgers. Whereas, at Paris and Edinburgh, people who let lodgings have commonly no other means of subsistence, and the price of the lodging must pay not only the rent of the house, but the whole expense of the family. End of Book 1, Chapter 10, Part 2《Part Three of Chapter Ten of Book One of the Wealth of Nations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Part Three of Chapter Ten of Book One of Wages and Profit in the Different Employments of Labor and Stock. Part Two. Inequalities Occasioned by the Policy of Europe Such are the inequalities in the whole of the advantages and disadvantages of the different employments of labor and stock, which the defect of any of the three requisites above mentioned must occasion, even where there is the most perfect liberty. But the policy of Europe, by not leaving things at perfect liberty, occasions other inequalities of much greater importance. It does this chiefly in the three following ways first by restraining the competition in some employments to a smaller number than would otherwise be disposed to enter into them secondly by increasing it in others beyond what it naturally would be and thirdly by obstructing the free circulation of labor and stock both from employment to employment and from place to place first the policy of europe occasions a very important inequality in the whole of the advantages and disadvantages of the different employments of labor and stock by restraining the competition in some employments to a smaller number than might otherwise be disposed to enter into them the exclusive privileges of corporations are the principal means it makes use of for this purpose the exclusive privilege of an incorporated trade necessarily restrains the competition in the town where it is established to those who are free of the trade to have served an apprenticeship in the town under a master properly qualified is commonly the necessary requisite for obtaining this freedom the by-laws of the corporation regulate sometimes the number of apprentices which any master is allowed to have and almost always the number of years which each apprentice is obliged to serve 
The intention of both regulations is to restrain the competition to a much smaller number than might otherwise be disposed to enter into the trade. The limitation of the number of apprentices restrains it directly. A long term of apprenticeship restrains it more indirectly, but as effectually by increasing the expense of education. In Sheffield, no master cutler can have more than one apprentice at a time, by a by-law of the corporation. In Norfolk and Norwich, no master weaver can have more than two apprentices, under pain of forfeiting five pounds a month to the king. No master hatter can have more than two apprentices anywhere in England, or in the English plantations, under pain of forfeiting five pounds a month, half to the king, and half to him who shall sue in any court of record. Both these regulations, though they have been confirmed by a public law of the kingdom, are evidently dictated by the same corporation spirit which enacted the by-law of Sheffield. The silk weavers in London had scarce been incorporated a year when they enacted a by-law restraining any master from having more than two apprentices at a time. It required a particular act of Parliament to rescind this by-law. Seven years seem anciently to have been all over Europe the usual term established for the duration of apprenticeships in the greater part of incorporated trades. All such incorporations were anciently called universities, which, indeed, is the proper Latin name for any incorporation whatever. The University of Smiths, the University of Tailors, etc., are expressions which we commonly meet with in the old charters of ancient towns. When those particular incorporations, which are now peculiarly called universities, were first established, the term of years which it was necessary to study, in order to obtain the degree of Master of Arts, appears evidently to have been copied from the term of apprenticeship in common trades, of which the incorporations were much more ancient. As to have wrought seven years under a master properly qualified, was necessary in order to entitle my person to become a master, and to have himself apprentices in a common trade. So to have studied seven years under a master properly qualified was necessary to entitle him to become a master, teacher, or doctor, words anciently synonymous, in the liberal arts, and to have scholars or apprentices, words likewise originally synonymous, to study under him. By the fifth of Elizabeth, commonly called the statute of apprenticeship, it was enacted that no person should, for the future, exercise any trade, craft, or mystery at that time exercised in England, unless he had previously served to it an apprenticeship of seven years at least, and what before had been the by-law of many particular corporations, became in England the general and public law of all trades carried on in market towns. For though the words of the statute are very general, and seem plainly to include the whole kingdom, by interpretation its operation has been limited to market towns. It having been held that, in country villages, a person may exercise several different trades, though he has not served a seven years' apprenticeship to each, they being necessary for the conveniency of the inhabitants, and the number of people frequently not being sufficient to supply each with a particular set of hands. By a strict interpretation of the words, too, the operation of this statute has been limited to those trades which were established in England before the fifth of Elizabeth, and has never been extended to such as have been introduced since that time. This limitation has given occasion to several distinctions, which, considered as rules of police, appear as foolish as can well be imagined. It has been adjudged, for example, that a coachmaker can neither himself make nor employ journeymen to make his coach wheels, but must buy them of a master wheelwright, this latter trade having been exercised in England before the fifth of Elizabeth. But a wheelwright, though he has never served an apprenticeship to a coachmaker, may either himself make or employ journeymen to make coaches, the trade of a coachmaker not being within the statute, because not exercised in England at the time when it was made. The manufacturers of Manchester, Birmingham, and Wolverhampton are many of them upon this account not within the statute, not having been exercised in England before the fifth of Elizabeth. In France, the duration of apprenticeships is different in different towns, and in different trades. In Paris, five years is the term required in a great number, but before any person can be qualified to exercise the trade as a master, he must, in many of them, serve five years more as a journeyman. During this latter term he is called the companion of his master, and the term itself is called his companionship. In Scotland there is no general law which regulates universally the duration of apprenticeships. The term is different in different corporations. Where it is long, a part of it may generally be redeemed by paying a small fine. In most towns, too, a very small fine is sufficient to purchase the freedom of any corporation. 
the weavers of linen and hempen cloth the principal manufacturers of the country as well as all other artificers subservient to them wheel-makers reel-makers etc may exercise their trades in any town corporate without paying any fine in all towns corporate all persons are free to sell butcher's meat upon any lawful day of the week three years is in scotland a common term of apprenticeship even in some very nice trades and in general i know of no country in europe in which corporation laws are so little oppressive the property which every man has in his own labour as it is the original foundation of all other property so it is the most sacred and inviolable the patrimony of a poor man lies in the strength and dexterity of his hands and to hinder him from employing this strength and dexterity in what manner he thinks proper without injury to his neighbour is a plain violation of this most sacred property it is a manifest encroachment upon the just liberty both of the workmen and of those who might be disposed to employ him as it hinders the one from working at what he thinks proper so it hinders the others from employing whom they think proper to judge whether he is fit to be employed may surely be trusted to the discretion of the employers whose interest it so much concerns the affected anxiety of the lawgiver lest they should employ an improper person is evidently as impertinent as it is oppressive the institution of long apprenticeships can give no security that insufficient workmanship shall not frequently be exposed to public sale when this is done it is generally the effect of fraud and not of inability and the longest apprenticeship can give no security against fraud quite different regulations are necessary to prevent this abuse the sterling mark upon plate and the stamps upon linen and woollen cloth give the purchaser much greater security than any statute of apprenticeship he generally looks at these but never thinks it worth while to inquire whether the workman had served a seven years apprenticeship the institution of long apprenticeships has no tendency to form young people to industry a journeyman who works by the piece is likely to be industrious because he derives a benefit from every exertion of his industry an apprentice is likely to be idle and almost always is so because he has no immediate interest to be otherwise in the inferior employments the sweets of labor consist altogether in the recompense of labor they who are soonest in a condition to enjoy the sweets of it are likely soonest to conceive a relish for it and to acquire the early habit of industry a young man naturally conceives an aversion to labor when for a long time he receives no benefit from it the boys who are put out apprentices from public charities are generally bound for more than the usual number of years and they generally turn out very idle and worthless apprenticeships were altogether unknown to the ancients the reciprocal duties of master and apprentice make a considerable article in every modern code the roman law is perfectly silent with regard to them i know no greek or latin word i might venture i believe to assert that there is none which expresses the idea we now annex to the word apprentice a servant bound to work at a particular trade for the benefit of a master during a term of years upon condition that the master shall teach him that trade long apprenticeships are altogether unnecessary the arts which are much superior to common trades such as those of making clocks and watches contain no such mystery as to require a long course of instruction the first invention of such beautiful machines indeed and even that of some of the instruments employed in making them must no doubt have been the work of deep thought and a long time and may justly be considered as among the happiest efforts of human ingenuity but when both have been fairly invented and are well understood to explain to any young man in the completest manner how to apply the instruments and how to construct the machines cannot well require more than the lessons of a few weeks perhaps those of a few days might be sufficient in the common mechanic trades those of a few days might certainly be sufficient the dexterity of hand indeed even in common trades cannot be acquired without much practice and experience but a young man would practice with much more diligence and attention if from the beginning he wrought as a journeyman being paid in proportion to the little work which he could execute and paying in his turn for the materials which he might sometimes spoil through awkwardness and inexperience his education would generally in this way be more effectual and always less tedious and expensive the master indeed would be a loser he would lose all the wages of the apprentice which he now saves for seven years together in the end perhaps the apprentice himself would be a loser in a trade so easily learnt he would have more competitors and his wages when he came to be a complete workman would be much less than at present the same increase of competition would reduce the profits of the masters as well as the wages of workmen the trades the crafts the mysteries would all be losers but the public would be a gainer the work of all artificers coming in this way much cheaper to market 
It is to prevent this reduction of price, and consequently of wages and profit, by restraining that free competition which would most certainly occasion it, that all corporations, and the greater part of corporation laws, have been established. In order to erect a corporation, no other authority in ancient times was requisite, in many parts of Europe, but that of the town corporate in which it was established. In England, indeed, a charter from the king was likewise necessary. But this prerogative of the crown seems to have been reserved rather for extorting money from the subject than for the defense of the common liberty against such oppressive monopolies. Upon paying a fine to the king, the charter seems generally to have been readily granted, and when any particular class of artificers or traders thought proper to act as a corporation without a charter, such adultering guilds, as they were called, were not always disfranchised upon that account, but obliged to fine annually to the king for permission to exercise their usurped privileges. The immediate inspection of all corporations and of the bylaws which they might think proper to enact for their own government belonged to the town corporate in which they were established, and whatever discipline was exercised over them proceeded commonly not from the king, but from that greater incorporation of which those subordinate ones were only parts or members. The government of towns corporate was altogether in the hands of traders and artificers, and it was the manifest interest of every particular class of them to prevent the market from being overstocked, as they commonly express it, with their own particular species of industries, which is in reality to keep it always understocked. Each class was eager to establish regulations proper for this purpose, and, provided it was allowed to do so, was willing to consent that every other class should do the same. In consequence of such regulations, indeed, each class was obliged to buy the goods they had occasion for from every other within the town, somewhat dearer than they otherwise might have done. But, in recompense, they were enabled to sell their own just as much dearer, so that, so far it was as broad as long, as they say, and in the dealings of the different classes within the town with one another, none of them were losers by these regulations but in their dealings with the country they were all great gainers, and in these latter dealings consists the whole trade which supports and enriches every town. Every town draws its whole subsistence and all the materials of its industry from the country. It pays for these chiefly in two ways. First, by sending back to the country a part of those materials wrought up and manufactured, in which case their price is augmented by the wages of the workmen and the profits of their masters or immediate employers. Secondly, by sending to it a part both of the rude and manufactured produce, either of other countries or of distant parts of the same country, imported into the town, in which case, too, the original price of those goods is augmented by the wages of the carriers or sailors, and by the profits of the merchants who employ them. In what is gained upon the first of those branches of commerce consists the advantage which the town makes by its manufactures, in what is gained upon the second the advantage of its inland and foreign trade the wages of the workmen and the profits of their different employers make up the whole of what is gained upon both whatever regulations therefore tend to increase those wages and profits beyond what they otherwise would be tend to enable the town to purchase with a smaller quantity of its labour the produce of a greater quantity of the labour of the country they give the traders and artificers in the town an advantage over the landlords, farmers, and laborers in the country, and break down that natural equality which would otherwise take place in the commerce which is carried on between them. The whole annual produce of the labor of the society is annually divided between those two different sets of people. By means of those regulations, a greater share of it is given to the inhabitants of the town than would otherwise fall to them, and a less to those of the country. The price which the town really pays for the provisions and materials annually imported into it is the quantity of manufactures and other goods annually exported from it. The dearer the latter are sold, the cheaper the former are bought. The industry of the town becomes more, and that of the country less, advantageous. That the industry which is carried on in towns is, everywhere in Europe, more advantageous than that which is carried on in the country, without entering into any very nice computations, we may satisfy ourselves by one very simple and obvious observation. In every country of Europe we find at least a hundred people who have acquired great fortunes from small beginnings, by trade and manufactures, the industry which properly belongs to towns, for one who has done so by that which properly belongs to the country, the raising of rude produce by the improvement and cultivation of land. Industry, therefore, must be better rewarded, the wages of labor and the profits of stock must evidently be greater, in the one situation, than in the other. But stock and labor naturally seek the most advantageous employment. They naturally, therefore, resort as much as they can to the town and desert the country. End of Book 1, Chapter 10, Part 3
Part four of Chapter ten of Book one of the Wealth of Nations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Part four of Chapter ten of Book one of wages and profit in the different employments of labor and stock the inhabitants of a town being collected into one place can easily combine together the most insignificant trades carried on in towns have accordingly in some place or other been incorporated and even where they have never been incorporated yet the corporation spirit the jealousy of strangers the aversion to take apprentices or to communicate the secret of their trade generally prevail in them and often teach them by voluntary associations and agreements to prevent that free competition which they cannot prohibit by by-laws the trades which employ but a small number of hands run most easily into such combinations half a dozen wool combers perhaps are necessary to keep a thousand spinners and weavers at work by combining not to take apprentices they can not only engross the employment but reduce the whole manufacture into a sort of slavery to themselves and raise the price of their labour much above what is due to the nature of their work the inhabitants of the country dispersed in distant places cannot easily combine together they have not only never been incorporated but the incorporation spirit never has prevailed among them no apprenticeship has ever been thought necessary to qualify for husbandry the great trade of the country after what are called the fine arts and the liberal professions however there is perhaps no trade which requires so great a variety of knowledge and experience the innumerable volumes which have been written upon it in all languages may satisfy us that among the wisest and most learned nations it has never been regarded as a matter very easily understood and from all those volumes we shall in vain attempt to collect that knowledge of its various and complicated operations which is commonly possessed even by the common farmer how contemptuously soever the very contemptible authors of some of them may sometimes affect to speak of him there is scarce any common mechanic trade on the contrary of which all the operations may not be as completely and distinctly explained in a pamphlet of a very few pages as it is possible for words illustrated by figures to explain them in the history of the arts now publishing by the french academy of sciences several of them are actually explained in this manner the direction of operations besides which must be varied with every change of the weather as well as with many other accidents requires much more judgment and discretion than that of those which are always the same or very nearly the same not only the art of the farmer the general direction of the operations of husbandry but many inferior branches of country labour require much more skill and experience than the greater part of mechanic trades the man who works upon brass and iron works with instruments and upon materials of which the temper is always the same or very nearly the same but the man who ploughs the ground with a team of horses or oxen works with instruments of which the health strength and temper are very different upon different occasions the condition of the materials which he works upon too is as variable as that of the instruments which he works with and both require to be managed with much judgment and discretion the common ploughman though generally regarded as the pattern of stupidity and ignorance is seldom defective in this judgment and discretion he is less accustomed indeed to social intercourse than the mechanic who lives in a town his voice and language are more uncouth and more difficult to be understood by those who are not used to them his understanding however being accustomed to consider a great variety of objects is generally much superior to that of the other whose whole attention from morning till night is commonly occupied in performing one or two very simple operations how much the lower ranks of people in the country are really superior to those of the town is well known to every man whom either business or curiosity has led to converse much with both in china and indostan accordingly both the rank and the wages of the common labourers are said to be superior to those of the greater part of artificers and manufacturers they would probably be so everywhere if corporation laws and the corporation spirit did not prevent it the superiority which the industry of the towns has everywhere in europe over that of the country is not altogether owing to corporations and corporation laws it is supported by many other regulations the high duties upon foreign manufactures and upon all goods imported by alien merchants all tend to the same purpose corporation laws enable the inhabitants of town to raise their prices without fearing to be undersold by the free competition of their own countrymen those other regulations secure them equally against that of foreigners 
The enhancement of price occasioned by both is everywhere finally paid by the landlords, farmers, and labourers of the country who have seldom opposed the establishment of such monopolies. They have commonly neither inclination nor fitness to enter into combinations, and the clamour and sophistry of merchants and manufacturers easily persuade them that the private interest of a part and of a subordinate part of the society is the general interest of the whole. In Great Britain, the superiority of the industry of the towns over that of the country seems to have been greater formerly than in the present times. The wages of country labour approach nearer to those of manufacturing labour, and the profits of stock employed in agriculture to those of trading and manufacturing stock, than they are said to have none in the last century or in the beginning of the present. This change may be regarded as the necessary, though very late, consequence of the extraordinary encouragement given to the industry of the towns. The stocks accumulated in them come in time to be so great that it can no longer be employed with the ancient profit in that species of industry which is peculiar to them. That industry has its limits like every other, and the increase of stock, by increasing the competition, necessarily reduces the profit. The lowering of profit in the town forces out stock to the country where, by creating a new demand for country labor, it necessarily raises its wages. It then spreads itself, if I may say so, over the face of the land, and, by being employed in agriculture, is in part restored to the country, at the expense of which, in a great measure, it had originally been accumulated in the town that everywhere in europe the greatest improvements of the country have been owing to such overflowings of the stock originally accumulated in the towns i shall endeavour to show hereafter and at the same time to demonstrate that though some countries have by this course attained to a considerable degree of opulence it is in itself necessarily slow uncertain liable to be disturbed and interrupted by innumerable accidents and in every respect contrary to the order of nature and of reason the interests, prejudices, laws, and customs which have given occasion to it, I shall endeavour to explain as fully and distinctly as I can in the third and fourth books of this inquiry. People of the same trade seldom meet together, even for merriment and diversion, but the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public or in some contrivance to raise prices. It is impossible, indeed, to prevent such meetings by any law which either could be executed or would be consistent with liberty and justice. But though the law cannot hinder people of the same trade from sometimes assembling together, it ought to do nothing to facilitate such assemblies, much less to render them necessary. A regulation which obliges all those of the same trade in a particular town to enter their names and places of abode in a public register facilitates such assemblies. It connects individuals who might never otherwise be known to one another, and gives every man of the trade a direction where to find every other man of it. A regulation which enables those of the same trade to tax themselves, in order to provide for their poor, their sick, their widows and orphans, by giving them a common interest to manage, renders such assemblies necessary. An incorporation not only renders them necessary, but makes the act of the majority binding upon the whole. In a free trade, an effectual combination cannot be established but by the unanimous consent of every single trader, and it cannot last longer than every single trader continues of the same mind. The majority of a corporation can enact a by-law with proper penalties which will limit the competition more effectually and more durably than any voluntary combination whatever. The pretense that corporations are necessary for the better government of the trade is without any foundation. The real and effectual discipline which is exercised over a workman is not that of his corporation but that of his customers. It is the fear of losing their employment which restrains his frauds and corrects his negligence. An exclusive corporation necessarily weakens the force of this discipline. A particular set of workmen must then be employed, let them behave well or ill. It is upon this account that, in many large incorporated towns, no tolerable workmen are to be found, even in some of the most necessary trades. If you would have your work tolerably executed, it must be done in the suburbs, where the workmen, having no exclusive privilege, have nothing but their character to depend upon, and you must then smuggle it into the town as well as you can. It is in this manner that the policy of Europe, by restraining the competition in some employments to a smaller number than would otherwise be disposed to enter into them, occasions a very important inequality in the whole of the advantages and disadvantages of the different employments of labour and stock. Secondly, the policy of Europe, by increasing the competition in some employments beyond what it naturally would be, occasions another equality of an opposite kind in the whole of the advantages and disadvantages of the different employments of labour and stock. 
it has been considered as of so much importance that a proper number of young people should be educated for certain professions that sometimes the public and sometimes the piety of private founders have established many pensions scholarships exhibitions bursaries etc for this purpose which draw many more people into those trades than could otherwise pretend to follow them in all christian countries i believe the education of the greater part of churchmen is paid for in this manner very few of them are educated altogether at their own expense the long tedious and expensive education therefore of those who are will not always procure them a suitable reward the church being crowded with people who in order to get employment are willing to accept of a much smaller recompense than what such an education would otherwise have entitled them to and in this manner the competition of the poor takes away the reward of the rich it would be indecent no doubt to compare either a curate or a chaplain with a journeyman in any common trade the pay of a curate or chaplain however may very properly be considered as of the same nature with the wages of a journeyman they are all three paid for their work according to the contract which they may happen to make with their respective superiors till after the middle of the fourteenth century five mercs containing about as much silver as ten pounds of our present money was in england the usual pay of a curate or a stipendary parish priest as we find it regulated by the decrees of several different national councils at the same period four pence a day containing the same quantity of silver as a shilling of our present money was declared to be the pay of a master mason and three pence a day equal to nine pence of our present money that of a journeyman mason the wages of both these labourers therefore supposing them to have been constantly employed were much superior to those of the curate the wages of the master mason supposing him to have been without employment one-third of the year would have fully equalled them by the twelfth of queen anne c twelve it is declared that whereas for want of sufficient maintenance and encouragement to curates the cures have in several places been meanly supplied the bishop is therefore empowered to appoint by writing under his hand and seal a sufficient certain stipend or allowance not exceeding fifty and not less than twenty pounds a year forty pounds a year is reckoned at present very good pay for a curate and notwithstanding this act of parliament there are many curacies under twenty pounds a year there are journeymen shoemakers in london who earn forty pounds a year and there is scarce an industrious workman of any kind in that metropolis who does not earn more than twenty this last sum indeed does not exceed what is frequently earned by common labourers in many country parishes whenever the law has attempted to regulate the wages of workmen it has always been rather to lower them than to raise them but the law has upon many occasions attempted to raise the wages of curates and for the dignity of the church to oblige the rectors of parishes to give them more than the wretched maintenance which they themselves might be willing to accept of it and in both cases the law seems to have been equally ineffectual and has never either been able to raise the wages of curates or to sink those of labourers to the degree that was intended because it has never been able to hinder either the one from being willing to accept of less than the legal allowance on account of the indigence of their situation and the multitude of their competitors or the other from receiving more on account of the contrary competition of those who expected to derive either profit or pleasure from employing them the great benefices and other ecclesiastical dignities support the honour of the church notwithstanding the mean circumstances of some of its inferior members the respect paid to the profession too makes some compensation even to them for the meanness of their pecuniary recompense in england and in all roman catholic countries the lottery of the church is in reality much more advantageous than is necessary the example of the churches of scotland of geneva and of several other protestant churches may satisfy us that in so creditable a profession in which education is so easily procured the hopes of much more moderate benefices will draw a sufficient number of learned decent and respectable men into holy orders in professions in which there are no benefices such as law and physic if an equal proportion of people were educated at the public expense the competition would soon be so great as to sink very much of their pecuniary reward it might then not be worth any man's while to educate his son to either of those professions at his own expense they would be entirely abandoned to such as had been educated by those public charities whose numbers and necessities would oblige them in general to content themselves with a very miserable recompense to the entire degradation of the now respectable professions of law and physic that unprosperous race of men commonly called men of letters are pretty much in the situation which lawyers and physicians probably would be in upon the foregoing supposition in every part of europe the greater part of them have been educated for the church but have been hindered by different reasons from entering into holy orders 
They have generally, therefore, been educated at the public expense, and their numbers are everywhere so great as commonly to reduce the price of their labour to a very paltry recompense. Before the invention of the art of printing, the only employment by which a man of letters could make anything by his talents was that of a public or private teacher, or by communicating to other people the curious and useful knowledge which he had acquired himself. And this is still surely a more honourable, a more useful, and, in general, even a more profitable employment than that other of writing for a bookseller, to which the art of printing has given occasion. The time and study, the genius, knowledge, and application requisite to qualify an eminent teacher of the sciences are at least equal to what is necessary for the greatest practitioners in law and physic. But the usual reward of the eminent teacher bears no proportion to that of the lawyer or physician, because the trade of the one is crowded with indigent people who have been brought up to it at the public expense, whereas those of the other two are encumbered with very few who have not been educated at their own. The usual recompense, however, of public and private teachers, small as it may appear, would undoubtedly be less than it is if the competition of those yet more indigent men of letters who write for bread was not taken out of the market. Before the invention of the art of printing, a scholar and a beggar seem to have been terms very nearly synonymous. The different governors of the universities before that time appear to have often granted licenses to their scholars to beg. In ancient times, before any charities of this kind had been established for the education of indigent people to the learned professions, the rewards of eminent teachers appear to have been much more considerable. Isocrates, in what is called his discourse against the sophists, reproaches the teachers of his own times with inconsistency. They make the most magnificent promises to their scholars, says he, and undertake to teach them to be wise, to be happy, and to be just, and in return for so important a service they stipulate the paltry reward of four or five minae. They who teach wisdom, continues he, ought certainly to be wise themselves, but if any man were to sell such a bargain for such a price, he would be convicted of the most evident folly. He certainly does not mean here to exaggerate the reward, and we may be assured that it was not less than he represents. Four minae were equal to thirteen pounds, six shillings, and eight pence, five minae to sixteen pounds, thirteen shillings, and four pence. Something not less than the largest of those two sums, therefore, must at that time have been usually paid to the most eminent teachers of Athens. Isocrates himself demanded ten minae, or thirty-three pounds, six shilling, and eight pence, from each scholar. When he taught at Athens, he is said to have had a hundred scholars. I understand this to be the number whom he taught at one time, or who attended what we would call one course of lectures, a number which will not appear extraordinary from so great a city to so famous a teacher, who taught, too, what was at that time the most fashionable of all sciences, rhetoric. He must have made, therefore, by each course of lectures, a thousand minae, or three thousand three hundred and thirty-five pounds, six shillings, eight pence. A thousand minae, accordingly, is said by Plutarch, in another place, to have been his didactron, or usual price of teaching. Many other eminent teachers in those times appear to have acquired great fortunes. Georgius made a present to the temple of Delphi, of his own statue in solid gold. We must not, I presume, suppose it was as large as the life. His way of living, as well as that of Hippias and Protagoras, two other eminent teachers of those times, is represented by Plato as splendid, even to ostentation. Plato himself is said to have lived with a good deal of magnificence. Aristotle, after having been tutor to Alexander, and most munificently rewarded, as it is universally agreed, both by him and his father Philip, thought it worth while, notwithstanding, to return to Athens, in order to resume the teaching of his school. Teachers of the sciences were probably in those times less common than they came to be in an age or two afterwards, when the competition had probably somewhat reduced both the price of their labour and the admiration of their persons. The most eminent of them, however, appear always to have enjoyed a degree of consideration much superior to any of the like profession in the present times. The Athenians sent Carniage the academic and Diogenes the stoic upon a solemn embassy to Rome, and though their city had then declined from its former grandeur, it was still an independent and considerable republic. Carniads, too, was a Babylonian by birth, and as there never was a people more jealous of admitting foreigners to public offices than the Athenians, their consideration for him must have been very great. This inequality is, upon the whole, perhaps rather advantageous than hurtful to the public. It may somewhat degrade the profession of a public teacher, but the cheapness of literary education is surely an advantage which greatly overbalances this trifling inconveniency. 
the public too might derive still greater benefit from it if the constitution of those schools and colleges in which education is carried on was more reasonable than it is at present through the greater part of europe End of Book 1, Chapter 10, Part 4Part 5 of Chapter 10 of Book 1 of The Wealth of Nations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Part 5 of Chapter 10 of Book 1 of Wages and Profit in the Different Employments of Labor and Stock. Thirdly, the policy of Europe, by obstructing the free circulation of labor and stock, both from employment to employment and from place to place, occasions, in some cases, a very inconvenient inequality in the whole of the advantages and disadvantages of their different employments. The statute of apprenticeship obstructs the free circulation of labor from one employment to another, even in the same place. The exclusive privileges of corporations obstruct it from one place to another, even in the same employment. It frequently happens that while high wages are given to the workmen in one manufacture, those in another are obliged to content themselves with bare subsistence. The one is in an advancing state, and has therefore a continual demand for new hands. The other is in a declining state, and the superabundance of hands is continually increasing. Those two manufacturers may sometimes be in the same town, and sometimes in the same neighborhood, without being able to lend the least assistance to one another. The statute of apprenticeship may oppose it in the one case, and both that and an exclusive corporation in the other. In many different manufactures, however, the operations are so much alike that the workmen could easily change trades with one another, if those absurd laws did not hinder them. The arts of weaving plain linen and plain silk, for example, are almost entirely the same. That of weaving plain woolen is somewhat different, but the difference is so insignificant that either a linen or a silk weaver might become a tolerable workman in a few days. If any of those three capital manufacturers, therefore, were decaying, the workman might find a resource in one of the other two which was in a more prosperous condition, and their wages would neither rise too high in the thriving, nor sink too low in the decaying manufacture. The linen manufacture, indeed, is in England by a particular statute open to everybody but as it is not much cultivated through the greater part of the country it can afford no general resource to the workmen of other decaying manufacturers who wherever the statute of apprenticeship takes place have no other choice but thither to come upon the parish or to work as common labourers for which by their habits they are much worse qualified than for any sort of manufacture that bears any resemblance to their own they generally therefore choose to come upon the parish Whatever obstructs the free circulation of labor from one employment to another obstructs that of stock likewise. The quantity of stock which can be employed in any branch of business depending very much upon that of the labor which can be employed in it. Corporation laws, however, give less obstruction to the free circulation of stock from one place to another than to that of labor. It is everywhere much easier for a wealthy merchant to obtain the privilege of trading in a town corporate than for a poor artificer to obtain that of working in it. The obstruction which corporation laws give to the free circulation of labor is common, I believe, to every part of Europe. That which is given to it by the poor laws is, so far as I know, peculiar to England. It consists in the difficulty which a poor man finds in obtaining a settlement, or even in being allowed to exercise his industry in any parish but that to which he belongs. It is the labor of artificers and manufacturers only of which the free circulation is obstructed by corporation laws. The difficulty of obtaining settlements obstructs even that of common labor. It may be worth while to give some account of the rise, progress, and present state of this disorder, the greatest, perhaps, of any in the police of England. When, by the destruction of monasteries, the poor had been deprived of the charity of those religious houses, after some other ineffectual attempts for their relief, it was enacted by the 43rd of Elizabeth, C. 2, that every parish should be bound to provide for its own poor, and that overseers of the poor should be annually appointed, who, with the church wardens, should raise, by a parish rate, competent sums for this purpose. By this statute, the necessity of providing for their own poor was indispensably imposed upon every parish. Who were to be considered as the poor of each parish became, therefore, a question of some importance. 
This question, after some variation, was at last determined by the 13th and 14th of Charles the Second, when it was enacted that forty days undisturbed residence should gain any person a settlement in any parish, but that within that time it should be lawful for two justices of the peace, upon complaint made by the church wardens or overseers of the poor, to remove any new inhabitant to the parish where he was last legally settled, unless he either rented a tenement of ten pounds a year, or could give such security for the discharge of the parish where he was then living, as those justices should judge sufficient. Some frauds, it is said, were committed in consequence of this statute, parish officers sometimes bribing their own poor to go clandestinely to another parish and by keeping themselves concealed for forty days to gain a settlement there to the discharge of that to which they properly belonged it was enacted therefore by the first of james the second that the forty days undisturbed residence of any person necessary to gain a settlement should be accounted only from the time of his delivering notice in writing of the place of his abode and the number of his family to one of the church wardens or overseers of the parish where he came to dwell but parish officers it seems were not always more honest with regard to their own than they had been with regard to other parishes and sometimes connived at such intrusions receiving the notice and taking no proper steps in consequence of it as every person in a parish therefore was supposed to have an interest to prevent as much as possible their being burdened by such intruders it was further enacted by the third of william the third that the forty days residence should be accounted only from the publication of such notice in writing on sunday in the church immediately after divine service after all says dr Byrne, this kind of settlement by continuing forty days after publication of notice in writing is very seldom obtained and the design of the acts is not so much for gaining of settlements as for the avoiding of them by persons coming into a parish clandestinely for the giving of notice is only putting a force upon the parish to remove but if a person's situation is such that it is doubtful whether he is actually removable or not he shall by giving of notice compel the parish either to allow him a settlement uncontested by suffering him to continue forty days or by removing him to try the right this statute therefore rendered it almost impracticable for a poor man to gain a new settlement in the old way by forty days inhabitancy but that it might not appear to preclude altogether the common people of one parish from ever establishing themselves with security in another it appointed four other ways by which a settlement might be gained without any notice delivered or published the first was by being taxed to parish rates and paying them the second by being elected into an annual parish office and serving it in a year the third by serving an apprenticeship in the parish the fourth being hired into service there for a year and continuing in the same service during the whole of it nobody can gain a settlement by either of the two first ways but by the public deed of the whole parish who are too well aware of the consequences to adopt any newcomer who has nothing but his labour to support him either by taxing him to parish rates or by electing him into a parish office no married man can well gain any settlement in either of the last two ways an apprentice is scarce ever married and is expressly enacted that no married servant shall gain any settlement by being hired for a year the principal effect of introducing settlement by service has been to put out in a great measure the old fashion of hiring for a year which before had been so customary in england that even at this day if no particular term is agreed upon the law intends that every servant is hired for a year but masters are not always willing to give their servants a settlement by hiring them in this manner and servants are not always willing to be so hired because as every last settlement discharges all the foregoing they might thereby lose their original settlement in the places of their nativity the habitation of their parents and relations no independent workman it is evident whether labour or artificer is likely to gain any new settlement either by apprenticeship or by service when such a person therefore carried his industry to a new parish he was liable to be removed how healthy and industrious soever at the caprice of any church warden or overseer unless he either rented a tenement of ten pounds a year a thing impossible for one who has nothing but his labour to live by or could give such security for the discharge of the parish as two justices of the peace should judge sufficient what security they shall require indeed is left altogether to their discretion but they cannot well require less than thirty pounds it having been enacted that the purchase even of a freehold estate of less than thirty pounds value shall not gain any person a settlement as not being sufficient for the discharge of the parish 
but this is a security which scarce any man who lives by labor can give and much greater security is frequently demanded in order to restore in some measure that free circulation of labor which those different statutes had almost entirely taken away the invention of certificates was fallen upon by the eighth and ninth of william the third it was enacted that if any person should bring a certificate from the parish where he was last legally settled subscribed by the church wardens and overseers of the poor and allowed by two justices of the peace that every other parish should be obliged to receive him that he should not be removable merely upon account of his being likely to become chargeable but only upon his becoming actually chargeable and that then the parish which granted the certificate should be obliged to pay the expense both of his maintenance and of his removal and in order to give the most perfect security to the parish where such certificated man should come to reside it was further enacted by the same statute that he should gain no settlement there by any means whatever except either by renting a tenement of ten pounds a year or by serving upon his own account in an annual parish office for one whole year and consequently neither by notice nor by service nor by apprenticeship nor by paying parish rates by the twelfth of queen anne too stat one c eighteen it was further enacted that neither the servants nor apprentices of such certificated man should gain any settlement in the parish where he resided under such certificate how far this invention has restored that free circulation of labor which the preceding statutes had almost entirely taken away we may learn from the following very judicious observation of dr burn it is obvious says he that there are diverse good reasons for requiring certificates with persons coming to settle in any place namely that persons residing under them can gain no settlement neither by apprenticeship nor by service nor by giving notice nor by paying parish rates that they can settle neither apprentices nor servants that if they become chargeable it is certainly known whether to remove them and the parish shall be paid for the removal and for their maintenance in the meantime and that if they fall sick and cannot be removed the parish which gave the certificate must maintain them none of all which can be without a certificate which reasons will hold proportionably for parishes not granting certificates in ordinary cases for it is far more than an equal chance but that they will have the certificated persons again and in a worse condition the moral of this observation seems to be that certificates ought always to be required by the parish where any poor man comes to reside and that they ought very seldom to be granted by that which he purposes to leave there is somewhat of a hardship in this matter of certificates says the same very intelligent author in his history of the poor laws by putting it in the power of a parish officer to imprison a man as it were for life however inconvenient it may be for him to continue at that place where he has had the misfortune to acquire what is called a settlement or whatever advantage he may propose himself by living elsewhere though a certificate carries along with it no testimonial of good behavior and certifies nothing but that the person belongs to the parish to which he really does belong it is altogether discretionary in the parish officers either to grant or to refuse it a mandamus was once moved for says dr Byrne, to compel the church wardens and overseers to sign a certificate but the court of king's bench rejected the notion as a very strange attempt the very unequal price of labor which we frequently find in england in places at no great distance from one another is probably owing to the obstruction which the law of settlements gives to a poor man who would carry his industry from one parish to another without a certificate a single man indeed who is healthy and industrious may sometimes reside by sufferance without one but a man with a wife and family who should attempt to do so would in most parishes be sure of being removed and if the single man should afterwards marry he would generally be removed likewise the scarcity of hands in one parish therefore cannot always be relieved by their superabundance in another as it is constantly in scotland and i believe in all other countries where there is no difficulty of settlement in such countries though wages may sometimes rise a little in the neighbourhood of a great town or wherever else there is an extraordinary demand for labour and sink gradually as the distance from such places increases till they fall back to the common rate of the country yet we never meet with those sudden and unaccountable differences in the wages of neighbouring places which we sometimes find in england where it is often more difficult for a poor man to pass the artificial boundary of a parish than an arm of the sea or a ridge of high mountains natural boundaries which sometimes separate very distinctly different rates of wages in other countries 
to remove a man who has committed no misdemeanor from the parish where he chooses to reside is an evident violation of natural liberty and justice the common people of england however so jealous of their liberty but like the common people of most other countries never rightly understanding wherein it consists have now for more than a century together suffered themselves to be exposed to this oppression without a remedy though men of reflection too have sometimes complained of the law of settlements as a public grievance yet it has never been the object of any general popular clamour such as that against general warrants an abusive practice undoubtedly but such a one as was not likely to occasion any general oppression there is scarce a poor man in england of forty years of age i will venture to say who has not in some part of his life felt himself most cruelly oppressed by this ill-contrived law of settlements i shall conclude this long chapter with observing that though anciently it was usual to rate wages first by general laws extending over the whole kingdom and afterwards by particular orders of the justices of peace in every particular county both these practices have now gone entirely into disuse by the experience of above four hundred years says dr burn it seems time to lay aside all endeavours to bring under strict regulations what in its own nature seems incapable of minute limitation for if all persons in the same kind of work were to receive equal wages there would be no emulation and no room left for industry or ingenuity Particular acts of Parliament, however, still attempt sometimes to regulate wages in particular trades and in particular places. Thus the eighth of George the Third prohibits, under heavy penalties, all master tailors in London, and five miles round it, from giving, and their workmen from accepting, more than two shillings and sevenpence halfpenny a day, except in the case of a general mourning whenever the legislature attempts to regulate the differences between masters and their workmen, its councillors are always the masters when the regulation therefore is in favour of the workmen it is always just and equitable but it is sometimes otherwise when in favour of the masters thus the law which obliges the masters in several different trades to pay their workmen in money and not in goods is quite just and equitable it imposes no real hardship upon the masters it only obliges them to pay that value in money which they pretended to pay but did not always really pay in goods this law is in favour of the workmen but the eighth of george the third is in favour of the masters when masters combine together in order to reduce the wages of their workmen they commonly enter into a private bond or agreement not to give more than a certain wage under a certain penalty were the workmen to enter into a contrary combination of the same kind not to accept of a certain wage under a certain penalty the law would punish them very severely and if it dealt impartially it would treat the masters in the same manner but the eighth of george the third enforces by law that very regulation which masters sometimes attempt to establish by such combinations the complaint of the workman that it puts the ablest and most industrious upon the same footing with an ordinary workman seems perfectly well founded in ancient times too it was usual to attempt to regulate the profits of merchants and other dealers by regulating the price of provisions and other goods the assize of bread is so far as i know the only remnant of this ancient usage where there is an exclusive corporation it may perhaps be proper to regulate the price of the first necessary of life but where there is none the competition will regulate it much better than any assize the method of fixing the assize of bread established by the thirty-first of george the second could not be put in practice in scotland on account of a defect in the law its execution depending upon the office of clerk of the market which does not exist there this defect was not remedied till the third of george the third the want of an assize occasioned no sensible inconveniency and the establishment of one in the few places where it has yet taken place has produced no sensible advantage in the greater part of the towns in scotland however there is an incorporation of bakers who claim exclusive privileges though they are not very strictly guarded the proportion between the different rates both of wages and profit in the different employments of labour and stock seems not to be much affected as has already been observed by the riches or poverty the advancing stationary or declining state of the society such revolutions in the public welfare though they affect the general rates both of wages and profit must in the end affect them equally in all different employments the proportion between them therefore must remain the same and cannot well be altered at least for any considerable time by any such revolutions end of book one chapter ten part five
Part One of Chapter Eleven of Book One of the Wealth of Nations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Part One of Chapter Eleven of Book One of the Rent of the Land. Rent, considered as the price paid for the use of land, is naturally the highest which the tenant can afford to pay in the actual circumstances of the land. In adjusting the terms of the lease, the landlord endeavors to leave him no greater share of the produce than what is sufficient to keep up the stock from which he furnishes the seed, pays the labor, and purchases and maintains the cattle and other instruments of husbandry, together with the ordinary profits of farming stock in the neighborhood. This is evidently the smallest share with which the tenant can content himself without being a loser, and the landlord seldom means to leave him any more. Whatever part of the produce, or what is the same thing, whatever part of its price, is over and above this share, he naturally endeavors to reserve to himself as the rent of his land, which is evidently the highest the tenant can afford to pay in the actual circumstances of the land. Sometimes, indeed, the liberality, more frequently the ignorance of the landlord, makes him accept of somewhat less than this portion, and sometimes, too, though more rarely, the ignorance of the tenant makes him undertake to pay somewhat more, or to content himself with somewhat less than the ordinary profits of farming stock in the neighborhood. This portion, however, may still be considered as the natural rent of the land, or the rent at which it is naturally meant that land should, for the most part, be let. The rent of the land, it may be thought, is frequently no more than a reasonable profit or interest for the stock laid out by the landlord upon its improvement. This, no doubt, may be partly the case upon some occasions, for it can scarce ever be more than partly the case. The landlord demands a rent even for unimproved land, and the supposed interest or profit upon the expense of improvement is generally an addition to this original rent those improvements besides are not always made by the stock of the landlord but sometimes by that of the tenant when the lease comes to be renewed however the landlord commonly demands the same augmentation of rent as if they had been all made by his own he sometimes demands rent for what is altogether incapable of human improvements kelp is a species of seaweed which when burnt yields an alkaline salt useful for making glass soap and for several other purposes it grows in several parts of great britain particularly in scotland upon such rocks only as lie within the high water mark which are twice every day covered with the sea and of which the produce therefore was never augmented by human industry the landlord however whose estate is bounded by a kelp shore of this kind demands a rent for it as much as for his cornfields the sea in the neighbourhood of the islands of shetland is more than commonly abundant in fish which makes a great part of the subsistence of their inhabitants but in order to profit by the produce of the water they must have a habitation upon the neighbouring land the rent of the landlord is in proportion not to what the farmer can make by the land but to what he can make both by the land and the water it is partly paid in sea-fish and one of the very few instances in which rent makes a part of the price of that commodity is to be found in that country the rent of land therefore considered as the price paid for the use of the land is naturally a monopoly price it is not at all proportioned to what the landlord may have laid out upon the improvement of the land or to what he can afford to take but to what the farmer can afford to give such parts only of the produce of land can commonly be brought to market of which the ordinary price is sufficient to replace the stock which must be employed in bringing them thither together with its ordinary profits if the ordinary price is more than this the surplus part of it will naturally go to the rent of the land if it is not more though the commodity may be brought to market it can afford no rent to the landlord whether the price is or is not more depends upon the demand there are some parts of the produce of land for which the demand must always be such as to afford a greater price than what is sufficient to bring them to market and there are others for which it either may or may not be such as to afford this greater price the former must always afford a rent to the landlord the latter sometimes may and sometimes may not according to different circumstances rent it is to be observed therefore enters into the composition of the price of commodities in a different way from wages and profit high or low wages and profit are the causes of high or low price high or low rent is the effect of it it is because high or low wages and profits must be paid in order to bring a particular commodity to market that its price is high or low 
but it is because its price is high or low a great deal more or very little more or no more than what is sufficient to pay those wages and profit that it affords a high rent or a low rent or no rent at all the particular consideration first of those parts of the produce of land which always afford some rent secondly of those which sometimes may and sometimes may not afford rent and thirdly of the variations which in the different periods of improvement naturally take place in the relative value of those two different sorts of rude produce when compared both with one another and with manufactured commodities will divide this chapter into three parts part one of the produce of land which always affords rent as men like all other animals naturally multiply in proportion to the means of their subsistence food is always more or less in demand it can always purchase or command a greater or smaller quantity of labor and somebody can always be found who is willing to do something in order to obtain it the quantity of labor indeed which it can purchase is not always equal to what it could maintain if managed in the most economical manner on account of the high wages which are sometimes given to labor but it can always purchase such a quantity of labor as it can maintain according to the rate at which that sort of labor is commonly maintained in the neighborhood but land in almost any situation produces a greater quantity of food than what is sufficient to maintain all the labor necessary for bringing it to market in the most liberal way in which that labor is ever maintained the surplus too is always more than sufficient to replace the stock which employed that labor together with its profits something therefore always remains for a rent to the landlord the most desert moors in norway and scotland produce some sort of pasture for cattle of which the milk and the increase are always more than sufficient not only to maintain all the labor necessary for tending them and to pay the ordinary profit to the farmer or the owner of the herd or flock but to afford some small rent to the landlord the rent increases in proportion to the goodness of the pasture the same extent of ground not only maintains a greater number of cattle but as they are brought within a smaller compass less labor becomes requisite to tend them and to collect their produce the landlord gains both ways by the increase of the produce and by the diminution of the labor which must be maintained out of it the rent of land not only varies with its fertility whatever be its produce but with its situation whatever be its fertility land in the neighborhood of a town gives a greater rent than land equally fertile in a distant part of the country though it may cost no more labor to cultivate the one than the other it must always cost more to bring the produce of the distant land to market a greater quantity of labor therefore must be maintained out of it and the surplus from which are drawn both the profit of the farmer and the rent of the landlord must be diminished but in remote parts of the country the rate of profit as has already been shown is generally higher than in the neighborhood of a large town a smaller proportion of this diminished surplus therefore must belong to the landlord good roads canals and navigable rivers by diminishing the expense of carriage put the remote parts of the country more nearly upon a level with those in the neighborhood of the town they are upon that account the greatest of all improvements they encourage the cultivation of the remote which must always be the most extensive circle of the country they are advantageous to the town by breaking down the monopoly of the country in its neighborhood they are advantageous even to that part of the country though they introduce some rival commodities into the old market they open many new markets to its produce monopoly besides is a great enemy to good management which can never be universally established but in consequence of that free and universal competition which forces everybody to have recourse to it for the sake of self-defence it is not more than fifty years ago that some of the counties in the neighbourhood of london petitioned the parliament against the extension of the turnpike roads into the remoter counties those remoter counties they pretended from the cheapness of labour would be able to sell their grass and corn cheaper in the london market than themselves and would thereby reduce their rents and ruin their cultivation their rents however have risen and their cultivation has been improved since that time a cornfield of moderate fertility produces a much greater quantity of food for man than the best pasture of equal extent though its cultivation requires much more labor yet the surplus which remains after replacing the seed and maintaining all that labor is likewise much greater if a pound of butcher's meat therefore was never supposed to be worth more than a pound of bread this greater surplus would everywhere be of greater value and constitute a greater fund both for the profit of the farmer and the rent of the landlord it seems to have done so universally in the rude beginnings of agriculture 
but the relative values of those two different species of food bread and butcher's meat are very different in the different periods of agriculture in its rude beginnings the unimproved wilds which then occupy the far greater part of the country are all abandoned to cattle there is more butcher's meat than bread and bread therefore is the food for which there is the greatest competition and which consequently brings the greatest price at buenos aires we are told by ulloa four reals one and twenty pence half penny sterling was forty or fifty years ago the ordinary price of an ox chosen from a herd of two or three hundred he says nothing of the price of bread probably because he found nothing remarkable about it an ox there he says costs little more than the labour of catching him but corn can nowhere be raised without a great deal of labour and in a country which lies upon the river plate at that time the direct road from europe to the silver mines of potosi the money price of labour could be very cheap it is otherwise when cultivation is extended over the greater part of the country there is then more bread than butcher's meat the competition changes its direction and the price of butcher's meat becomes greater than the price of bread by the extension besides of cultivation the unimproved wilds become insufficient to supply the demand for butcher's meat a great part of the cultivated lands must be employed in rearing and fattening cattle of which the price therefore must be sufficient to pay not only the labour necessary for tending them but the rent which the landlord and the profit which the farmer could have drawn from such land employed in tillage the cattle bred upon the most uncultivated moors when brought to the same market are in proportion to their weight or goodness sold at the same price as those which are reared upon the most improved land the proprietors of those moors profit by it and raise the rent of their land in proportion to the price of their cattle it is not more than a century ago that in many parts of the highlands of scotland butcher's meat was as cheap or cheaper than even bread made of oatmeal the union opened the market of england to the highland cattle their ordinary price at present is about three times greater than at the beginning of the century and the rents of many highland estates have been tripled and quadrupled in the same time in almost every part of great britain a pound of the best butcher's meat is in the present times generally worth more than two pounds of the best white bread and in plentiful years it is sometimes worth three or four pounds it is thus that in the progress of improvement the rent and profit of unimproved pasture comes to be regulated in some measure by the rent and profit of what is improved and these again by the rent and profit of corn corn is an annual crop butcher's meat a crop which requires four or five years to grow as an acre of land therefore will produce a much smaller quantity of the one species of food than of the other the inferiority of the quantity must be compensated by the superiority of the price if it was more than compensated more corn land would be turned into pasture and if it was not compensated part of what was in pasture would be brought back into corn this equality however between the rent and profit of grass and those of corn of the land of which the immediate produce is food for cattle and of that of which the immediate produce is food for men must be understood to take place only through the greater part of the improved lands of a great country in some particular local situations it is quite otherwise and the rent and profit of grass are much superior to what can be made by corn thus in the neighbourhood of a great town the demand for milk and for forage to horses frequently contribute together with the high price of butcher's meat to raise the value of grass above what may be called its natural proportion to that of corn this local advantage it is evident cannot be communicated to the lands at a distance particular circumstances have sometimes rendered some countries so populous that the whole territory like the lands in the neighbourhood of a great town has not been sufficient to produce both the grass and the corn necessary for the subsistence of their inhabitants their lands therefore have been principally employed in the production of grass the more bulky commodity and which cannot be so easily brought from a great distance and corn the food of the great body of the people has been chiefly imported from foreign countries holland is at present in this situation and a considerable part of ancient italy seems to have been so during the prosperity of the romans to feed well old cato said as we are told by cicero was the first and most profitable thing in the management of a private estate to feed tolerably well the second and to feed ill the third to plough he ranked only in the fourth place of profit and advantage tillage indeed in that part of ancient italy which lay in the neighbourhood of rome must have been very much discouraged by the distributions of corn which were frequently made to the people either gratuitously or at a very low price 
this corn was brought from the conquered provinces of which several instead of taxes were obliged to furnish a tenth part of their produce at a stated price about sixpence a peck to the republic the low price at which this corn was distributed to the people must necessarily have sunk the price of what could be brought to the roman market from latium or the ancient territory of rome and must have discouraged its cultivation in that country in an open country too of which the principal produce is corn a well enclosed piece of grass will frequently rent higher than any corn field in its neighbourhood it is convenient for the maintenance of the cattle employed in the cultivation of the corn and its high rent is in this case not so properly paid from the value of its own produce as from that of the corn lands which are cultivated by means of it it is likely to fall if ever the neighbouring lands are completely enclosed the present high rent of enclosed land in scotland seems owing to the scarcity of enclosure and will probably last no longer than that scarcity the advantage of enclosure is greater for pasture than for corn it saves the labour of guarding the cattle which feed better too when they are not liable to be disturbed by their keeper or his dog but where there is no local advantage of this kind the rent and profit of corn or whatever else is the common vegetable food of the people must naturally regulate upon the land which is fit for producing it the rent and profit of pasture the use of the artificial grasses of turnips carrots cabbages and the other expedients which have been fallen upon to make an equal quantity of land feed a greater number of cattle than when in natural grass should somewhat reduce it might be expected the superiority which in an improved country the price of butcher's meat naturally has over that of bread it seems accordingly to have done so and there is some reason for believing that at least in the london market the price of butcher's meat in proportion to the price of bread is a good deal lower in the present times than it was in the beginning of the last century in the appendix to the life of prince henry dr birch has given us an account of the prices of butcher's meat as commonly paid by that prince it is there said that the four quarters of an ox weighing six hundred pounds usually cost him nine pounds ten shillings or thereabouts that is thirty-one shillings and eight pence per hundred pounds weight prince henry died on the sixth of november sixteen twelve in the nineteenth year of his age in march seventeen sixty four there was a parliamentary inquiry into the causes of the high price of provisions at that time it was then among other proof to the same purpose given in evidence by a virginia merchant that in march seventeen sixty three he had victualled his ships for twenty four or twenty five shillings the hundred weight of beef which he considered as the ordinary price whereas in that dear year he had paid twenty seven shillings for the same weight and sort this high price in seventeen sixty four is however four shillings and eight pence cheaper than the ordinary price paid by prince henry and it is the best beef only it must be observed which is fit to be salted for those distant voyages the price paid by prince henry amounts to three pence four-fifths per pound weight of the whole carcass coarse and choice pieces taken together and at that rate the choice pieces could not have been sold by retail for less than four and a half pence or five pence the pound in the parliamentary inquiry in seventeen sixty four the witnesses stated the price of the choice pieces of the best beef to be to the consumer four pence and four and a half pence the pound and the coarse pieces in general to be from seven farthings to two and a half pence and two and three quarter pence and this they said was in general one half penny dearer than the same sort of pieces had usually been sold in the month of march but even this high price is still a good deal cheaper than what we can well suppose the ordinary retail price to have been in the time of prince henry during the first twelve years of the last century the average price of the best wheat at the windsor market was one pound eighteen shilling three and a half pence the quarter of nine winchester bushels but in the twelve years preceding seventeen sixty four including that year the average price of the same measure of the best wheat at the same market was two pound one shilling nine and a half pence in the first twelve years of the last century therefore wheat appears to have been a good deal cheaper and butcher's meat a good deal dearer than in the twelve years preceding seventeen sixty four including that year in all great countries the greater part of the cultivated lands are employed in producing either food for men or food for cattle the rent and profit of these regulate the rent and profit of all other cultivated land if any particular produce afforded less the land would soon be turned into corn or pasture and if any afforded more some part of the lands in corn or pasture would soon be turned to that produce 
those productions indeed which require either a greater original expense of improvement or a greater annual expense of cultivation in order to fit the land for them appear commonly to afford the one a greater rent the other a greater profit than corn or pasture this superiority however will seldom be found to amount to more than a reasonable interest or compensation for this superior expense in a hop garden a fruit garden a kitchen garden both the rent of the landlord and the profit of the farmer are generally greater than an acorn or grass field but to bring the ground into this condition requires more expense hence a greater rent becomes due to the landlord it requires too a more attentive and skilful management hence a greater profit becomes due to the farmer the crop too at least in the hop and fruit garden is more precarious its price therefore besides compensating all occasional losses must afford something like the profit of insurance the circumstances of gardeners generally mean and always moderate may satisfy us that their great ingenuity is not commonly over recompensed their delightful art is practised by so many rich people for amusement that little advantage is to be made by those who practise it for profit because the persons who should naturally be their best customers supply themselves with all their most precious productions the advantage which the landlord derives from such improvements seems at no time to have been greater than what was sufficient to compensate the original expense of making them in the ancient husbandry after the vineyard a well-watered kitchen garden seems to have been the part of the farm which was supposed to yield the most valuable produce but democritus who wrote upon husbandry about two thousand years ago and who was regarded by the ancients as one of the fathers of the art thought they did not act wisely who enclosed a kitchen garden the profit he said would not compensate the expense of a stone wall and bricks he meant i suppose bricks baked in the sun mouldered with the rain and the winter storm and required continual repairs columella who reports this judgment of democritus does not controvert it but proposes a very frugal method of enclosing with a hedge of brambles and briars which he says he had found by experience to be both a lasting and an impenetrable fence but which it seems was not commonly known in the time of democritus palladius adopts the opinion of columella which had before been recommended by varro in the judgment of those ancient improvers the produce of a kitchen garden had it seems been little more than sufficient to pay the extraordinary culture and the expense of watering for in countries so near the sun it was thought proper in those times as in the present to have the command of a stream of water which could be conducted to every bed in the garden through the greater part of europe a kitchen garden is not at present supposed to deserve a better enclosure than that recommended by columella in great britain and some other northern countries the finer fruits cannot be brought to perfection but by the assistance of a wall their price therefore in such countries must be sufficient to pay the expense of building and maintaining what they cannot be had without the fruit wall frequently surrounds the kitchen garden which thus enjoys the benefit of an enclosure which its own produce could seldom pay for that the vineyard when properly planted and brought to perfection was the most valuable part of the farm seems to have been an undoubted maxim in the ancient agriculture as it is in the modern through all the wine countries but whether it was advantageous to plant a new vineyard was a matter of dispute among the ancient italian husbandmen as we learn from columella he decides like a true lover of all curious cultivation in favour of the vineyard and endeavours to show by a comparison of the profit and expense that it was a most advantageous improvement such comparisons however between the profit and expense of new projects are commonly very fallacious and in nothing more so than in agriculture had the gain actually made by such plantations been commonly as great as he imagined it might have been there could have been no dispute about it the same point is frequently at this day a matter of controversy in the wine countries their writers on agriculture indeed the lovers and promoters of high cultivation seem generally disposed to decide with columella in favour of the vineyard in france the anxiety of the proprietors of the old vineyards to prevent the planting of any new ones seems to favour their opinion and to indicate a consciousness in those who must have the experience that this species of cultivation is at present in that country more profitable than any other it seems at the same time however to indicate another opinion that this superior profit can last no longer than the laws which at present restrain the free cultivation of the vine 
In 1731 they obtained an order of council prohibiting both the planting of new vineyards and the renewal of these old ones, of which the cultivation had been interrupted for two years without a particular permission from the king to be granted only in consequence of an information from the attendant of the province, certifying that he had examined the land and that it was incapable of any other culture. The pretense of this order was the scarcity of corn and pasture and the superabundance of wine. But had this superabundance been real, it would, without any order of council, have effectually prevented the plantation of new vineyards, by reducing the profits of this species of cultivation below their natural proportion to those of corn and pasture. With regard to the supposed scarcity of corn occasioned by the multiplication of vineyards, corn is nowhere in France more carefully cultivated than in the wine provinces, where the land is fit for producing it as in burgundy guienne and the upper languedoc the numerous hands employed in the one species of cultivation necessarily encourage the other by affording a ready market for its produce to diminish the number of those who are capable of paying it is surely a most unpromising expedient for encouraging the cultivation of corn it is like the policy which would promote agriculture by discouraging manufacturers the rent and profit of those productions therefore which require either a great original expense of improvement in order to fit the land for them or a greater annual expense of cultivation though often much superior to those of corn and pasture yet when they do no more than compensate such extraordinary expense are in reality regulated by the rent and profit of those common crops it sometimes happens, indeed, that the quantity of land which can be fitted for some particular produce is too small to supply the effectual demand. The whole produce can be disposed of to those who are willing to give somewhat more than what is sufficient to pay the whole rent, wages, and profit necessary for raising and bringing it to market, according to their natural rates, or according to the rates at which they are paid in the greater part of other cultivated land. The surplus part of the price which remains after defraying the whole expense of improvement and cultivation may commonly, in this case and in this case only, bear no regular proportion to the like surplus in corn or pasture, but may exceed it in almost any degree, and the greater part of this excess naturally goes to the rent of the landlord. The usual and natural proportion, for example, between the rent and profit of wine and those of corn and pasture must be understood to take place only with regard to those vineyards which produce nothing but good common wine, such as can be raised almost anywhere, upon any light, gravelly, or sandy soil, and which has nothing to recommend it but its strength and wholesomeness. It is with such vineyards only that the common land of the country can be brought into competition, for with those of a peculiar quality it is evident that it cannot the vine is more affected by the difference of soils than any other fruit tree for some it derives a flavor which no culture or management can equal it is supposed upon any other this flavor real or imaginary is sometimes peculiar to the produce of a few vineyards sometimes it extends through the greater part of a small district and sometimes through a considerable part of a large province the whole quantity of such wines that is brought to market falls short of the effectual demand or the demand of those who would be willing to pay the whole rent profit and wages necessary for preparing and bringing them thither according to the ordinary rate or according to the rate at which they are paid in common vineyards the whole quantity therefore can be disposed of to those who are willing to pay more which necessarily raises their prices above that of common wine the difference is greater or less according as the fashionableness and scarcity of the wine render the competition of the buyers more or less eager whatever it be the greater part of it goes to the rent of the landlord for though such vineyards are in general more carefully cultivated than most others the high price of the wine seems to be not so much the effect as the cause of this careful cultivation and so valuable a produce the loss occasioned by negligence is so great as to force even the most careless to attention a small part of this high price therefore is sufficient to pay the wages of the extraordinary labour bestowed upon their cultivation and the profits of the extraordinary stock which puts that labor into motion. The sugar colonies possessed by the European nations in the West Indies may be compared to those precious vineyards. Their whole produce falls short of the effectual demand of Europe, and can be disposed of to those who are willing to give more than what is sufficient to pay the whole rent, profit, and wages necessary for preparing and bringing it to market, according to the rate at which they are commonly paid by any other produce. In Cochin, China, finest white sugar generally sells for three piastres the quintal about thirteen shillings and sixpence of our money as we are told by mr poive a very careful observer of the agriculture of that country 
What is there called the quintal weighs from a hundred and fifty to two hundred Paris pounds, or a hundred and seventy-five Paris pounds at a medium, which reduces the price of the hundred weight English to about eight shillings sterling, not a fourth part of what is commonly paid for the brown or muscovada sugars imported from our colonies, and not a sixth part of what is paid for the finest white sugar. The greater part of the cultivated lands in Cochin, China, are employed in producing corn and rice, the food of the great body of the people. The respective prices of corn, rice, and sugar are there probably in the natural proportion or in that which naturally takes place in the different crops of the greater part of the cultivated land, and which recompenses the landlord and farmer, as nearly as can be computed, according to what is usually the original expense of improvement and the annual expense of cultivation. But in our sugar colonies the price of sugar bears no such proportion to that of the produce of a rice or corn field either in Europe or America. It is commonly said that a sugar planter expects that the rum and the molasses should defray the whole expense of his cultivation, and that his sugar should be all clear profit. If this be true, for I pretend not to affirm it, it is as if a corn farmer expected to defray the expense of his cultivation with the chaff and the straw, and that the grain should be all clear profit. We see frequently societies of merchants in London and other trading towns purchase waste lands in our sugar colonies, which they expect to improve and cultivate with profit, by means of factors and agents, notwithstanding the great distance and the uncertain returns from the defective administration of justice in those countries. Nobody will attempt to improve and cultivate in the same manner the most fertile lands of Scotland, Ireland, or the corn provinces of North America, though, from the more exact administration of justice in these countries, more regular returns might be expected. In Virginia and Maryland, the cultivation of tobacco is preferred, as most profitable, to that of corn. Tobacco might be cultivated with advantage through the greater part of Europe, but in almost every part of Europe it has become a principal subject of taxation and to collect a tax from every different farm in the country where this plant might happen to be cultivated would be more difficult it has been supposed than to levy one upon its importation at the custom-house the cultivation of tobacco has upon this account been most absurdly prohibited through the greater part of europe which necessarily gives a sort of monopoly to the countries where it is allowed and as virginia and maryland produce the greatest quantity of it they share largely though with some competitors in the advantage of this monopoly the cultivation of tobacco, however, seems not to be so advantageous as that of sugar. I have never even heard of any tobacco plantation that was improved and cultivated by the capital of merchants who resided in Great Britain, and our tobacco colonies send us home no such wealthy planters as we see frequently arrive from our sugar islands. Though from the preference given in those colonies to the cultivation of tobacco above that of corn, it would appear that the effectual demand of Europe for tobacco is not completely supplied, it probably is more nearly so than that for sugar, and though the present price of tobacco is probably more than sufficient to pay the whole rent, wages, and profit necessary for preparing and bringing it to market, according to the rate at which they are commonly paid in cornland, it must not be so much more as the present price of sugar. Our tobacco planters, accordingly, have shown the same fear of the superabundance of tobacco, which the proprietors of the old vineyards in France have of the superabundance of wine. By act of assembly they have restrained its cultivation to six thousand plants, supposed to yield a thousand weight of tobacco for every negro between sixteen and sixty years of age. Such a negro, over and above this quantity of tobacco, can manage, they reckon, four acres of Indian corn. To prevent the market from being overstocked, too, they have sometimes, in plentiful years, we are told by Dr. Douglas, I suspect he has been ill-informed, burnt a certain quantity of tobacco for every negro, in the same manner as the Dutch are said to do of spices. If such violent methods are necessary to keep up the present price of tobacco, the superior advantage of its culture over that of corn, if it still has any, will not probably be of long continuance. It is in this manner that the rent of the cultivated land, of which the produce is human food, regulates the rent of the greater part of other cultivated land. No particular produce can long afford less, because the land would immediately be turned to another use, and if any particular produce commonly affords more, it is because the quantity of land which can be fitted for it is too small to supply the effectual demand. In Europe, corn is the principal produce of land, which serves immediately for human food. Except in particular situations, therefore, the rent of corn land regulates in Europe that of all other cultivated land. Britain need envy neither the vineyards of France nor the olive plantations of Italy. 
except in particular situations the value of these is regulated by that of corn in which the fertility of britain is not much inferior to that of either of those two countries if in any country the common and favourite vegetable food of the people should be drawn from a plant of which the most common land with the same or nearly the same culture produced a much greater quantity than the most fertile does of corn the rent of the landlord or the surplus quantity of food which would remain to him after paying the labour and replacing the stock of the farmer together with its ordinary profits would necessarily be much greater whatever was the rate at which labour was commonly maintained in that country this greater surplus could always maintain a greater quantity of it and consequently enable the landlord to purchase or command a greater quantity of it the real value of his rent his real power and authority his command of the necessaries and conveniencies of life with which the labour of other people could supply him would necessarily be much greater a rice field produces a much greater quantity of food than the most fertile corn field two crops in the year from thirty to sixty bushels each are said to be the ordinary produce of an acre though its cultivation therefore requires more labour a much greater surplus remains after maintaining all that labour in those countries therefore where rice is the common and favourite vegetable food of the people and where the cultivators are chiefly maintained with it a greater share of this greater surplus should belong to the landlord than in corn countries in carolina where the planters as in other british colonies are generally both farmers and landlords and where rent consequently is confounded with profit the cultivation of rice is found to be more profitable than that of corn though their fields produce only one crop in the year and though from the prevalence of the customs of europe rice is not there the common and favourite vegetable food of the people a good rice field is a bog at all seasons and at one season a bog covered with water it is unfit either for corn or pasture or vineyard or indeed for any other vegetable produce that is very useful to men and the lands which are fit for those purposes are not fit for rice even in the rice countries therefore the rent of rice lands cannot regulate the rent of the other cultivated land which can never be turned to that produce the food produced by a field of potatoes is not inferior in quantity to that produced by a field of rice and much superior to what is produced by a field of wheat twelve thousand weight of potatoes from an acre of land is not a greater produce than two thousand weight of wheat the food or solid nourishment indeed which can be drawn from each of those two plants is not altogether in proportion to their weight on account of the watery nature of potatoes allowing however half the weight of this root to go to water a very large allowance such an acre of potatoes will still produce six thousand weight of solid nourishment three times the quantity produced by the acre of wheat an acre of potatoes is cultivated with less expense than an acre of wheat the fallow which generally precedes the sowing of wheat more than compensating the hoeing and other extraordinary culture which is always given to potatoes should this root ever become in any part of europe like rice in some rice countries the common and favourite vegetable food of the people so as to occupy the same proportion of the lands in tillage which wheat and other sorts of grain for human food do at present the same quantity of cultivated land would maintain a much greater number of people and the labourers being generally fed with potatoes a greater surplus would remain after replacing all the stock and maintaining all the labour employed in cultivation a greater share of this surplus too would belong to the landlord population would increase and the rents would rise much beyond what they are at present the land which is fit for potatoes is fit for almost every other useful vegetable if they occupy the same proportion of cultivated land which corn does at present they would regulate in the same manner the rent of the greater part of other cultivated land in some parts of lancashire it is pretended i have been told that bread of oatmeal is a heartier food for labouring people than wheaten bread and i have frequently heard the same doctrine held in scotland i am however somewhat doubtful of the truth of it the common people in scotland who are fed with oatmeal are in general neither so strong nor so handsome as the same rank of people in england who are fed with wheaten bread they neither work so well nor look so well and as there is not the same difference between the people of fashion in the two countries experience would seem to show that the food of the common people in scotland is not so suitable to the human constitution as that of their neighbours of the same rank in england but it seems to be otherwise with potatoes the chairman porters and coal heavers in london and those unfortunate women who live by prostitution the strongest men and the most beautiful women perhaps in the british dominions are said to be the greater part of them from the lowest rank of people in ireland who are generally fed with this root 
no food can afford a more decisive proof of its nourishing quality or of its being peculiarly suitable to the health of the human constitution it is difficult to preserve potatoes through the year and impossible to store them like corn for two or three years together the fear of not being able to sell them before they rot discourages their cultivation and is perhaps the chief obstacle to their ever becoming in any great country like bread the principal food of all the different ranks of the people End of Book 1, Chapter 11, Part 1part two of chapter eleven of book one of the wealth of nations this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by stephen escalera the wealth of nations by adam smith part two of chapter eleven of book one of the rent of the land part two of the produce of land which sometimes does and sometimes does not afford rent human food seems to be the only produce of land which always and necessarily affords some rent to the landlord other sorts of produce sometimes may and sometimes may not according to different circumstances after food clothing and lodging are the two great wants of mankind land in its original rude state can afford the materials of clothing and lodging to a much greater number of people than it can feed in its improved state it can sometimes feed a greater number of people than it can supply with those materials at least in the way in which they require them and are willing to pay for them in the one state therefore there is always a superabundance of these materials which are frequently upon that account of little or no value in the other there is often a scarcity which necessarily augments their value in the one state a great part of them is thrown away as useless and the price of what is used is considered as equal only to the labour and expense of fitting it for use and can therefore afford no rent to the landlord in the other they are all made use of and there is frequently a demand for more than can be had somebody is always willing to give more for every part of them than what is sufficient to pay the expense of bringing them to market their price therefore can always afford some rent to the landlord the skins of the larger animals were the original materials of clothing among nations of hunters and shepherds therefore whose food consists chiefly in the flesh of those animals every man by providing himself with food provides himself with the materials of more clothing than he can wear if there was no foreign commerce the greater part of them would be thrown away as things of no value this was probably the case among the hunting nations of north america before their country was discovered by the europeans with whom they now exchange their surplus peltry for blankets firearms and brandy which gives it some value in the present commercial state of the known world the most barbarous nations i believe among whom land property is established have some foreign commerce of this kind and find among their wealthier neighbours such a demand for all the materials of clothing which their land produces and which can neither be wrought up nor consumed at home as raises their price above what it costs to send them to those wealthier neighbours it affords therefore some rent to the landlord when the greater part of the highland cattle were consumed on their own hills the exportation of their hides made the most considerable article of the commerce of that country and what they were exchanged for afforded some addition to the rent of the highland estates the wool of england which in old times could neither be consumed nor wrought up at home found a market in the then wealthier and more industrious country of flanders and its price afforded something to the rent of the land which produced it in countries not better cultivated than england was then or than the highlands of scotland are now and which had no foreign commerce the materials of clothing would evidently be so superabundant that a great part of them would be thrown away as useless and no part could afford any rent to the landlord the materials of lodging cannot always be transported to so great a distance as those of clothing and do not so readily become an object of foreign commerce when they are superabundant in the country which produces them it frequently happens even in the present commercial state of the world that they are of no value to the landlord a good stone quarry in the neighbourhood of london would afford a considerable rent in many parts of scotland and wales it affords none barren timber for building is of great value in a populous and well cultivated country and the land which produces it affords a considerable rent but in many parts of north america the landlord would be much obliged to anybody who would carry away the greater part of his large trees in some parts of the highlands of scotland the bark is the only part of the wood which for want of roads and water carriage can be sent to market 
the timber is left to rot upon the ground. When the materials of lodging are so superabundant, the part made use of is worth only the labor and expense of fitting it for that use. It affords no rent to the landlord, who generally grants the use of it to whoever takes the trouble of asking it. The demand of wealthier nations, however, sometimes enables him to get a rent for it. The paving of the streets of London has enabled the owners of some barren rocks on the coast of Scotland to draw a rent from what never afforded any before. The woods of Norway and of the coasts of the Baltic find a market in many parts of Great Britain, which they could not find at home, and thereby afford some rent to their proprietors. Countries are populous, not in proportion to the number of people whom their produce can clothe and lodge, but in proportion to that of those whom it can feed. When food is provided, it is easy to find the necessary clothing and lodging, but though these are at hand, it may often be difficult to find food. In some parts of the British dominions, what is called a house may be built by one day's labor of one man. The simplest species of clothing, the skins of animals, require somewhat more labor to dress and prepare them for use. They do not, however, require a great deal. Among savage or barbarous nations, a hundredth or little more than a hundredth part of the labor of the whole year will be sufficient to provide them with such clothing and lodging as satisfy the greater part of the people. All the other ninety-nine parts are frequently no more than enough to provide them with food. But when, by the improvement and cultivation of land, the labor of one family can provide food for two, the labor of half the society becomes sufficient to provide food for the whole. The other half, therefore, or at least the greater part of them, can be employed in providing other things, or in satisfying the other wants and fancies of mankind. Clothing and lodging, household furniture, and what is called equipage, are the principal objects of the greater part of those wants and fancies. The rich man consumes no more food than his poor neighbor. In quality it may be very different, and to select and prepare it may require more labor and art, but in quantity it is very nearly the same. But compare the spacious palace and great wardrobe of the one, with the hovel and the few rags of the other, and you will be sensible that the difference between their clothing, lodging, and household furniture is almost as great in quantity as it is in quality. The desire of food is limited in every man by the narrow capacity of the human stomach. But the desire of the conveniencies and ornaments of building, dress, equipage, and household furniture seems to have no limit or certain boundary. Those, therefore, who have the command of more food than they themselves can consume, are always willing to exchange the surplus, or, what is the same thing, the price of it, for gratifications of this other kind. What is over and above satisfying the limited desire is given for the amusement of those desires which cannot be satisfied, but seem to be altogether endless. The poor, in order to obtain food, exert themselves to gratify those fancies of the rich, and to obtain it more certainly they vie with one another in the cheapness and perfection of their work. The number of workmen increases with the increasing quantity of food, or with the growing improvement and cultivation of the lands, and, as the nature of their business admits of the utmost subdivisions of labor, the quantity of materials which they can work up increases in a much greater proportion than their numbers. Hence arises a demand for every sort of material which human invention can employ, either usefully or ornamentally, in building, dress, equipage, or household furniture. For the fossils and minerals contained in the bowels of the earth, the precious metals, and the precious stones. Food is, in this manner, not only the original source of rent, but every other part of the produce of land which afterwards affords rent derives that part of its value from the improvement of the powers of labor in producing food, by means of the improvement and cultivation of land. Those other parts of the produce of land, however, which afterwards afford rent, do not afford it always. Even in improved and cultivated countries, the demand for them is not always such as to afford a greater price than what is sufficient to pay the labor, and replace, together with its ordinary profits, the stock which must be employed in bringing them to market. Whether it is or is not such depends upon different circumstances. Whether a coal mine, for example, can afford any rent depends partly upon its fertility and partly upon its situation. A mine of any kind may be said to be either fertile or barren, according as the quantity of mineral which can be brought from it by a certain quantity of labor is greater or less than what can be brought by an equal quantity from the greater part of other mines of the same kind. Some coal mines, advantageously situated, cannot be wrought on account of their barrenness. The produce does not pay the expense. They can afford neither profit nor rent. 
there are some of which the produce is barely sufficient to pay the labour and replace together with its ordinary profits the stock employed in working them they afford some profit to the undertaker of the work but no rent to the landlord they can be wrought advantageously by nobody but the landlord who being himself the undertaker of the work gets the ordinary profit of the capital which he employs in it many coal mines in scotland are wrought in this manner and can be wrought in no other the landlord will allow nobody else to work them without paying some rent and nobody can afford to pay any other coal mines in the same country sufficiently fertile cannot be wrought on account of their situation a quantity of mineral sufficient to defray the expense of working could be brought from the mine by the ordinary or even less than the ordinary quantity of labour but in an inland country thinly inhabited and without either good roads or water carriage this quantity could not be sold coals are a less agreeable fuel than wood they are said too to be less wholesome the expense of coals therefore at the place where they are consumed must generally be somewhat less than that of wood the price of wood again varies with the state of agriculture nearly in the same manner and exactly for the same reason as the price of cattle in its rude beginnings the greater part of every country is covered with wood which is then a mere encumbrance of no value to the landlord who would gladly give it to anybody for the cutting as agriculture advances the woods are partly cleared by the progress of tillage and partly go to decay in consequence of the increased number of cattle these though they do not increase in the same proportion as corn which is altogether the acquisition of human industry yet multiply under the care and protection of men who store up in the season of plenty what may maintain them in that of scarcity who through the whole year furnish them with a greater quantity of food than uncultivated nature provides for them and who by destroying and extirpating their enemies secure them in the free enjoyment of all that she provides numerous herds of cattle when allowed to wander through the woods though they do not destroy the old trees hinder any young ones from coming up so that in the course of a century or two the whole forest goes to ruin the scarcity of wood then raises its price it affords a good rent and the landlord sometimes finds that he can scarce employ his best lands more advantageously than in growing barren timber of which the greatness of the profit often compensates the lateness of the returns this seems in the present times to be nearly the state of things in several parts of great britain where the profit of planting is found to be equal to that of either corn or pasture the advantage which the landlord derives from planting can nowhere exceed at least for any considerable time the rent which these could afford him and in an inland country which is highly cultivated it will frequently not fall much short of this rent upon the sea coast of a well improved country indeed if coals can conveniently be had for fuel it may sometimes be cheaper to bring barren timber for building from less cultivated foreign countries than to raise it at home in the new town of edinburgh built within these few years there is not perhaps a single stick of scotch timber whatever may be the price of wood if that of coals is such that the expense of a coal fire is nearly equal to that of a wood one we may be assured that at that place and in these circumstances the price of coals is as high as it can be it seems to be so in some of the inland parts of england particularly in oxfordshire where it is usual even in the fires of the common people to mix coals and wood together and where the difference in the expense of those two sorts of fuel cannot therefore be very great coals in the coal country are everywhere much below this highest price if they were not they could not bear the expense of a distant carriage either by land or by water a small quantity only could be sold and the coal masters and the coal proprietors find it more for their interest to sell a great quantity at a price somewhat above the lowest than a small quantity at the highest the most fertile coal mine too regulates the price of coals at all the other mines in its neighbourhood both the proprietor and the undertaker of the work find the one that he can get a greater rent the other that he can get a greater profit by somewhat underselling all their neighbours their neighbours are soon obliged to sell at the same price though they cannot so well afford it and though it always diminishes and sometimes takes away altogether both their rent and their profit some works are abandoned altogether others can afford no rent and can be wrought only by the proprietor the lowest price at which coals can be sold for any considerable time is like that of all other commodities the price which is barely sufficient to replace together with its ordinary profits the stock which must be employed in bringing them to market at a coal mine for which the landlord can get no rent but which he must either work himself or let it alone altogether the price of coals must generally be nearly about this price 
Rent, even where coals afford one, has generally a smaller share in their price than in that of most other parts of the rude produce of land. The rent of an estate above ground commonly amounts to what is supposed to be a third of the gross produce, and it is generally a rent certain and independent of the occasional variations in the crop. In coal mines, a fifth of the gross produce is a very great rent, a tenth the common rent, and it is seldom a rent certain but depends upon the occasional variations in the produce. These are so great that in a country where thirty years' purchase is considered as a moderate price for the property of a landed estate, ten years' purchase is regarded as a good price for that of a coal mine. The value of a coal mine to the proprietor frequently depends as much upon its situation as upon its fertility. That of a metallic mine depends more upon its fertility and less upon its situation. The coarse and still more the precious metals, when separated from the ore, are so valuable that they can generally bear the expense of a very long land and of the most distant sea carriage. Their market is not confined to the countries in the neighborhood of the mine, but extends to the whole world. The copper of Japan makes an article of commerce in Europe, the iron of Spain in that of Chile and Peru. The silver of Peru finds its way not only to Europe, but from Europe to China. The price of coals in Westmoreland or Shropshire can have little effect on their price at Newcastle, and their price in the Leonois can have none at all. The productions of such distant coal mines can never be brought into competition with one another. But the productions of the most distant metallic mines frequently may, and in fact commonly are. The price, therefore, of the coarse and still more that of the precious metals at the most fertile mines in the world must necessarily more or less affect their price at every other in it. The price of copper in Japan must have some influence upon its price at the copper mines in Europe. The price of silver in Peru, or the quantity either of labor or of other goods which it will purchase there, must have some influence on its price, not only at the silver mines of Europe, but at those of China. After the discovery of the mines of Peru, the silver mines of Europe were, the greater part of them, abandoned. The value of silver was so much reduced that their produce could no longer pay the expense of working them, or replace with a profit the food, clothes, lodging, and other necessaries which were consumed in that operation. This was the case, too, with the mines of Cuba and St. Domingo, and even with the ancient mines of Peru after the discovery of those of Potosi. The price of every metal at every mine, therefore, being regulated in some measure by its price at the most fertile mine in the world that is actually wrought, it can, at the greater part of mines, do very little more than pay the expense of working, and can seldom afford a very high rent to the landlord. Rent, accordingly, seems at the greater part of mines to have but a small share in the price of the coarse, and a still smaller in that of the precious metals. Labor and profit make up the greater part of both. A sixth part of the gross produce may be reckoned the average rent of the ten mines of Cornwall, the most fertile that are known in the world, as we are told by the Rev. Mr. Borlace, vice-warden of the Stanneries. Some, he says, afford more, and some do not afford so much. A sixth part of the gross produce is the rent, too, of several very fertile lead mines in Scotland. In the silver mines of Peru, we are told by Frezier and Ulloa, the proprietor frequently exacts no other acknowledgment from the undertaker of the mine, but that he will grind the ore at his mill, paying him the ordinary mulcture or price of grinding. Till 1736, indeed, the tax of the king of Spain amounted to one-fifth of the standard silver, which till then might be considered as the real rent of the greater part of the silver mines of Peru, the richest which have been known in the world. If there had been no tax, this fifth would naturally have belonged to the landlord, and many mines might have been wrought which could not then be wrought, because they could not afford this tax. The tax of the Duke of Cornwall upon ten is supposed to amount to more than five per cent, or one twentieth part of the value, and whatever may be his proportion, it would naturally too belong to the proprietor of the mine if ten was duty free. But if you add one twentieth to one sixth, you will find that the whole average rent of the ten mines of Cornwall was to the whole average rent of the silver mines of Peru, as thirteen to twelve. But the silver mines of Peru are not now able to pay even this low rent, and the tax upon silver was, in 1736, reduced from one fifth to one tenth. Even this tax upon silver, too, gives more temptation to smuggling than the tax of one twentieth upon ten and the smuggling must be much easier in the precious than in the bulky commodity. The tax of the King of Spain, accordingly, is said to be very ill-paid, and that of the Duke of Cornwall very well. 
Rent, therefore, it is probable, makes a greater part of the price of tin at the most fertile tin mines than it does of silver at the most fertile silver mines in the world. After replacing the stock employed in working those different mines, together with its ordinary profits, the residue which remains to the proprietor is greater, it seems, in the coarse than in the precious metal. Neither are the profits of the undertakers of silver mines commonly very great in Peru. The same most respectable and well-informed authors acquaint us that when any person undertakes to work a new mine in Peru, he is universally looked upon as a man destined to bankruptcy and ruin, and is upon that account shunned and avoided by everybody. Mining, it seems, is considered there in the same light as here, as a lottery in which the prizes do not compensate the blanks, though the greatness of some tempts many adventurers to throw away their fortunes in such unprosperous projects. As the sovereign, however, derives a considerable part of his revenue from the produce of silver mines, the law in Peru gives every possible encouragement to the discovery and working of new ones. Whoever discovers a mine is entitled to measure off 246 feet in length, according to what he supposes to be the direction of the vein, and half as much in breadth. He becomes proprietor of this portion of the mine, and can work it without paying any acknowledgment to the landlord. The interest of the Duke of Cornwall has given occasion to a regulation nearly of the same kind in that ancient duchy. In waste and unenclosed lands, any person who discovers a tin mine may mark out its limits to a certain extent, which is called bounding a mine. The bounder becomes the real proprietor of the mine and may either work it himself or give it in lease to another, without the consent of the owner of the land, to whom, however, a very small acknowledgment must be paid upon working it. In both regulations, the sacred rights of private property are sacrificed to the supposed interest of public revenue. The same encouragement is given in Peru to the discovery and working of new gold mines, and in gold the king's tax amounts only to a twentieth part of the standard rental. It was once a fifth, and afterwards a tenth, as in silver, but it was found that the work could not bear even the lowest of these two taxes. If it is rare, however, say the same authors, Frazier and Ulloa, to find a person who has made his fortune by a silver, it is still much rarer to find one who has done so by a gold mine. This twentieth part seems to be the whole rent which is paid by the greater part of the gold mines of Chile and Peru. Gold, too, is much more liable to be smuggled than even silver not only on account of the superior value of the metal in proportion to its bulk, but on account of the peculiar way in which nature produces it. Silver is very seldom found virgin, but, like most other metals, is generally mineralized with some other body, from which it is impossible to separate it in such quantities as will pay for the expense, but by a very laborious and tedious operation, which cannot well be carried on but in workhouses erected for the purpose, and therefore exposed to the inspection of the king's officers. Gold, on the contrary, is almost always found virgin. It is sometimes found in pieces of some bulk, and even when mixed, in small and almost insensible particles with sand, earth, and other extraneous bodies, it can be separated from them by a very short and simple operation, which can be carried on in any private house by anybody who is possessed of a small quantity of mercury. If the king's tax, therefore, is but ill paid upon silver, it is likely to be much worse paid upon gold, and rent must make a much smaller part of the price of gold than that of silver. The lowest price at which the precious metals can be sold, or the smallest quantity of other goods for which they can be exchanged, during any considerable time, is regulated by the same principles which fix the lowest ordinary price of all other goods. The stock which must commonly be employed, the food, clothes, and lodging, which must commonly be consumed in bringing them from the mine to the market, determine it it must at least be sufficient to replace that stock with the ordinary profits. Their highest price, however, seems not to be necessarily determined by anything but the actual scarcity or plenty of these metals themselves. It is not determined by that of any other commodity, in the same manner as the price of coals is by that of wood, beyond which no scarcity can ever raise it. Increase the scarcity of gold to a certain degree, and the smallest bit of it may become more precious than a diamond, in exchange for a greater quantity of other goods. The demand for those metals arises partly from their utility, and partly from their beauty. If you accept iron, they are more useful than, perhaps, any other metal. As they are less liable to rust and impurity, they can more easily be kept clean, and the utensils, either of the table or the kitchen, are often, upon that account, more agreeable when made of them. 
a silver boiler is more cleanly than a lead, copper, or tin one, and the same quality would render a gold boiler still better than a silver one. Their principal merit, however, arises from their beauty, which renders them peculiarly fit for the ornaments of dress and furniture. No paint or dye can give so splendid a color as gilding. The merit of their beauty is greatly enhanced by their scarcity. With the greater part of rich people, the chief enjoyment of riches consists in the parade of riches, which, in their eye, is never so complete as when they appear to possess those decisive marks of opulence which nobody can possess but themselves. In their eyes, the merit of an object, which is in any degree either useful or beautiful, is greatly enhanced by its scarcity, or by the great labor which it requires to collect any considerable quantity of it, a labor which nobody can afford to pay but themselves. Such objects they are willing to purchase at a higher price than things much more beautiful and useful, but more common. These qualities of utility, beauty, and scarcity are the original foundation of the high price of those metals, or of the great quantity of other goods for which they can everywhere be exchanged. This value was antecedent to, and independent of, their being employed as coin, and was the quality which fitted them for that employment. That employment, however, by occasioning a new demand, and by diminishing the quantity which could be employed in any other way, may have afterwards contributed to keep up or increase their value. The demand for the precious stones arises altogether from their beauty. They are of no use but as ornaments, and the merit of their beauty is greatly enhanced by their scarcity, or by the difficulty and expense of getting them from the mine. Wages and profit accordingly make up, upon most occasions, almost the whole of the high price. Rent comes in, but for a very small share, frequently for no share, and the most fertile mines only afford any considerable rent. When Tavernier, a jeweller, visited the diamond mines of Golconda and Bejapur, he was informed that the sovereign of the country, for whose benefit they were wrought, had ordered all of them to be shut up except those which yielded the largest and finest stones. The other, it seems, were to the proprietor not worth the working. As the prices, both of the precious metals and of the precious stones, is regulated all over the world by their price at the most fertile mine in it, the rent which a mine of either can afford to its proprietor is in proportion not to its absolute, but to what may be called its relative fertility, or to its superiority over other mines of the same kind. If new mines were discovered as much superior to those of Potosi as they were superior to those of Europe, the value of silver might be so much degraded as to render even the mines of Potosi not worth the working. Before the discovery of the Spanish West Indies, the most fertile mines in Europe may have afforded as great a rent to their proprietors as the richest mines in Peru do at present. Though the quantity of silver was much less, it might have exchanged for an equal quantity of other goods, and the proprietor's share might have enabled him to purchase or command an equal quantity either of labor or of commodities. The value, both of the produce and of the rent, the real revenue which they afforded both to the public and to the proprietor, might have been the same. The most abundant mines, either of the precious metals or of the precious stones, could add little to the wealth of the world. A produce, of which the value is principally derived from its scarcity, is necessarily degraded by its abundance. A service of plate, and the other frivolous ornaments of dress and furniture, could be purchased for a smaller quantity of commodities, and in this would consist the sole advantage which the world could derive from that abundance. It is otherwise in estates above ground. The value both of their produce and of their rent is in proportion to their absolute, and not to their relative fertility. The land which produces a certain quantity of food, clothes, and lodging can always feed, clothe, and lodge a certain number of people, and whatever may be the proportion of the landlord, it will always give him a proportionable command of the labor of those people, and of the commodities with which that labor can supply him. The value of the most barren land is not diminished by the neighborhood of the most fertile. On the contrary, it is generally increased by it. The great number of people maintained by the fertile lands afford a market to many parts of the produce of the barren, which they could never have found among those whom their own produce could maintain. Whatever increases the fertility of land in producing food increases not only the value of the lands upon which the improvement is bestowed, but contributes likewise to increase that of many other lands, by creating a new demand for their produce. That abundance of food, of which, in consequence of the improvement of land, many people have the disposal beyond what they themselves can consume, is the great cause of the demand, 
both for the precious metals and the precious stones, as well as for every other convenience and ornament of dress, lodging, household furniture, and equipage. Food not only constitutes the principal part of the riches of the world, but it is the abundance of food which gives the principal part of their value to many other sorts of riches. The poor inhabitants of Cuba and St. Domingo, when they were first discovered by the Spaniards, used to wear little bits of gold as ornaments in their hair and other parts of their dress. They seemed to value them as we would do any little pebbles of somewhat more than ordinary beauty, and to consider them as just worth the picking up, but not worth the refusing to anybody who asked them. They gave them to their new guests at the first request, without seeming to think that they had made them any very valuable present. They were astonished to observe the rage of the Spaniards to obtain them, and had no notion that there could anywhere be a country in which many people had the disposal of so great a superfluity of food, so scanty always among themselves, that for a very small quantity of those glittering baubles they would willingly give as much as might maintain a whole family for many years. Could they have been made to understand this, the passion of the Spaniards would not have surprised them. Part 3 of the variations in the proportion between the respective values of that sort of produce which always affords rent, and of that which sometimes does, and sometimes does not, afford rent. The increasing abundance of food, in consequence of the increasing improvement and cultivation, must necessarily increase the demand for every part of the produce of land which is not food, and which can be applied either to use or to ornament. In the whole progress of improvement, it might, therefore, be expected there should be only one variation in the comparative values of those two different sorts of produce. The value of that sort which sometimes does, and sometimes does not afford rent, should constantly rise in proportion to that which always affords some rent. As art and industry advance, the materials of clothing and lodging, the useful fossils and materials of the earth, the precious metals and the precious stones, should gradually come to be more and more in demand should gradually exchange for a greater and a greater quantity of food, or, in other words, should gradually become dearer and dearer. This, accordingly, has been the case with most of these things upon most occasions, and would have been the case with all of them upon all occasions, if particular accidents had not, upon some occasions, increased the supply of some of them in a still greater proportion than the demand. The value of a freestone quarry, for example, will necessarily increase with the increasing improvement in population of the country round about it, especially if it should be the only one in the neighborhood. But the value of a silver mine, even though there should not be another within a thousand miles of it, will not necessarily increase with the improvement of the country in which it is situated. The market for the produce of a freestone quarry can seldom extend more than a few miles round about it and the demand must generally be in proportion to the improvement and population of that small district. But the market for the produce of a silver mine may extend over the whole known world. Unless the world in general, therefore, be advancing in improvement and population, the demand for silver might not be at all increased by the improvement even of a large country in the neighborhood of the mine. Even though the world in general were improving, Yet if, in the course of its improvements, new mines should be discovered, much more fertile than any which had been known before, though the demand for silver would necessarily increase, yet the supply might increase in so much greater proportion that the real price of that metal might gradually fall, that is, any given quantity, a pound weight of it, for example, might gradually purchase or command a smaller and a smaller quantity of labor, or exchange for a smaller and a smaller quantity of corn, the principal part of the subsistence of the laborer. The great market for silver is the commercial and civilized part of the world. If, by the general progress of improvement, the demand of this market should increase, while at the same time the supply did not increase in the same proportion, the value of silver would gradually rise in proportion to that of corn. Any given quantity of silver would exchange for a greater and a greater quantity of corn, or, in other words, the average money price of corn would gradually become cheaper and cheaper. If, on the contrary, the supply by some accident should increase for many years together in a greater proportion than the demand, that metal would gradually become cheaper and cheaper, or, in other words, the average money price of corn would, in spite of all improvements, gradually become dearer and dearer. 
but if on the other hand the supply of that metal should increase nearly in the same proportion as the demand it would continue to purchase or exchange for nearly the same quantity of corn and the average money price of corn would in spite of all improvements continue very nearly the same these three seem to exhaust all the possible combinations of events which can happen in the progress of improvement and during the course of the four centuries preceding the present if we may judge by what has happened both in france and great britain each of those three different combinations seems to have taken place in the european market and nearly in the same order too in which i have here set them down end of book one chapter eleven part two Part three of chapter eleven of book one of the wealth of nations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Part three of chapter eleven of book one of the rent of land. Digression concerning the variations in the value of silver during the course of the four last centuries. First period. In 1350, and for some time before, the average price of the quarter of wheat in England seems not to have been estimated lower than four ounces of silver, tower weight, equal to about twenty shillings of our present money. From this price it seems to have fallen gradually to two ounces of silver, equal to about ten shillings of our present money the price at which we find it estimated in the beginning of the sixteenth century and at which it seems to have continued to be estimated till about fifteen seventy in thirteen fifty being the twenty-fifth of edward the third was enacted what is called the statute of labourers in the preamble it complains much of the insolence of servants who endeavoured to raise their wages upon their masters it therefore ordains that all servants and labourers should for the future be contented with the same wages and liveries liveries in those times signified not only clothes but provisions which they had been accustomed to receive in the twentieth year of the king and the four preceding years that upon this account their livery wheat should nowhere be estimated higher than ten pence a bushel and that it should always be in the option of the master to deliver them either the wheat or the money ten pence a bushel therefore had in the twenty-fifth of edward the third been reckoned to a very moderate price of wheat since it required a particular statute to oblige servants to accept of it in exchange for their usual livery of provisions and it had been reckoned a reasonable price ten years before that or in the sixteenth year of the king the term to which the statute refers but in the sixteenth year of edward the third ten pence contained about half an ounce of silver tower weight and was nearly equal to half a crown of our present money four ounces of silver tower weight therefore equal to six shillings and eight pence of the money of those times and to near twenty shillings of that of the present must have been reckoned a moderate price for the quarter of eight bushels this statute is surely a better evidence of what was reckoned in those times a moderate price of grain than the prices of some particular years which have generally been recorded by historians and other writers on account of their extraordinary dearness or cheapness and from which therefore it is difficult to form any judgment concerning what may have been the ordinary price there are besides other reasons for believing that in the beginning of the fourteenth century and for some time before the common price of wheat was not less than four ounces of silver the quarter and that of other grain in proportion in thirteen o nine ralph de borne prior of st augustine's canterbury gave a feast upon his installation day of which william thorne has preserved not only the bill of fare but the prices of many particulars in that feast were consumed first fifty-three quarters of wheat which cost nineteen pounds or seven shillings and two pence a quarter equal to about one and twenty shillings and sixpence of our present money secondly fifty-eight quarters of malt which cost seventeen pounds ten shillings or six shillings a quarter equal to about eighteen shillings of our present money thirdly twenty quarters of oats which cost four pounds or four shillings a quarter equal to about twelve shillings of our present money the prices of malt and oats seem here to lie higher than their ordinary proportion to the price of wheat these prices are not recorded on account of their extraordinary dearness or cheapness but are mentioned accidentally as the prices actually paid for large quantities of grain consumed at a feast which was famous for its magnificence 
in twelve sixty two being the fifty first of henry the third was revived an ancient statute called the assize of bread and ale which the king says in the preamble had been made in the times of his progenitors some time kings of england it is probably therefore as old at least as the time of his grandfather henry the second and may have been as old as the conquest it regulates the price of bread according as the prices of wheat may happen to be from one shilling to twenty shillings the quarter of the money of those times but statutes of this kind are generally presumed to provide with equal care for all deviations from the middle price for those below it as well as for those above it ten shillings therefore containing six ounces of silver tower weight and equal to about thirty shillings of our present money must upon this supposition have been reckoned the middle price of the quarter of wheat when this statute was first enacted and must have continued to be so in the fifty first of henry the third we cannot therefore be very wrong in supposing that the middle price was not less than one third of the highest price at which this statute regulates the price of bread or than six shillings and eightpence of the money of those times containing four ounces of silver tower weight from these different facts therefore we seem to have some reason to conclude that about the middle of the fourteenth century and for a considerable time before the average or ordinary price of the quarter of wheat was not supposed to be less than four ounces of silver tower weight from about the middle of the fourteenth to the beginning of the sixteenth century what was reckoned the reasonable and moderate that is the ordinary or average price of wheat seems to have sunk gradually to about one half of this price so as at last to have fallen to about two ounces of silver tower weight equal to about ten shillings of our present money it continued to be estimated at this price till about fifteen seventy in the household book of henry the fifth earl of northumberland drawn up in fifteen twelve there are two different estimations of wheat in one of them it is computed at six shilling and eight pence the quarter in the other at five shillings and eight pence only in fifteen twelve six shillings and eight pence contained only two ounces of silver tower weight and were equal to about ten shillings of our present money from the twenty fifth of edward the third to the beginning of the reign of elizabeth during the space of more than two hundred years six shillings and eight pence it appears from several different statutes had continued to be considered as what is called the moderate and reasonable that is the ordinary or average price of wheat the quantity of silver however contained in that nominal sum was during the course of this period continually diminishing in consequence of some alterations which were made in the coin but the increase of the value of silver had it seems so far compensated the diminution of the quantity of it contained in the same nominal sum that the legislature did not think it worth while to attend to this circumstance thus in fourteen thirty six it was enacted that wheat might be exported without a license when the price was so low as six shillings and eightpence and in fourteen sixty three it was enacted that no wheat should be imported if the price was not above six shillings and eightpence the quarter the legislature had imagined that when the price was so low there could be no inconveniency in exportation but that when it rose higher it became prudent to allow of importation six shillings and eight pence therefore containing about the same quantity of silver as thirteen shillings and four pence of our present money one third part less than the same nominal sum contained in the time of edward the third had in those times been considered as what is called the moderate and reasonable price of wheat in fifteen fifty four by the first and second of philip and mary and in fifteen fifty eight by the first of elizabeth the exportation of wheat was in the same manner prohibited whenever the price of the quarter should exceed six shillings and eightpence which did not then contain two penny worth more silver than the same nominal sum does at present but it had soon been found that to restrain the exportation of wheat till the price was so very low was in reality to prohibit it altogether in fifteen sixty two therefore by the fifth of elizabeth the exportation of wheat was allowed from certain ports whenever the price of the quarter should not exceed ten shillings containing nearly the same quantity of silver as the like nominal sum does at present this price had at this time therefore been considered as what is called the moderate and reasonable price of wheat it agrees nearly with the estimation of the northumberland book in fifteen twelve that in france the average price of grain was in the same manner much lower in the end of the fifteenth and beginning of the sixteenth century than in the two centuries preceding has been observed both by mr dupre de saint mar and by the elegant author of the essay on the policy of grain its price during the same period had probably sunk in the same manner through the greater part of europe 
This rise in the value of silver, in proportion to that of corn, may either have been owing altogether to the increase of the demand for that metal, in consequence of increasing improvement and cultivation, the supply, in the meantime, continuing the same as before, or, the demand continuing the same as before, it may have been owing altogether to the gradual diminution of the supply, the greater part of the mines which were then known in the world being much exhausted, and, consequently, the expense of working them much increased or it may have been owing partly to the one and partly to the other of those two circumstances. In the end of the fifteenth and beginning of the sixteenth centuries, the greater part of Europe was approaching towards a more settled form of government than it had enjoyed for several ages before. The increase of security would naturally increase industry and improvement, and the demand for the precious metals, as well as for every other luxury and ornament, would naturally increase with the increase of riches. A greater annual produce would require a greater quantity of coin to circulate it, and a greater number of rich people would require a greater quantity of plate and other ornaments of silver. It is natural to suppose, too, that the greater part of the mines which then supplied the European market with silver might be a good deal exhausted, and have become more expensive in the working. They had been wrought, many of them, from the time of the Romans." It has been the opinion, however, of the greater part of those who have written upon the prices of commodities in ancient times, that, from the conquest, perhaps from the invasion of Julius Caesar, till the discovery of the mines of America, the value of silver was continually diminishing. This opinion they seem to have been led into, partly by the observations which they had occasion to make upon the prices both of corn and of some other parts of the rude produce of land, and partly by the popular notion, that as the quantity of silver naturally increases in every country with the increase of wealth, so its value diminishes as its quantity increases. In their observations upon the prices of corn, three different circumstances seem frequently to have misled them. First, in ancient times, almost all rents were paid in kind, in a certain quantity of corn, cattle, poultry, etc. It sometimes happened, however, that the landlord would stipulate that he should be at liberty to demand of the tenant either the annual payment in kind or a certain sum of money instead of it. The price at which the payment in kind was in this manner exchanged for a certain sum of money is in Scotland called the conversion price. As the option is always in the landlord to take either the substance or the price, it is necessary, for the safety of the tenant, that the conversion price should rather be below than above the average market price. In many places, accordingly, it is not much above one-half of this price. Through the greater part of Scotland, this custom still continues with regard to poultry, and in some places with regard to cattle. It might probably have continued to take place, too, with regard to corn, had not the institution of public fires put an end to it. These are annual valuations, according to the judgment of an assize, of the average price of all the different sorts of grain, and of all the different qualities of each, according to the actual market price in every different county. This institution rendered it sufficiently safe for the tenant, and much more convenient for the landlord, to convert, as they call it, the corn rent rather at what should happen to be the price of the fires of each year, than at any certain fixed price. But the writers who have collected the prices of corn in ancient times seem frequently to have mistaken what is called in Scotland the conversion price for the actual market price. Fleetwood acknowledges, upon one occasion, that he had made this mistake. As he wrote his book, however, for a particular purpose he does not think proper to make this acknowledgment till after transcribing this conversion price fifteen times. The price is eight shillings the quarter of wheat. This sum, in 1423, the year at which he begins with it, contained the same quantity of silver as sixteen shillings of our present money. But in 1562, the year at which he ends with it, it contained no more than the same nominal sum does at present. Secondly, they have been misled by the slovenly manner in which some ancient statutes of a size had been sometimes transcribed by lazy copiers, and sometimes, perhaps, actually composed by the legislature. The ancient statutes of a size seem to have begun always with determining what ought to be the price of bread and ale when the price of wheat and barley were at the lowest, and to have proceeded gradually to determine what it ought to be, according as the prices of those two sorts of grain should gradually rise above this lowest price. But the transcribers of those statutes seem frequently to have thought it sufficient to copy the regulation as far as the three or four first and lowest prices, saving in this manner their own labor and judging, I suppose, that this was enough to show what proportion ought to be observed in all higher places. 
Thus, in the assize of bread and ale, of the 51st of Henry the Third, the price of bread was regulated according to the different prices of wheat, from one shilling to twenty shillings the quarter of the money of those times. But in the manuscripts from which all the different editions of the statutes, preceding that of Mr. Ruffhead, were printed, the copiers had never transcribed this regulation beyond the price of twelve shillings. Several writers, therefore, being misled by this faulty transcription, very naturally conclude that the middle price, or six shillings the quarter, equal to about eighteen shillings of our present money, was the ordinary or average price of wheat at that time. In the statute of Tumbrel and Pillory, enacted nearly about the same time, the price of ale is regulated according to every sixpence rise in the price of barley, from two shillings to four shillings the quarter. That four shillings, however, was not considered as the highest price to which barley might frequently rise in those times, and that these prices were only given as an example of the proportion which ought to be observed in all other prices, whether higher or lower, we may infer from the last words of the statute, et sic deing hips crescitur vel diminutur per sex denarios. The expression is very slovenly, but the meaning is plain enough that the price of ale is in this manner to be increased or diminished according to every sixpence rise or fall in the price of barley. In the composition of this statute, the legislature itself seems to have been as negligent as the copiers were in the transcription of the other. In an ancient manuscript of the Regium Majestatum, an old Scotch law book, there is a statute of a size in which the price of bread is regulated according to all the different prices of wheat, from ten pence to three shillings the Scotch bowl, equal to about half an English quarter. Three shillings scotch, at the time when this assize is supposed to have been enacted, were equal to about nine shillings sterling of our present money. Mr. Rudiman seems to conclude from this that three shillings was the highest price to which wheat ever rose in those times, and that ten pence, a shilling, or at most two shillings, were the ordinary prices. Upon consulting the manuscript, however, it appears evidently that all these prices are only set down as examples of the proportion which ought to be observed between the respective prices of wheat and bread. The last words of the statute are, You shall judge of the remaining cases according to what is above written, having respect to the price of corn. Thirdly, they seem to have been misled, too, by the very low price at which wheat was sometimes sold in very ancient times, and to have imagined that as its lowest price was then much lower than in later times, its ordinary price must likewise have been much lower. They might have found, however, that in those ancient times its highest price was fully as much above as its lowest price was below anything that had ever been known in later times. Thus, in 1270, Fleetwood gives us two prices of the quarter of wheat. The one is four pounds sixteen shillings of the money of those times, equal to fourteen pounds eight shillings of that of the present. The other is six pounds eight shillings, equal to nineteen pounds four shillings of our present money. No price can be found in the end of the fifteenth or beginning of the sixteenth century, which approaches to the extravagance of these. The price of corn, though at all times liable to variation, varies most in those turbulent and disorderly societies, in which the interruption of all commerce and communication hinders the plenty of one part of the country from relieving the scarcity of another. In the disorderly state of England, under the Plantagenet, who governed it from about the middle of the twelfth till towards the end of the fifteenth century, one district might be in plenty, while another, at no great distance, by having its crop destroyed, either by some accident of the seasons, or by the incursion of some neighboring baron, might be suffering all the horrors of a famine. And yet, if the lands of some hostile lord were interposed between them, the one might not be able to give the least assistance to the other. Under the vigorous administration of the Tudors, who governed England during the latter part of the fifteenth and through the whole of the sixteenth century, no baron was powerful enough to dare disturb the public security. The reader will find at the end of this chapter all the prices of wheat which have been collected by Fleetwood, from 1202 to 1597, both inclusive, reduced to the money of the present times, and digested, according to the order of time, into seven divisions of twelve years each. At the end of each division, too, he will find the average price of the twelve years of which it consists. In that long period of time, Fleetwood has been able to collect the prices of no more than eighty years, so that four years are wanting to make out the last twelve years. I have added, therefore, from the accounts of Eton College, the prices of 1598, 1599, 
sixteen hundred and sixteen o one it is the only edition which i have made the reader will see that from the beginning of the thirteenth till after the middle of the sixteenth century the average price of each twelve years grows gradually lower and lower and that towards the end of the sixteenth century it begins to rise again the prices indeed which fleetwood has been able to collect seem to have been those chiefly which were remarkable for extraordinary dearness or cheapness and i do not pretend that any very certain conclusion can be drawn from them so far however as they prove anything at all they confirm the account which i have been endeavouring to give fleetwood himself however seems with most other writers to have believed that during all this period the value of silver in consequence of its increasing abundance was continually diminishing the prices of corn which he himself has collected certainly do not agree with this opinion they agree perfectly with that of mr dupre de saint and with that which i have been endeavouring to explain bishop fleetwood and mr dupre de saint are the two authors who seem to have collected with the greatest diligence and fidelity the prices of things in ancient times it is somewhat curious that though their opinions are so very different their facts so far as they relate to the price of corn at least should coincide so very exactly it is not however so much from the low price of corn as from that of some other parts of the rude produce of land that the most judicious writers have inferred the great value of silver in those very ancient times corn it has been said being a sort of manufacture was in those rude ages much dearer in proportion than the greater part of other commodities it is meant i suppose than the greater part of unmanufactured commodities such as cattle poultry game of all kinds etc that in those times of poverty and barbarism these were proportionably much cheaper than corn is undoubtedly true but this cheapness was not the effect of the high value of silver but of the low value of those commodities it was not because silver would in such times purchase or represent a greater quantity of labour but because such commodities would purchase or represent a much smaller quantity than in times of more opulence and improvement silver must certainly be cheaper in spanish america than in europe in the country where it is produced than in the country to which it is brought at the expense of a long carriage both by land and by sea of a freight and an insurance one and twenty pence halfpenny sterling however we are told by ulloa was not many years ago at buenos aires the price of an ox chosen from a herd of three or four hundred sixteen shillings sterling we are told by mr byron was the price of a good horse in the capital of chile in a country naturally fertile but of which the far greater part is altogether uncultivated cattle poultry game of all kinds etc as they can be acquired with a very small quantity of labour so they will purchase or command but a very small quantity the low money price for which they may be sold is no proof that the real value of silver is there very high but that the real value of those commodities is very low labour it must always be remembered and not any particular commodity or set of commodities is the real measure of the value both of silver and of all other commodities but in countries almost waste or but thinly inhabited cattle poultry game of all kinds etc as they are the spontaneous productions of nature so she frequently produces them in much greater quantities than the consumption of the inhabitants requires in such a state of things the supply commonly exceeds the demand in different states of society in different states of improvement therefore such commodities will represent or be equivalent to very different quantities of labour in every state of society in every stage of improvement corn is the production of human industry but the average produce of every sort of industry is always suited more or less exactly to the average consumption the average supply to the average demand in every different stage of improvement besides the raising of equal quantities of corn in the same soil and climate will at an average require nearly equal quantities of labour or what comes to the same thing the price of nearly equal quantities the continual increase of the productive powers of labour in an improved state of cultivation being more or less counterbalanced by the continual increasing price of cattle the principal instruments of agriculture upon all these accounts therefore we may rest assured that equal quantities of corn will in every state of society in every stage of improvement more nearly represent or be equivalent to equal quantities of labour than equal quantities of any other part of the rude produce of land corn accordingly it has already been observed is in all the different stages of wealth and improvement a more accurate measure of value than any other commodity or set of commodities 
In all those different stages, therefore, we can judge better of the real value of silver by comparing it with corn than by comparing it with any other commodity or set of commodities. Corn, besides, or whatever else is the common and favorite vegetable food of the people, constitutes in every civilized country the principal part of the subsistence of the laborer. In consequence of the extension of agriculture, the land of every country produces a much greater quantity of vegetable than of animal food, and the laborer everywhere lives chiefly upon the wholesome food that is cheapest and most abundant. Butcher's meat, except in the most thriving countries, or where labor is most highly rewarded, makes but an insignificant part of his subsistence. Poultry makes a still smaller part of it, and game no part of it. In France, and even in Scotland, where labor is somewhat better rewarded than in France, the laboring poor seldom eat butcher's meat, except upon holidays and other extraordinary occasions. The money price of labor, therefore, depends much more upon the average money price of corn, the subsistence of the labor, than upon that of butcher's meat, or of any other part of the rude produce of land. The real value of gold and silver, therefore, the real quantity of labor which they can purchase or command, depends much more upon the quantity of corn which they can purchase or command than upon that of butcher's meat or any other part of the rude produce of land. Such slight observations, however, upon the prices either of corn or of other commodities, would not probably have misled so many intelligent authors, had they not been influenced at the same time by the popular notion that as the quantity of silver naturally increases in every country with the increase of wealth, so its value diminishes as its quantity increases. This notion, however, seems to be altogether groundless. The quantity of the precious metals may increase in any country from two different causes, either, first, from the increased abundance of the mines which supply it, or, secondly, from the increased wealth of the people, from the increased produce of their annual labor. The first of these causes is no doubt necessarily connected with the diminution of the value of the precious metals, but the second is not. When more abundant mines are discovered, a greater quantity of the precious metals is brought to market, and the quantity of the necessaries and conveniencies of life for which they must be exchanged being the same as before, equal quantities of the metals must be exchanged for smaller quantities of commodities. So far, therefore, as the increase of the quantity of the precious metals in any country arises from the increased abundance of the mines, it is necessarily connected with some diminution of their value. When, on the contrary, the wealth of any country increases, when the annual produce of its labor becomes gradually greater and greater, a greater quantity of coin becomes necessary in order to circulate a greater quantity of commodities. And the people, as they can afford it, as they have more commodities to give for it, will naturally purchase a greater and a greater quantity of plate. The quantity of their coin will increase from necessity, the quantity of their plate from vanity and ostentation or from the same reason that the quantity of fine statues, pictures, and of every other luxury and curiosity is likely to increase among them. But as statuaries and painters are not likely to be worse rewarded in times of wealth and prosperity than in times of poverty and depression, so gold and silver are not likely to be worse paid for. The price of gold and silver, when the accidental discovery of more abundant mines does not keep it down, as it naturally rises with the wealth of every country, so whatever be the state of the mines, it is at all times naturally higher in a rich than in a poor country. Gold and silver, like all other commodities, naturally seek the market where the best price is given for them, and the best price is commonly given for everything in the country which can best afford it. Labor, it must be remembered, is the ultimate price which is paid for everything. And in countries where labor is equally well rewarded, the money price of labor will be in proportion to that of the subsistence of the laborer. But gold and silver will naturally exchange for a greater quantity of subsistence in a rich than in a poor country, in a country which abounds with subsistence than in one which is but indifferently supplied with it. If the two countries are at a great distance, the difference may be very great, because, though the metals naturally fly from the worse to the better market, yet it may be difficult to transport them in such quantities as to bring their price nearly to a level in both. If the countries are near, the difference will be smaller, and may sometimes be scarce perceptible, because in this case the transportation will be easy. China is a much richer country than any part of Europe, and the difference between the price of subsistence in China and in Europe is very great. Rice in China is much cheaper than wheat is anywhere in Europe. 
England is a much richer country than Scotland, but the difference between the money price of corn in those two countries is much smaller, and is but just perceptible. In proportion to the quantity or measure, Scotch corn generally appears to be a good deal cheaper than English, but in proportion to its quality it is certainly somewhat dearer. Scotland receives almost every year very large supplies from England, and every commodity must commonly be somewhat dearer in the country to which it is brought than in that from which it comes. English corn, therefore, must be dearer in Scotland than in England, and yet in proportion to its quality, or to the quantity and goodness of the flour or meal which can be made from it, it cannot commonly be sold higher there than the Scotch corn which comes to market in competition with it. The difference between the money price of labor in China and in Europe is still greater than that between the money price of subsistence, because the real recompense of labor is higher in Europe than in China, the greater part of Europe being in an improving state, while China seems to be standing still. The money price of labor is lower in Scotland than in England, because the real recompense of labor is much lower. Scotland, though advancing to greater wealth, advances much more slowly than England. The frequency of immigration from Scotland, and the rarity of it from England, sufficiently prove that the demand for labor is very different in the two countries. The proportion between the real recompense of labor in different countries, it must be remembered, is naturally regulated, not by their actual wealth or poverty, but by their advancing, stationary, or declining condition. Gold and silver, as they are naturally of the greatest value among the richest, so they are naturally of the least value among the poorest nations. Among savages, the poorest of all nations, they are scarce of any value. In great towns, corn is always dearer than in remote parts of the country. This, however, is the effect, not of the real cheapness of silver, but of the real dearness of corn. It does not cost less labor to bring silver to the great town than to the remote parts of the country, but it costs a great deal more to bring corn. In some very rich and commercial countries, such as Holland and the territory of Genoa, corn is dear for the same reason that it is dear in great towns. They do not produce enough to maintain their inhabitants. They are rich in the industry and skill of their artificers and manufacturers, in every sort of machinery which can facilitate and abridge labor, in shipping and in all the other instruments and means of carriage and commerce. But they are poor in corn which, as it must be brought to them from distant countries, must, by an addition to its price, pay for the carriage from those countries. It does not cost less labor to bring silver to Amsterdam than to Danzig, but it costs a great deal more to bring corn. The real cost of silver must be nearly the same in both places, but that of corn must be very different. Diminish the real opulence either of Holland or of the territory of Genoa, while the number of the inhabitants remains the same, diminish their power of supplying themselves from distant countries, and the price of corn, instead of sinking with that diminution in the quantity of their silver, which must necessarily accompany this declension, either as its cause or as its effect, will rise to the price of a famine. When we are in want of necessities, we must part with all superfluities, of which the value, as it rises in times of opulence and prosperity, so it sinks in times of poverty and distress. It is otherwise with necessaries. The real price, the quantity of labor which they can purchase or command, rises in times of poverty and distress, and sinks in times of opulence and prosperity, which are always times of great abundance, for they could not otherwise be times of opulence and prosperity. Corn is a necessary, silver is only a superfluity. Whatever, therefore, may have been the increase in the quantity of the precious metals which, during the period between the middle of the fourteenth and that of the sixteenth century, arose from the increase of wealth and improvement, it could have no tendency to diminish their value either in Great Britain or in any other part of Europe. If those who have collected the prices of things in ancient times, therefore, had, during this period, no reason to infer the diminution of the value of silver from any observations which they had made upon the prices either of corn or of other commodities, they had still less reason to infer it from any supposed increase of wealth and improvement. Second period. But how various soever may have been the opinions of the learned concerning the progress of the value of silver during the first period, they are unanimous concerning it during the second. From about 1570 to about 1640, during a period of about 70 years, the variation in the proportion between the value of silver and that of corn held a quite opposite course. Silver sunk in its real value, 
or would exchange for a smaller quantity of labour than before and corn rose in its nominal price and instead of being commonly sold for about two ounces of silver the quarter or about ten shillings of our present money came to be sold for six and eight ounces of silver the quarter or about thirty and forty shillings of our present money the discovery of the abundant mines of america seems to have been the sole cause of this diminution in the value of silver in proportion to that of corn it is accounted for accordingly in the same manner by everybody and there never has been any dispute either about the fact or about the cause of it the greater part of europe was during this period advancing in industry and improvement and the demand for silver must consequently have been increasing but the increase of the supply had it seems so far exceeding that of the demand that the value of that metal sunk considerably the discovery of the mines of america it is to be observed does not seem to have had any very sensible effect upon the prices of things in england till after fifteen seventy though even the mines of potosi had been discovered more than twenty years before from fifteen ninety five to sixteen twenty both inclusive the average price of the quarter of nine bushels of the best wheat at windsor market appears from the accounts of eton college to have been two pounds one shilling six and nine thirteenth pence from which sum neglecting the fraction and deducting a ninth or four shillings seven and one third pence the price of the quarter of eight bushels comes out to have been one pound sixteen shillings and ten and two third pence and from this sum neglecting likewise the fraction and deducting a ninth or four shillings one and one ninth pence for the difference between the price of the best wheat and that of the middle wheat the price of the middle wheat comes out to have been about one pound twelve shillings eight and eight ninth pence or about six ounces and one third of an ounce of silver from sixteen twenty one to sixteen thirty six both inclusive the average price of the same measure of the best wheat at the same market appears from the same accounts to have been two pound ten shillings from which making the like deductions as in the foregoing case the average price of the quarter of eight bushels of middle wheat comes out to have been one pound nineteen shilling sixpence or about seven ounces and two-thirds of an ounce of silver end of book one chapter eleven part three part four of chapter eleven of book one of the wealth of nations this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by stephen escalera the wealth of nations by adam smith part four of chapter eleven of book one of the rent of land third period between sixteen thirty and sixteen forty or about sixteen thirty six the effect of the discovery of the mines of america in reducing the value of silver appears to have been completed and the value of that metal seems never to have sunk lower in proportion to that of corn than it was about that time it seems to have risen somewhat in the course of the present century and it had probably begun to do so even some time before the end of the last from sixteen thirty seven to seventeen hundred both inclusive being the sixty-four last years of the last century the average price of the quarter of nine bushels of the best wheat at windsor market appears from the same accounts to have been two pound eleven shillings and a third pence which is only one shilling and one third pence dearer than it had been during the sixteen years before but in the course of these sixty-four years there happened two events which must have produced a much greater scarcity of corn than what the course of the seasons would otherwise have occasioned and which therefore without supposing any further reduction in the value of silver will much more than account for this very small enhancement of price the first of these events was the civil war which by discouraging tillage and interrupting commerce must have raised the price of corn much above what the course of the seasons would otherwise have occasioned it must have had this effect more or less at all the different markets in the kingdom but particularly at those in the neighbourhood of london which require to be supplied from the greatest distance in sixteen forty eight accordingly the price of the best wheat at windsor market appears from the same accounts to have been four pound five shillings and in sixteen forty nine to have been four pound the quarter of nine bushels the excess of those two years above two pound ten shillings the average price of the sixteen years preceding sixteen thirty seven is three pounds five shillings 
which divided among the sixty-four last years of the last century will alone very nearly account for that small enhancement of price which seems to have taken place in them these however though the highest are by no means the only high prices which seem to have been occasioned by the civil wars the second event was the bounty upon the exportation of corn granted in sixteen eighty eight the bounty it has been thought by many people by encouraging tillage may in a long course of years have occasioned a greater abundance and consequently a greater cheapness of corn in the home market than what would otherwise have taken place there how far the bounty could produce this effect at any time i shall examine hereafter i shall only observe at present that between sixteen eighty eight and seventeen hundred it had not time to produce any such effect during this short period its only effect must have been by encouraging the exportation of the surplus produce of every year and thereby hindering the abundance of one year from compensating the scarcity of another to raise the price in the home market the scarcity which prevailed in england from sixteen ninety three to sixteen ninety nine both inclusive though no doubt principally owing to the badness of the seasons and therefore extending through a considerable part of europe must have been somewhat enhanced by the bounty in sixteen ninety nine accordingly the further exportation of corn was prohibited for nine months there was a third event which occurred in the course of the same period and which though it could not occasion any scarcity of corn nor perhaps any augmentation in the real quantity of silver which was usually paid for it must necessarily have occasioned some augmentation in the nominal sum this event was the great debasement of the silver coin by clipping and wearing this evil had begun in the reign of charles the second and had gone on continually increasing till sixteen ninety five at which time as we may learn from mr lowndes the current silver coin was at an average near five and twenty per cent below its standard value but the nominal sum which constitutes the market price of every commodity is necessarily regulated not so much by the quantity of silver which according to the standard ought to be contained in it as by that which it is found by experience actually is contained in it this nominal sum therefore is necessarily higher when the coin is much debased by clipping and wearing than when near to its standard value in the course of the present century the silver coin has not at any time been more below its standard weight than it is at present but though very much defaced its value has been kept up by that of the gold coin for which it is exchanged for though before the late recoinage the gold coin was a good deal defaced too it was less so than the silver in sixteen ninety five on the contrary the value of the silver coin was not kept up by the gold coin a guinea then commonly exchanging for thirty shillings of the worn and clipped silver before the late recoinage of the gold the price of silver bullion was seldom higher than five shillings and sixpence an ounce which is but five pence above the mint price but in sixteen ninety five the common price of silver bullion was six shillings and five pence an ounce which is fifteen pence above the mint price even before the late recoinage of the gold therefore the coin gold and silver together when compared with silver bullion was not supposed to be more than eight per cent below its standard value in sixteen ninety five on the contrary it had been supposed to be near five and twenty per cent below that value but in the beginning of the present century that is immediately after the great recoinage in king william's time the greater part of the current silver coin must have been still nearer to its standard weight than it is at present in the course of the present century too there has been no great public calamity such as a civil war which could either discourage tillage or interrupt the interior commerce of the country and though the bounty which has taken place through the greater part of this century must always raise the price of corn somewhat higher than it otherwise would be in the actual state of tillage yet as in the course of this century the bounty has had full time to produce all the good effects commonly imputed to it to encourage tillage and thereby to increase the quantity of corn in the home market it may upon the principles of a system which i shall explain and examine hereafter be supposed to have done something to lower the price of that commodity the one way as well as to raise it the other it is by many people supposed to have done more in the sixty-four years of the present century accordingly the average price of the quarter of nine bushels of the best wheat at windsor market appears by the accounts of eton college to have been two pound six and ten thirty-second pence which is about ten shillings and sixpence or more than five and twenty per cent cheaper than it had been during the sixty-four last years of the last century
and about nine shillings and sixpence cheaper than it had been during the sixteen years preceding sixteen thirty six when the discovery of the abundant mines of america may be supposed to have produced its full effect and about one shilling cheaper than it had been in the twenty-six years preceding sixteen twenty before that discovery can well be supposed to have produced its full effect according to this account the average price of middle wheat during the sixty-four first years of the present century comes out to have been about thirty-two shillings the quarter of eight bushels the value of silver therefore seems to have risen somewhat in proportion to that of corn during the course of the present century and it had probably begun to do so even some time before the end of the last in sixteen eighty seven the price of the quarter of nine bushels of the best wheat at windsor market was one pound five shillings twopence the lowest price at which it had ever been from fifteen ninety five in sixteen eighty eight mr gregory king a man famous for his knowledge in matters of this kind estimated the average price of wheat in years of moderate plenty to be to the grower three shillings sixpence the bushel or eighty and twenty shillings the quarter the grower's price i understand to be the same with what is sometimes called the contract price or the price at which a farmer contracts for a certain number of years to deliver a certain quantity of corn to a dealer as a contract of this kind saves the farmer the expense and trouble of marketing the contract price is generally lower than what is supposed to be the average market price mr king had judged eight and twenty shillings the quarter to be at that time the ordinary contract price in years of moderate plenty before the scarcity occasioned by the late extraordinary course of bad seasons it was i have been assured the ordinary contract price in all common years in sixteen eighty eight was granted the parliamentary bounty upon the exportation of corn the country gentlemen who then composed a still greater proportion of the legislature than they do at present had felt that the money price of corn was falling the bounty was an expedient to raise it artificially to the high price at which it had frequently been sold in the times of charles i and second it was to take place therefore till wheat was so high as forty-eight shillings the quarter that is twenty shillings or five-sevenths dearer than mr king had in that very year estimated the grower's price to be in times of moderate plenty if his calculations deserve any part of the reputation which they have obtained very universally eight and forty shillings the quarter was a price which without some such expedient as the bounty could not at that time be expected except in years of extraordinary scarcity but the government of king william was not then fully settled it was in no condition to refuse anything to the country gentlemen from whom it was at that very time soliciting the first establishment of the annual land tax the value of silver therefore in proportion to that of corn had probably risen somewhat before the end of the last century and it seems to have continued to do so during the course of the greater part of the present though the necessary operation of the bounty must have hindered that rise from being so sensible as it otherwise would have been in the actual state of tillage in plentiful years the bounty by occasioning an extraordinary exportation necessarily raises the price of corn above what it otherwise would be in those years to encourage tillage by keeping up the price of corn even in the most plentiful years was the avowed end of the institution in years of great scarcity indeed the bounty has generally been suspended it must however have had some effect upon the prices of many of those years by the extraordinary exportation which it occasions in years of plenty it must frequently hinder the plenty of one year from compensating the scarcity of another both in years of plenty and in years of scarcity therefore the bounty raises the price of corn above what it naturally would be in the actual state of tillage if during the sixty-four first years of the present century therefore the average price has been lower than during the sixty-four last years of the last century it must in the same state of tillage have been much more so had it not been for this operation of the bounty but without the bounty it may be said the state of tillage would not have been the same what may have been the effects of this institution upon the agriculture of the country i shall endeavour to explain hereafter when i come to treat particularly of bounties i shall only observe at present that this rise in the value of silver in proportion to that of corn has not been peculiar to england it has been observed to have taken place in france during the same period and nearly in the same proportion too by three very faithful diligent and laborious collectors of the prices of corn mr dupree de Semont, mr Messance, and the author of the essay on the police of grain 
but in france till seventeen sixty four the exportation of grain was by law prohibited and it is somewhat difficult to suppose that nearly the same diminution of price which took place in one country notwithstanding this prohibition should in another be owing to the extraordinary encouragement given to exportation it would be more proper perhaps to consider this variation in the average money price of corn as the effect rather of some gradual rise in the real value of silver in the european market than of any fall in the real average value of corn corn it has already been observed is at distant periods of time a more accurate measure of value than either silver or perhaps any other commodity when after the discovery of the abundant mines of america corn rose to three and four times its former money price this change was universally ascribed not to any rise in the real value of corn but to a fall in the real value of silver if during the sixty-four first years of the present century therefore the average money price of corn has fallen somewhat below what it had been during the greater part of the last century we should in the same manner impute this change not to any fall in the real value of corn but to some rise in the real value of silver in the european market the high price of corn during these ten or twelve years past indeed has occasioned a suspicion that the real value of silver still continues to fall in the european market this high price of corn however seems evidently to have been the effect of the extraordinary unfavorableness of the seasons and ought therefore to be regarded not as a permanent but as a transitory and occasional event the seasons for these ten or twelve years past have been unfavorable through the greater part of europe and the disorders of poland have very much increased the scarcity in all those countries which in dear years used to be supplied from that market so long a course of bad seasons though not a very common event is by no means a singular one and whoever has inquired much into the history of the prices of corn in former times will be at no loss to recollect several other examples of the same kind ten years of extraordinary scarcity besides are not more wonderful than ten years of extraordinary plenty the low price of corn from seventeen forty one to seventeen fifty both inclusive may very well be set in opposition to its high price during these last eight or ten years from seventeen forty one to seventeen fifty the average price of the quarter of nine bushels of the best wheat at windsor market it appears from the accounts of eton college was only one pound thirteen shillings nine and four fifths pence which is nearly six shillings three pence below the average price of the sixty-four first years of the present century the average price of the quarter of eight bushels of middle wheat comes out according to this account to have been during these ten years only one pound six shillings eight pence between seventeen forty one and seventeen fifty however the bounty must have hindered the price of corn from falling so low in the home market as it naturally would have done during these ten years the quantity of all sorts of grain exported it appears from the custom-house books amounted to no less than eight million twenty nine thousand one hundred and fifty six quarters one bushel the bounty paid for this amounted to one million five hundred and fourteen thousand nine hundred and sixty two pounds seventeen shillings four and a half pence in seventeen forty nine accordingly mr pelham at that time prime minister observed to the house of commons that for the three years preceding a very extraordinary sum had been paid as bounty for the exportation of corn he had good reason to make this observation and in the following year he might have had still better in that single year the bounty paid amounted to no less than three hundred and twenty four thousand one hundred and seventy six pounds ten shillings sixpence it is unnecessary to observe how much this forced exportation must have raised the price of corn above what it otherwise would have been in the home market at the end of the accounts annexed to this chapter the reader will find the particular account of those ten years separated from the rest he will find there too the particular account of the preceding ten years of which the average is likewise below though not so much below the general average of the sixty-four first years of the century the year seventeen forty however was a year of extraordinary scarcity these twenty years preceding seventeen fifty may very well be set in opposition to the twenty preceding seventeen seventy as the former were a good deal below the general average of the century notwithstanding the intervention of one or two dear years so the latter have been a good deal above it notwithstanding the intervention of one or two cheap ones of seventeen fifty nine for example if the former have not been as much below the general average as the latter have been above it we ought probably to impute it to the bounty 
the change has evidently been too sudden to be ascribed to any change in the value of silver which is always slow and gradual the suddenness of the effect can be accounted for only by a cause which can operate suddenly the accidental variations of the seasons the money price of labor in great britain has indeed risen during the course of the present century this however seems to be the effect not so much of any diminution in the value of silver in the european market as of an increase in the demand for labor in great britain arising from the great and almost universal prosperity of the country in france a country not altogether so prosperous the money price of labor has since the middle of the last century been observed to sink gradually with the average money price of corn both in the last century and in the present the day wages of common labour are there said to have been pretty uniformly about the twentieth part of the average price of the septier of wheat a measure which contains a little more than four winchester bushels in great britain the real recompense of labour it has already been shown the real quantities of the necessaries and conveniencies of life which are given to the labourer has increased considerably during the course of the present century the rise in its money price seems to have been the effect not of any diminution of the value of silver in the general market of europe but of a rise in the real price of labour in the particular market of great britain owing to the peculiarly happy circumstances of the country for some time after the first discovery of america silver would continue to sell at its former or not much below its former price the profits of mining would for some time be very great and much above their natural rate those who imported that metal into europe however would soon find that the whole annual importation could not be disposed of at this high price silver would gradually exchange for a smaller and a smaller quantity of goods its price would sink gradually lower and lower till it fell to its natural price or to what was just sufficient to pay according to their natural rates the wages of the labour the profits of the stock and the rent of the land which must be paid in order to bring it from the mine to the market in the greater part of the silver mines of peru the tax of the king of spain amounting to a tenth of the gross produce eats up it has already been observed the whole rent of the land this tax was originally a half it soon afterwards fell to a third then to a fifth and at last to a tenth at which late it still continues in the greater part of the silver mines of peru this it seems is all that remains after replacing the stock of the undertaker of the work together with its ordinary profits and it seems to be universally acknowledged that these profits which were once very high are now as low as they can well be consistently with carrying on the works the tax of the king of spain was reduced to a fifth of the registered silver in fifteen o four one and forty years before fifteen forty five the date of the discovery of the mines of potosi in the course of ninety years or before sixteen thirty six these mines the most fertile in all america had time sufficient to produce their full effect or to reduce the value of silver in the european market as low as it could well fall while it continued to pay this tax to the king of spain ninety years is time sufficient to reduce any commodity of which there is no monopoly to its natural price or to the lowest price at which while it pays a particular tax it can continue to be sold for any considerable time together the price of silver in the european market might perhaps have fallen still lower and it might have become necessary either to reduce the tax upon it not only to one-tenth as in seventeen thirty six but to one-twentieth in the same manner as that upon gold or to give up working the greater part of the american mines which are now wrought the gradual increase of the demand for silver or the gradual enlargement of the market for the produce of the silver mines of america is probably the cause which has prevented this from happening and which has not only kept up the value of silver in the european market but has perhaps even raised it somewhat higher than it was about the middle of the last century since the first discovery of america the market for the produce of its silver mines has been growing gradually more and more extensive first since the discovery of america the greater part of europe has been much improved england holland france and germany even sweden denmark and russia have all advanced considerably both in agriculture and in manufactures italy seems not to have gone backwards the fall of italy preceded the conquest of peru since that time it seems rather to have recovered a little portugal however is but a very small part of europe and the declension of spain is not perhaps so great as is commonly imagined 
in the beginning of the sixteenth century spain was a very poor country even in comparison with france which has been so much improved since that time it was the well-known remark of the emperor charles v who had travelled so frequently through both countries that everything abounded in france but that everything was wanting in spain the increasing produce of the agriculture and manufacturers of europe must necessarily have required a gradual increase in the quantity of silver coin to circulate it and the increasing number of wealthy individuals must have required the like increase in the quantity of their plate and other ornaments of silver secondly america is itself a new market for the produce of its own silver mines and as its advances in agriculture industry and population are much more rapid than those of the most thriving countries in europe its demand must increase much more rapidly the english colonies are altogether a new market which partly for coin and partly for plate requires a continual augmenting supply of silver through a great continent where there never was any demand before the greater part too of the spanish and portuguese colonies are altogether new markets new grenada the yucatan paraguay and the brazils were before discovered by the europeans inhabited by savage nations who had neither arts nor agriculture a considerable degree of both has now been introduced into all of them even mexico and peru though they cannot be considered as altogether new markets are certainly much more extensive ones than they ever were before after all the wonderful tales which have been published concerning the splendid state of those countries in ancient times whoever reads with any degree of sober judgment the history of their first discovery and conquest will evidently discern that in arts agriculture and commerce their inhabitants were much more ignorant than the tartars of the ukraine are at present even the peruvians the more civilized nation of the two though they made use of gold and silver as ornaments had no coin money of any kind their whole commerce was carried on by barter and there was accordingly scarce any division of labor among them those who cultivated the ground were obliged to build their own houses to make their own household furniture their own clothes shoes and instruments of agriculture the few artificers among them are said to have been all maintained by the sovereign the nobles and the priests and were probably their servants or slaves all the ancient arts of mexico and peru have never furnished one single manufacture to europe the spanish armies though they scarce ever exceeded five hundred men and frequently did not amount to half that number found almost everywhere great difficulty in procuring subsistence the famines which they are said to have occasioned almost everywhere they went in countries too which at the same time are represented as very populous and well cultivated sufficiently demonstrate that the story of this populousness and high cultivation is in a great measure fabulous the spanish colonies are under a government in many respects less favorable to agriculture improvement and population than that of the english colonies they seem however to be advancing in all those much more rapidly than in any country in europe in a fertile soil and happy climate the great abundance and cheapness of land a circumstance common to all new colonies is it seems so great an advantage as to compensate many defects in civil government Frazier, who visited peru in seventeen thirteen represents lima as containing between twenty five and twenty eight thousand inhabitants ulloa who resided in the same country between seventeen forty and seventeen forty six represents it as containing more than fifty thousand the difference in their accounts of the populousness of several other principal towns of chile and peru is nearly the same and as there seems to be no reason to doubt of the good information of either it marks an increase which is scarce inferior to that of the english colonies america therefore is a new market for the produce of its own silver mines of which the demand must increase much more rapidly than that of the most thriving country in europe thirdly the east indies is another market for the produce of the silver mine of america and a market which from the time of the first discovery of those mines has been continually taking off a greater and a greater quantity of silver since that time the direct trade between america and the east indies which is carried on by means of the acapulco ships has been continually augmenting and the indirect intercourse by the way of europe has been augmenting in a still greater proportion during the sixteenth century the portuguese were the only european nation who carried on any regular trade to the east indies in the last years of that century the dutch began to encroach upon this monopoly and in a few years expelled them from their principal settlements in india during the greater part of the last century those two nations divided the most considerable part of the east india trade between them the trade of the dutch continually augmenting in a still greater proportion than that of the portuguese declined 
the english and french carried on in some trade with india in the last century but it has been greatly augmented in the course of the present the east india trade of the swedes and danes began in the course of the present century even the muscovites now trade regularly with china by a sort of caravans which go over the land through siberia and tartary to peking the east india trade of all these nations if we accept that of the french which the last war had well nigh annihilated has been almost continually augmenting the increasing consumptions of east india goods in europe is it seems so great as to afford a gradual increase of employment to them all tea for example was a drug very little used in europe before the middle of the last century at present the value of the tea annually imported by the english east india company for the use of their own countrymen amounts to more than a million and a half a year and even this is not enough a great deal more being constantly smuggled into the country from the ports of holland from gottenburg in sweden and from the coast of france too as long as the french east india company was in prosperity the consumption of the porcelain of china of the spiceries of the maluccas of the peace goods of bengal and of innumerable other articles has increased very nearly in a like proportion the tonnage accordingly of all the european shipping employed in the east india trade at any one time during the last century was not perhaps much greater than that of the english east india company before the late reduction of their shipping but in the east indies particularly in china and Indostan, the value of the precious metals when the europeans first began to trade to those countries was much higher than in europe and it still continues to be so in rice countries which generally yield two sometimes three crops in the year each of them more plentiful than any common crop of corn the abundance of food must be much greater than in any corn country of equal extent such countries are accordingly much more populous in them too the rich having a greater superabundance of food to dispose of beyond what they themselves can consume have the means of purchasing a much greater quantity of the labour of other people the retinue of a grandee in china or indostan accordingly is by all accounts much more numerous and splendid than that of the richest subjects in europe the same superabundance of food of which they have the disposal enables them to give a greater quantity of it for all those singular and rare productions which nature furnishes but in very small quantities such as the precious metals and the precious stones the great objects of the competition of the rich though the mines therefore which supplied the indian market had been as abundant as those which supplied the european such commodities would naturally exchange for a greater quantity of food in india than in europe but the mines which supplied the indian market with the precious metals seem to have been a good deal less abundant and those which supplied it with the precious stones a good deal more so than the mines which supplied the european the precious metals therefore would naturally exchange in india for a somewhat greater quantity of the precious stones and for a much greater quantity of food than in europe the money price of diamonds the greatest of all superfluities would be somewhat lower and that of food the first of all necessaries a good deal lower in the one country than in the other but the real price of labour the real quantity of the necessaries of life which is given to the labour it has already been observed is lower both in china and indostan the two great markets of india than it is through the greater part of europe the wages of the labour will there purchase a smaller quantity of food and as the money price of food is much lower in india than in europe the money price of labour is there lower upon a double account upon account both of the small quantity of food which it will purchase and of the low price of that food but in countries of equal art and industry the money price of the greater part of manufactures will be in proportion to the money price of labour and in manufacturing art and industry china and indostan though inferior seem not to be much inferior to any part of europe the money price of the greater part of manufactures therefore will naturally be much lower in those great empires than it is anywhere in europe through the greater part of europe too the expense of land carriage increases very much both the real and nominal price of most manufactures it costs more labour and therefore more money to bring first the materials and afterwards the complete manufacture to market in china and indostan the extent and variety of inland navigations save the greater part of this labour and consequently of this money and thereby reduce still lower both the real and the nominal price of the greater part of their manufactures upon all these accounts the precious metals are a commodity which it always has been and still continues to be extremely advantageous to carry from europe to india there is scarce any commodity which brings a better price there 
or which, in proportion to the quantity of labor and commodities which it costs in Europe, will purchase or command a greater quantity of labor and commodities in India. It is more advantageous, too, to carry silver thither than gold, because in China and the greater part of the other markets of India, the proportion between fine silver and fine gold is but as ten, or at most as twelve to one, whereas in Europe it is as fourteen or fifteen to one. In China and the greater part of the other markets of India, ten or at most twelve ounces of silver will purchase an ounce of gold. In Europe it requires from fourteen to fifteen ounces. In the cargoes, therefore, of the greater part of European ships which sail to India, silver has generally been one of the most valuable articles. It is the most valuable article in the Acapulco ships which sail to Manila. The silver of the new continent seems, in this manner, to be one of the principal commodities by which the commerce between the two extremities of the old one is carried on, and it is by means of it, in a great measure, that those distant parts of the world are connected with one another. In order to supply so very widely extended a market, the quantity of silver annually brought from the mines must not only be sufficient to support that continued increase, both of coin and of plate, which is required in all thriving countries, but to repair that continual waste and consumption of silver which takes place in all countries where that metal is used. The continual consumption of the precious metals in coin by wearing, and in plate, both by wearing and cleaning, is very sensible and in commodities of which the use is so very widely extended would alone require a very great annual supply the consumption of those metals in some particular manufactures though it may not perhaps be greater upon the whole than this gradual consumption is however much more sensible as it is much more rapid in the manufactures of birmingham alone the quantity of gold and silver annually employed in gilding and plating and thereby disqualified from ever afterwards appearing in the shape of those metals is said to amount to more than fifty thousand pounds sterling we may from thence form some notion how great must be the annual consumption in all the different parts of the world either in manufactures of the same kind with those of birmingham or in laces embroideries gold and silver stuffs the gilding of books furniture etc a considerable quantity too must be annually lost in transporting those metals from one place to another both by sea and by land in the greater part of the governments of asia besides the almost universal custom of concealing treasures in the bowels of the earth of which the knowledge frequently dies with the person who makes the concealment must occasion the loss of a still greater quantity the quantity of gold and silver imported at both cadiz and lisbon including not only what comes under register but what may be supposed to be smuggled amounts according to the best accounts to about six millions sterling a year according to mr meggins the annual importation of the precious metals into spain at an average of six years namely from seventeen forty eight to seventeen fifty three both inclusive and into portugal at an average of seven years namely from seventeen forty seven to seventeen fifty three both inclusive amounted in silver to one million one hundred and one thousand one hundred and seven pounds weight and in gold to forty nine thousand nine hundred and forty pounds weight the silver at sixty two shillings the pound troy amounts to three million four hundred and thirteen thousand four hundred and thirty one pound ten shillings sterling the gold at forty four guineas and a half the pound troy amounts to two million three hundred and thirty three thousand four hundred and forty six pounds fourteen shillings sterling both together amount to five million seven hundred and forty six thousand eight hundred and seventy eight pound four shillings sterling the account of what was imported under register he assures us is exact he gives us the detail of one of the particular places from which the gold and silver were brought and of the particular quantity of each metal which according to the register each of them afforded he makes an allowance too for the quantity of each metal which he supposes may have been smuggled the great experience of this judicious merchant renders his opinion of considerable weight according to the eloquent and sometimes well-informed author of the philosophical and political history of the establishment of the europeans in the two indies the annual importation of registered gold and silver into spain at an average of eleven years namely from seventeen fifty four to seventeen sixty four both inclusive amounted to thirteen million nine hundred and eighty four thousand one hundred and eighty five and three fifths piastres of ten reals on account of what may have been smuggled however the whole annual importation he supposes may have amounted to seventeen millions of piastres which at four shillings sixpence the piastre is equal to three million eight hundred and twenty five thousand pounds sterling 
he gives the detail too of the particular places from which the gold and silver were brought and of the particular quantities of each metal which according to the register each of them afforded he informs us too that if we were to judge of the quantity of gold annually imported from the brazils to lisbon by the amount of the tax paid to the king of portugal which it seems is one-fifth of the standard metal we might value it at eighteen millions of cruzados or forty-five millions of french livres equal to about twenty millions sterling on account of what may have been smuggled however we may safely he says add to this sum an eighth more or two hundred and fifty thousand pounds sterling so that the whole will amount to two million two hundred and fifty thousand pounds sterling according to this account therefore the whole annual importation of the precious metals into both spain and portugal mounts to about six million seventy five thousand pounds sterling several other very well authenticated though manuscript accounts i have been assured agree in making this whole annual importation amount at an average to about six million sterling sometimes a little more sometimes a little less the annual importation of the precious metals into cadiz and lisbon indeed is not equal to the whole annual produce of the mines of america some part is sent annually by the acapulco ships to manila some part is employed in a contraband trade which the spanish colonies carry on with those of other european nations and some part no doubt remains in the country the mines of america besides are by no means the only gold and silver mines in the world they are however by far the most abundant the produce of all the other mines which are known is insignificant it is acknowledged in comparison with theirs and the far greater part of their produce it is likewise acknowledged is annually imported into cadiz and lisbon but the consumption of birmingham alone at the rate of fifty thousand pounds a year is equal to the hundred and twentieth part of this annual importation at the rate of six millions a year the whole annual consumption of gold and silver therefore in all the different countries of the world where those metals are used may perhaps be nearly equal to the whole annual produce the remainder may be no more than sufficient to supply the increasing demand of all thriving countries it may even have fallen so short of this demand as somewhat to raise the price of those metals in the european market the quantity of brass and iron annually brought from the mine to the market is out of all proportion greater than that of gold and silver we do not however upon this account imagine that those coarse metals are likely to multiply beyond the demand or to become gradually cheaper and cheaper why should we imagine that the precious metals are likely to do so the coarse metals indeed though harder are put to much harder uses as they are of less value less care is employed in their preservation the precious metals however are not necessarily immortal any more than they but are liable to to be lost wasted and consumed in a great variety of ways the price of all metals though liable to slow and gradual variations varies less from year to year than that of almost any other part of the rude produce of land and the price of the precious metals is even less liable to sudden variations than that of the coarse ones the durableness of metals is the foundation of this extraordinary steadiness of price the corn which was brought to market last year will be all or almost all consumed long before the end of this year but some part of the iron which was brought from the mine two or three hundred years ago may be still in use and perhaps some part of the gold which was brought from it two or three thousand years ago the different masses of corn which in different years must supply the consumption of the world will always be nearly in proportion to the respective produce of those different years but the proportion between the different masses of iron which may be in use in two different years will be very little affected by any accidental difference in the produce of the iron mines of those two years and the proportion between the masses of gold will be still less affected by any such difference in the produce of the gold mines though the produce of the greater part of metallic mines therefore varies perhaps still more from year to year than that of the greater part of cornfields those variations have not the same effect upon the price of the one species of commodities as upon that of the other end of book one chapter eleven part four part five of chapter eleven of book wealth of nations this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Part 5 of Chapter 11 of Book 1 of The Rent of Land.
variations in the proportion between the respective values of gold and silver before the discovery of the mines of america the value of fine gold to fine silver was regulated in the different mines of europe between the proportions of one to ten and one to twelve that is an ounce of fine gold was supposed to be worth from ten to twelve ounces of fine silver about the middle of the last century it came to be regulated between the proportions of one to fourteen and one to fifteen that is an ounce of fine gold came to be supposed worth between fourteen and fifteen ounces of fine silver gold rose in its nominal value or in the quantity of silver which was given for it both metals sunk in their real value or in the quantity of labor which they could purchase but silver sunk more than gold though both the gold and silver mines of america exceeded in fertility all those which had ever been known before the fertility of the silver mines had it seems been proportionally still greater than that of the gold ones the greater quantities of silver carried annually from europe to india have in some of the english settlements gradually reduced the value of that metal in proportion to gold in the mint of calcutta an ounce of fine gold is supposed to be worth fifteen ounces of fine silver in the same manner as in europe it is in the mint perhaps rated too high for the value which it bears in the market of bengal in china the proportion of gold to silver still continues as one to ten or one to twelve in japan it is said to be as one to eight the proportion between the quantities of gold and silver annually imported into europe according to mr megan's account is as one to twenty-two nearly that is for one ounce of gold there are imported a little more than twenty-two ounces of silver the great quantity of silver sent annually to the east indies reduces he supposes the quantities of those metals which remain in europe to the proportion of one to fourteen or fifteen the proportion of their values the proportion between their values he seems to think must necessarily be the same as that between their quantities and would therefore be as one to twenty-two were it not for this greater exportation of silver but the ordinary proportion between the respective values of two commodities is not necessarily the same as that between the quantities of them which are commonly in the market the price of an ox reckoned at ten guineas is about three score times the price of a lamb reckoned at three shillings sixpence it would be absurd however to infer from thence that there are commonly in the market threescore lambs for one ox and it would be just as absurd to infer because an ounce of gold will commonly purchase from fourteen or fifteen ounces of silver that there are commonly in the market only fourteen or fifteen ounces of silver for one ounce of gold the quantity of silver commonly in the market it is probable is much greater in the proportion to that of gold than the value of a certain quantity of gold is to that of an equal quantity of silver the whole quantity of a cheap commodity brought to market is commonly not only greater but of greater value than the whole quantity of a dear one the whole quantity of bread annually brought to market is not only greater but of greater value than the whole quantity of butcher's meat the whole quantity of butcher's meat than the whole quantity of poultry and the whole quantity of poultry than the whole quantity of wild fowl there are so many more purchasers for the cheap than for the dear commodity that not only a greater quantity of it but a greater value can commonly be disposed of the whole quantity therefore of the cheap commodity must commonly be in greater proportion to the whole quantity of the dear one than the value of a certain quantity of the dear one is to the value of an equal quantity of the cheap one when we compare the precious metals with one another silver is a cheap and gold a dear commodity we ought naturally to expect therefore that there should always be in the market not only a greater quantity but a greater value of silver than of gold let any man who has a little of both compare his own silver with his gold plate and he will probably find that not only the quantity but the value of the former greatly exceeds that of the latter many people besides have a good deal of silver who have no gold plate which even with those who have it is generally confined to watch-cases snuff-boxes and such like trinkets of which the whole amount is seldom of great value in the british coin indeed the value of the gold preponderates greatly but it is not so in that of all countries in the coin of some countries the value of the two metals is nearly equal in the scotch coin before the union with england the gold preponderated very little though it did somewhat as it appears by the accounts of the mint in the coin of many countries the silver preponderates in france the largest sums are commonly paid in that metal and it is there difficult to get more gold than what is necessary to carry about in your pocket 
the superior value however of the silver plate above that of the gold which takes place in all countries will much more than compensate the preponderancy of the gold coin above the silver which takes place only in some countries though in one sense of the word silver always has been and probably always will be much cheaper than gold yet in another sense gold may perhaps in the present state of the spanish market be said to be somewhat cheaper than silver a commodity may be said to be dear or cheap not only according to the absolute greatness or smallness of its usual price but according as that price is more or less above the lowest for which it is possible to bring it to market for any considerable time together this lowest price is that which barely replaces with a moderate profit the stock which must be employed in bringing the commodity thither it is the price which affords nothing to the landlord of which rent makes not any component part but which resolves itself altogether into wages and profit but in the present state of the spanish market gold is certainly somewhat nearer to this lowest price than silver the tax of the king of spain upon gold is only one twentieth part of the standard metal or five per cent whereas his tax upon silver amounts to one tenth part of it or to ten per cent in these taxes too it has already been observed consists the whole rent of the greater part of the gold and silver mines of spanish america and that upon gold is still worse paid than that upon silver the profits of the undertakers of gold mines too as they more rarely make a fortune must in general be still more moderate than those of the undertakers of silver mines the price of spanish gold therefore as it affords both less rent and less profit must in the spanish market be somewhat nearer to the lowest price for which it is possible to bring it thither than the price of spanish silver when all expenses are computed the whole quantity of the one metal it would seem cannot in the spanish market be disposed of so advantageously as the whole quantity of the other the tax indeed of the king of portugal upon the gold of the brazils is the same with the ancient tax of the king of spain upon the silver of mexico and peru or one-fifth part of the standard metal it may therefore be uncertain whether to the general market of europe the whole mass of american gold comes at a price nearer to the lowest for which it is possible to bring it thither than the whole mass of american silver the price of diamonds and other precious stones may perhaps be still nearer to the lowest price at which it is possible to bring them to market than even the price of gold though it is not very probable that any part of a tax which is not only imposed upon one of the most proper subjects of taxation a mere luxury and superfluity but which affords so very important a revenue as the tax upon silver will ever be given up as long as it is possible to pay it yet the same impossibility of paying it which in seventeen thirty six made it necessary to reduce it from one-fifth to one-tenth may in time make it necessary to reduce it still further in the same manner as it made it necessary to reduce the tax upon gold to one-twentieth that the silver mines of spanish america like all other mines become gradually more expensive in the working on account of the greater depths at which it is necessary to carry on the works and of the greater expense of drawing out the water and of supplying them with fresh air at those depths is acknowledged by everybody who has inquired into the state of those mines these causes which are equivalent to a growing scarcity of silver for a commodity may be said to grow scarce when it becomes more difficult and expensive to collect a certain quantity of it must in time produce one or other of the three following events the increase of the expense must either first be compensated altogether by a proportionable increase in the price of the metal or secondly it must be compensated altogether by a proportionable diminution of the tax upon silver or thirdly it must be compensated partly by the one and partly by the other of those two expedients this third event is very possible as gold rose in its price in proportion to silver notwithstanding a great diminution of the tax upon gold so silver might rise in its price in proportion to labor and commodities notwithstanding an equal diminution of the tax upon silver such successive reductions of the tax however though they may not prevent altogether must certainly retard more or less the rise of the value of silver in the european market in consequence of such reductions many mines may be wrought which could not be wrought before because they could not afford to pay the old tax and the quantity of silver annually brought to market must always be somewhat greater and therefore the value of any given quantity somewhat less than it otherwise would have been in consequence of the reduction in seventeen thirty six the value of silver in the european market though it may not at this day be lower than before that reduction is probably at least ten per cent lower than it would have been had the court of spain continued to exact the old tax 
that notwithstanding this reduction the value of silver has during the course of the present century begun to rise somewhat in the european market the facts and arguments which have been alleged above dispose me to believe or more properly to suspect and conjecture for the best opinion which i can form upon this subject scarce perhaps deserve the name of belief the rise indeed supposing there has been any has hitherto been so very small that after all that has been said it may perhaps appear to many people uncertain not only whether this event has actually taken place but whether the contrary may not have taken place or whether the value of silver may not still continue to fall in the european market it must be observed however that whatever may be the supposed annual importation of gold and silver there must be a certain period at which the annual consumption of those metals will be equal to that annual importation their consumption must increase as their mass increases or rather in a much greater proportion as their mass increases their value diminishes they are more used and less cared for and their consumption consequently increases in a greater proportion than their mass after a certain period therefore the annual consumption of those metals must in this manner become equal to their annual importation provided that importation is not continually increasing which in the present times is not supposed to be the case if when the annual consumption has become equal to the annual importation the annual importation should gradually diminish the annual consumption may for some time exceed the annual importation the mass of those metals may gradually and insensibly diminish and their value gradually and insensibly rise till the annual importation becoming again stationary the annual consumption will gradually and insensibly accommodate itself to what that annual importation can maintain grounds of the suspicion that the value of silver still continues to decrease the increase of the wealth of europe and the popular notion that as the quantity of the precious metals naturally increases with the increase of wealth so their value diminishes as their quantity increases may perhaps dispose many people to believe that their value still continues to fall in the european market and the still gradually increasing price of many parts of the rude produce of land may confirm them still farther in this opinion that that increase in the quantity of the precious metals which arises in any country from the increase of wealth has no tendency to diminish their value i have endeavoured to show already gold and silver naturally resort to a rich country for the same reason that all sorts of luxuries and curiosities resort to it not because they are cheaper there than in poorer countries but because they are dearer or because a better price is given for them it is the superiority of price which attracts them and as soon as that superiority ceases they necessarily cease to go thither if you accept corn and such other vegetables as are raised altogether by human industry that all other sorts of rude produce cattle poultry game of all kinds the useful fossils and minerals of the earth etc naturally grow dearer as the society advances in wealth and improvement i have endeavoured to show already though such commodities therefore come to exchange for a greater quantity of silver than before it will not from thence follow that silver has become really cheaper or will purchase less labour than before but that such commodities have become really dearer or will purchase more labour than before it is not their nominal price only but their real price which rises in the progress of improvement the rise of their nominal price is the effect not of any degradation of the value of silver but of the rise in their real price End of Book 1, Chapter 11, Part 5part six of Chapter 11 of Book 1 of The Wealth of Nations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Part six of chapter eleven of book one of the rent of land different effects of the progress of improvement upon three different sorts of rude produce these different sorts of rude produce may be divided into three classes the first comprehends those which it is scarce in the power of human industry to multiply at all the second those which it can multiply in proportion to the demand the third those in which the efficacy of industry is either limited or uncertain in the progress of wealth and improvement the real price of the first may rise to any degree of extravagance and seems not to be limited by any certain boundary that of the second though it may rise greatly has however a certain boundary beyond which it cannot well pass for any considerable time together 
that of the third though its natural tendency is to rise in the progress of improvement yet in the same degree of improvement it may sometimes happen even to fall sometimes to continue the same and sometimes to rise more or less according as different accidents render the efforts of human industry in multiplying this sort of rude produce more or less successful first sort the first sort of rude produce of which the price rises in the progress of improvement is that which it is scarce in the power of human industry to multiply at all it consists in those things which nature produces only in certain quantities and which being of a very perishable nature it is impossible to accumulate together the produce of many different seasons such are the greater part of rare and singular birds and fishes many different sorts of game almost all wild fowl all birds of passage in particular, as well as many other things. When wealth and the luxury which accompanies it increase, the demand for these is likely to increase with them, and no effort of human industry may be able to increase the supply much beyond what it was before this increase of the demand. The quantity of such commodities, therefore, remaining the same, or nearly the same, while the competition to purchase them is continually increasing, their price may rise to any degree of extravagance and seems not to be limited by any certain boundary if woodcocks should become so fashionable as to sell for twenty guineas apiece no effort of human industry could increase the number of those brought to market much beyond what it is at present the high price paid by the romans in the time of their greatest grandeur for rare birds and fishes may in this manner easily be accounted for these prices were not the effects of the low value of silver in those times, but of the high value of such rarities and curiosities as human industry could not multiply at pleasure. The real value of silver was higher at Rome, for some time before and after the fall of the Republic, than it is through the greater part of Europe at present. Three sesterti, equal to about sixpence sterling, was the price which the Republic paid for the modius or peck of the tithe wheat of Sicily. This price, however, was probably below the average market price, the obligation to deliver their wheat at this rate being considered as a tax upon the Sicilian farmers. When the Romans, therefore, had occasion to order more corn than the tithe of wheat amounted to, they were bound by capitulation to pay for the surplus at the rate of four sesterti, or eight pence sterling the peck, and this had probably been reckoned the moderate and reasonable, that is, the ordinary or average contract price of those times, it is equal to about one and twenty shillings the quarter. Eight and twenty shillings the quarter was, before the late years of scarcity, the ordinary contract price of English wheat, which in quality is inferior to the Sicilian, and generally sells for a lower price in the European market. The value of silver, therefore, in those ancient times, must have been to its value in the present, as three to four inversely, that is, three ounces of silver would then have purchased the same quantity of labor and commodities, which four ounces will do at present. When we read in Pliny, therefore, that Sayus bought a white nightingale as a present for the Empress Agrippina, at the price of six thousand sesterti, equal to about fifty pounds of our present money, and that Asinius Seller purchased a sermolet at the price of eight thousand sesterti, equal to about sixty-six pounds, thirteen shillings, and fourpence of our present money, the extravagance of those prices how much soever it may surprise us is apt notwithstanding to appear to us about one-third less than it really was their real price the quantity of labor and subsistence which was given away for them was about one-third more than their nominal price is apt to express to us in the present times Sayus gave for the nightingale the command of a quantity of labor and subsistence equal to what sixty-six pounds thirteen shillings fourpence would purchase in the present times and Asinius Seller gave for a sermolet the command of a quantity equal to what eighty-eight pounds, seventeen shillings, nine pence would purchase. What occasioned the extravagance of those high prices was not so much the abundance of silver as the abundance of labor and subsistence, of which those Romans had the disposal beyond what was necessary for their own use. The quantity of silver of which they had the disposal was a good deal less than what the command of the same quantity of labor and subsistence would have procured to them in the present times second sort the second sort of rude produce of which the price rises in the progress of improvement is that which human industry can multiply in proportion to the demand it consists in those useful plants and animals which in uncultivated countries nature produces with such profuse abundance that they are of little or no value and which as cultivation advances are therefore forced to give place to some more profitable produce 
during a long period in the progress of improvement the quantity of these is continually diminishing while at the same time the demand for them is continually increasing their real value therefore the real quantity of labour which they will purchase or command gradually rises till at last it gets so high as to render them as profitable a produce as anything else which human industry can raise upon the most fertile and best cultivated land when it has got so high it cannot well go higher if it did more land and more industry would soon be employed to increase their quantity when the price of cattle for example rises so high that it is as profitable to cultivate land in order to raise food for them as in order to raise food for man it cannot well go higher if it did more corn land would soon be turned into pasture the extension of tillage by diminishing the quantity of wild pasture diminishes the quantity of butcher's meat which the country naturally produces without labour or cultivation and by increasing the number of those who have either corn or what comes to the same thing the price of corn to give in exchange for it increases the demand the price of butcher's meat therefore and consequently of cattle must gradually rise till it gets so high that it becomes as profitable to employ the most fertile and best cultivated lands in raising food for them as in raising corn but it must always be late in the progress of improvement before tillage can be so far extended as to raise the price of cattle to this height and till it has got to this height if the country is advancing at all their price must be continually rising there are perhaps some parts of europe in which the price of cattle has not yet got to this height it had not got to this height in any part of scotland before the union had the scotch cattle been always confined to the market of scotland in a country in which the quantity of land which can be applied to no other purpose but the feeding of cattle is so great in proportion to what can be applied to other purposes it is scarce possible perhaps that their price could ever have risen so high as to render it profitable to cultivate land for the sake of feeding them in england the price of cattle it has already been observed seems in the neighbourhood of london to have got to this height about the beginning of the last century but it was much later probably before it got through the greater part of the remoter counties and some of which perhaps it may scarce yet have got to it of all the different substances however which compose this second sort of rude produce cattle is perhaps that of which the price in the progress of improvement rises first to this height till the price of cattle indeed has got to this height it seems scarce possible that the greater part even of those lands which are capable of the highest cultivation can be completely cultivated in all farms too distant from any town to carry manure from it that is in the far greater part of those of every extensive country the quantity of well cultivated land must be in proportion to the quantity of manure which the farm itself produces and this again must be in proportion to the stock of cattle which are maintained upon it the land is manured either by pasturing the cattle upon it or by feeding them in the stable and from thence carrying out their dung to it but unless the price of the cattle be sufficient to pay both the rent and profit of cultivated land the farmer cannot afford to pasture them upon it and he can still less afford to feed them in the stable it is with the produce of improved and cultivated land only that cattle can be fed in the stable because to collect the scanty and scattered produce of waste and unimproved lands would require too much labour and be too expensive if the price of the cattle therefore is not sufficient to pay for the produce of improved and cultivated land when they are allowed to pasture it that price will be still less sufficient to pay for that produce when it must be collected with a good deal of additional labour and brought into the stable to them in these circumstances therefore no more cattle can with profit be fed in the stable than what are necessary for tillage but these can never afford manure enough for keeping constantly in good condition all the lands which they are capable of cultivating what they afford being insufficient for the whole farm will naturally be reserved for the lands to which it can be most advantageously or conveniently applied the most fertile or those perhaps in the neighbourhood of the farmyard these therefore will be kept constantly in good condition and fit for tillage the rest will the greater part of them be allowed to lie waste producing scarce anything but some miserable pasture just sufficient to keep alive a few straggling half-starved cattle the farm though much overstocked in proportion to what would be necessary for its complete cultivation being very frequently overstocked in proportion to its actual produce a portion of this waste land however after having been pastured in this wretched manner for six or seven years together may be ploughed up when it will yield perhaps a poor crop or two of bad oats or of some other coarse grain and then being entirely exhausted it must be rested and pastured again as before 
and another portion ploughed up to be in the same manner exhausted and rested again in its turn such accordingly was the general system of management all over the low country of scotland before the union the lands which were kept constantly well manured and in good condition seldom exceeded a third or fourth part of the whole farm and sometimes did not amount to a fifth or a sixth part of it the rest were never manured but a certain portion of them was in its turn notwithstanding regularly cultivated and exhausted under this system of management it is evident even that part of the lands of scotland which is capable of good cultivation could produce but little in comparison of what it may be capable of producing but how disadvantageous soever this system may appear yet before the union the low price of cattle seems to have rendered it almost unavoidable if notwithstanding a great rise in the price it still continues to prevail through a considerable part of the country it is owing in many places no doubt to ignorance and attachment to old customs but in most places to the unavoidable obstructions which the natural course of things opposes to the immediate or speedy establishment of a better system first to the poverty of the tenants to their not having yet had time to acquire a stock of cattle sufficient to cultivate their lands more completely the same rise of price which would render it advantageous for them to maintain a greater stock rendering it more difficult for them to acquire it and secondly to their not having yet had time to put their lands in condition to maintain this greater stock properly supposing they were capable of acquiring it the increase of stock and the improvement of land are two events which must go hand in hand and of which the one can nowhere much outrun the other without some increase of stock there can be scarce any improvement of land but there can be no considerable increase of stock but in consequence of a considerable improvement of land because otherwise the land could not maintain it these natural obstructions to the establishment of a better system cannot be removed but by a long course of frugality and industry and a half a century or century more perhaps must pass away before the old system which is wearing out gradually can be completely abolished through all the different parts of the country of all the commercial advantages however which scotland has derived from the union with england this rise in the price of cattle is perhaps the greatest it has not only raised the value of all highland estates but it has perhaps been the principal cause of the improvement of the low country in all new colonies the great quantity of waste land which can for many years be applied to no other purpose but the feeding of cattle soon renders them extremely abundant and in everything great cheapness is the necessary consequence of great abundance though all the cattle of the european colonies in america were originally carried from europe they soon multiplied so much there and became of so little value that even horses were allowed to run wild in the woods without any owner thinking it worth while to claim them it must be a long time after the first establishment of such colonies before it can become profitable to feed cattle upon the produce of cultivated land the same causes therefore the want of manure and the disproportion between the stock employed in cultivation and the land which it is destined to cultivate are likely to introduce there a system of husbandry not unlike that which still continues to take place in so many parts of scotland mr calm the swedish traveller when he gives an account of the husbandry of some of the english colonies in north america as he found it in seventeen forty nine observes accordingly that he can with difficulty discover there the character of the english nation so well skilled in all the different branches of agriculture they make scarce any manure for their cornfields he says but when one piece of ground has been exhausted by continual cropping they clear and cultivate another piece of fresh land and when that is exhausted proceed to a third their cattle are allowed to wander through the woods and other uncultivated grounds where they are half starved having long ago extirpated almost all the annual grasses by cropping them too early in the spring before they had time to form their flowers or to shed their seeds the annual grasses were it seems the best natural grasses in that part of north america and when the europeans first settled there they used to grow very thick and to rise three or four feet high a piece of ground which when he wrote could not maintain one cow would in former times he was assured have maintained four each of which would have given four times the quantity of milk which that one was capable of giving the poorness of the pasture had in his opinion occasioned the degradation of their cattle which degenerated sensibly from one generation to another they were probably not unlike that stunted breed which was common all over scotland thirty or forty years ago and which is now so much mended through the greater part of the low country not so much by a change of the breed though that expedient has been employed in some places as by a more plentiful method of feeding them 
though it is late therefore in the progress of improvement before cattle can bring such a price as to render it profitable to cultivate land for the sake of feeding them yet of all the different parts which compose this second sort of rude produce they are perhaps the first which bring this price because till they bring it it seems impossible that improvement can be brought near even to that degree of perfection to which it has arrived in many parts of europe as cattle are among the first so perhaps venison is among the last parts of this sort of rude produce which bring this price the price of venison in great britain how extravagant soever it may appear is not near sufficient to compensate the expense of a deer park as is well known to all those who have had any experience in the feeding of deer if it was otherwise the feeding of deer would soon become an article of common farming in the same manner as the feeding of those small birds called turdi was among the ancient romans varro and columella assures us that it was a most profitable article the fattening of ortolans birds of passage which arrive lean in the country is said to be so in some parts of france if venison continues in fashion and the wealth and luxury of great britain increase as they have done for some time past its price may very probably rise still higher than it is at present between that period and the progress of improvement which brings to its height the price of so necessary an article as cattle and that which brings it to the price of such a superfluity as venison there is a very long interval in the course of which many other sorts of rude produce gradually arrive at their highest price some sooner and some later according to different circumstances thus in every farm the offals of the barn and stable will maintain a certain number of poultry these as they are fed with what would otherwise be lost are a mere save all and as they cost the farmer scarce anything so he can afford to sell them for very little almost all that he gets is pure gain and their price can scarce be so low as to discourage him from feeding this number but in countries cultivated and therefore but thinly inhabited the poultry which are thus raised without expense are often fully sufficient to supply the whole demand in this state of things therefore they are often as cheap as butcher's meat or any other sort of animal food but the whole quantity of poultry which the farm in this manner produces without expense must always be much smaller than the whole quantity of butcher's meat which is reared upon it and in times of wealth and luxury what is rare with only nearly equal merit is always preferred to what is common as wealth and luxury increase therefore in consequence of improvement and cultivation the price of poultry gradually rises above that of butcher's meat till at last it gets so high that it becomes profitable to cultivate land for the sake of feeding them when it has got to this height it cannot well go higher if it did more land would soon be turned to this purpose in several provinces of france the feeding of poultry is considered as a very important article in rural economy and sufficiently profitable to encourage the farmer to raise a considerable quantity of indian corn and buckwheat for this purpose a middling farmer will there sometimes have four hundred fowls in his yard the feeding of poultry seems scarce yet to be generally considered as a matter of so much importance in england they are certainly however dearer in england than in france as england receives considerable supplies from france in the progress of improvements the period at which every particular sort of animal food is dearest must naturally be that which immediately precedes the general practice of cultivating land for the sake of raising it for some time before this practice becomes general the scarcity must necessarily raise the price after it has become general new methods of feeding are commonly fallen upon which enable the farmer to raise upon the same quantity of ground a much greater quantity of that particular sort of animal food the plenty not only obliges him to sell cheaper but in consequence of these improvements he can afford to sell cheaper for if he could not afford it the plenty would not be of long continuance it has been probably in this manner that the introduction of clover turnips carrots cabbages etc has contributed to sink the common price of butcher's meat in the london market somewhat below what it was about the beginning of the last century the hog that finds his food among order and greedily devours many things rejected by every other useful animal is like poultry originally kept as a save-all as long as the number of such animals which can thus be reared at little or no expense is fully sufficient to supply the demand this sort of butcher's meat comes to market at a much lower price than any other but when the demand rises beyond what this quantity can supply when it becomes necessary to raise food on purpose for feeding and fattening hogs in the same manner as for feeding and fattening other cattle 
the price necessarily rises and becomes proportionably either higher or lower than that of other butcher's meat according as the nature of the country and the state of its agriculture happen to render the feeding of hogs more or less expensive than that of other cattle in france according to mr buffon the price of pork is nearly equal to that of beef in most parts of great britain it is at present somewhat higher the great rise in the price both of hogs and poultry has in great britain been frequently imputed to the diminution of the number of cottagers and other small occupiers of land an event which has in every part of europe been the immediate forerunner of improvement and better cultivation but which at the same time may have contributed to raise the price of those articles both somewhat sooner and somewhat faster than it would otherwise have risen as the poorest family can often maintain a cat or dog without any expense so the poorest occupiers of land can commonly maintain a few poultry or a sow and a few pigs at very little the little offals of their own table their whey skimmed milk and buttermilk supply those animals with a part of their food and they find the rest in the neighbouring fields without doing any sensible damage to anybody by diminishing the number of those small occupiers therefore the quantity of this sort of provisions which is thus produced at little or no expense must certainly have been a good deal diminished and their price must consequently have been raised both sooner and faster than it would otherwise have risen sooner or later however in the progress of improvement it must at any rate have risen to the utmost height of which it is capable of rising or to the price which pays the labour and expense of cultivating the land which furnishes them with food as well as these are paid upon the greater part of other cultivated land the business of the dairy like the feeding of hogs and poultry is originally carried on as a save all the cattle necessarily kept upon the farm produce more milk than either the rearing of their own young or the consumption of the farmer's family requires and they produce most at one particular season but of all the productions of land milk is perhaps the most perishable in the warm season when it is most abundant it will scarce keep four and twenty hours the farmer by making it into fresh butter stores a small part of it for a week by making it into salt butter for a year and by making it into cheese he stores a much greater part of it for several years part of all these is reserved for the use of his own family the rest goes to market in order to find the best price which is to be had and which can scarce be so low as to discourage him from sending thither whatever is over and above the use of his own family if it is very low indeed he will be likely to manage his dairy in a very slovenly and dirty manner and will scarce perhaps think it worth while to have a particular room or building on purpose for it but will suffer the business to be carried on amidst the smoke filth and nastiness of his own kitchen as was the case of almost all the farmers dairies in scotland thirty or forty years ago and as is the case of many of them still the same causes which gradually raise the price of butcher's meat the increase of the demand and in consequence of the improvement of the country the diminution of the quantity which can be fed at little or no expense raise in the same manner that of the produce of the dairy of which the price naturally connects with that of butcher's meat or with the expense of feeding cattle the increase of price pays for more labour care and cleanliness the dairy becomes more worthy of the farmer's attention and the quality of its produce gradually improves the price at last gets so high that it becomes worth while to employ some of the most fertile and best cultivated lands in feeding cattle merely for the purpose of the dairy and when it has got to this height it cannot well go higher if it did more land would soon be turned to this purpose it seems to have got to this height through the greater part of england where much good land is commonly employed in this manner if you accept the neighbourhood of a few considerable towns it seems not yet to have got to this height anywhere in scotland where common farmers seldom employ much good land in raising food for cattle merely for the purpose of the dairy the price of the produce though it has risen very considerably within these few years is probably still too low to admit of it the inferiority of the quality indeed compared with that of the produce of english dairies is fully equal to that of the price but this inferiority of quality is perhaps rather the effect of this lowness of price than the cause of it though the quality was much better the greater part of what is brought to market could not i apprehend in the present circumstances of the country be disposed of at a much better price and the present price it is probable would not pay the expense of the land and labour necessary for producing a much better quality through the greater part of england notwithstanding the superiority of price the dairy is not reckoned a more profitable employment of land than the raising of corn or the fattening of cattle the two great objects of agriculture 
through the greater part of scotland therefore it cannot yet be even so profitable the lands of no country it is evident can ever be completely cultivated and improved till once the price of every produce which human industry is obliged to raise upon them has got so high as to pay for the expense of complete improvement and cultivation in order to do this the price of each particular produce must be sufficient first to pay the rent of good corn land as it is that which regulates the rent of the greater part of other cultivated land and secondly to pay the labour and expense of the farmer as well as they are commonly paid upon good corn land or in other words to replace with the ordinary profits the stock which he employs about it this rise in the price of each particular produce must evidently be previous to the improvement and cultivation of the land which is destined for raising it gain is the end of all improvement and nothing could deserve that name of which loss was to be the necessary consequence but loss must be the necessary consequence of improving land for the sake of a produce of which the price could never bring back the expense if the complete improvement and cultivation of the country be as it most certainly is the greatest of all public advantages this rise in the price of all those different sorts of rude produce instead of being considered as a public calamity ought to be regarded as the necessary forerunner and attendant of the greatest of all public advantages this rise too in the nominal or money price of all those different sorts of rude produce has been the effect not of any degradation in the value of silver but of a rise in their real price they have become worth not only a greater quantity of silver but a greater quantity of labour and subsistence than before as it costs a greater quantity of labour and subsistence to bring them to market so when they are brought thither they represent or are equivalent to a greater quantity End of Book 1, Chapter 11, Part 6part seven of chapter eleven of book one of the wealth of nations this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by stephen escalera the wealth of nations by adam smith part seven of chapter eleven of book one of the rent of land third sort the third and last sort of rude produce of which the price naturally rises in the progress of improvement is that in which the efficacy of human industry in augmenting the quantity is either limited or uncertain though the real price of this sort of rude produce therefore naturally tends to rise in the progress of improvement yet according as different accidents happen to render the efforts of human industry more or less successful in augmenting the quantity it may happen sometimes even to fall sometimes to continue the same in very different periods of improvement and sometimes to rise more or less in the same period there are some sorts of rude produce which nature has rendered a kind of appendages to other sorts so that the quantity of the one which any country can afford is necessarily limited by that of the other the quantity of wool or of raw hides for example which any country can afford is necessarily limited by the number of great and small cattle that are kept in it the state of its improvement and the nature of its agriculture again necessarily determine this number the same causes which in the progress of improvement gradually raise the price of butcher's meat should have the same effect it may be thought upon the prices of wool and raw hides and raise them too nearly in the same proportion it probably would be so if in the rude beginnings of improvement the market for the latter commodities was confined within as narrow bounds as that for the former but the extent of their respective markets is commonly extremely different the market for butcher's meat is almost everywhere confined to the country which produces it ireland and some part of british america indeed carry on a considerable trade in salt provisions but they are i believe the only countries in the commercial world which do so or which export to other countries any considerable part of their butcher's meat the market for wool and raw hides on the contrary is in the rude beginnings of improvement very seldom confined to the country which produces them they can easily be transported to distant countries wool without any preparation and raw hides with very little and as they are the materials of many manufactures the industry of other countries may occasion a demand for them though that of the country which produces them might not occasion any in countries ill cultivated and therefore but thinly inhabited the price of the wool and of the hide bears always a much greater proportion to that of the whole beast than in countries where improvement and population being further advanced there is more demand for butcher's meat 
Mr. Hume observes that in the Saxon times the fleece was estimated at two-fifths of the value of the whole sheep, and that this was much above the proportion of its present estimation. In some provinces of Spain, I have been assured, the sheep is frequently killed merely for the sake of the fleece and the tallow. The carcass is often left to rot upon the ground, or to be devoured by beasts and birds of prey. If this sometimes happens even in Spain, it happens almost constantly in Chile, at Buenos Aires, and in many other parts of Spanish America, where the horned cattle are almost constantly killed merely for the sake of the hide and the tallow. This, too, used to happen almost constantly in Hispaniola, while it was infested by the buccaneers, and before the settlement, improvement, and populousness of the French plantations, which now extend round the coast of almost the whole western half of the island, had given some value to the cattle of the Spaniards, who still continued to possess, not only the eastern part of the coast, but the whole inland mountainous part of the country though in the progress of improvement and population the price of the whole beast necessarily rises yet the price of the carcass is likely to be much more affected by this rise than that of the wool and the hide the market for the carcass being in the rude state of society confined always to the country which produces it must necessarily be extended in proportion to the improvement and population of that country but the market for the wool and the hides, even of a barbarous country, often extending to the whole commercial world, it can very seldom be enlarged in the same proportion. The state of the whole commercial world can seldom be much affected by the improvement of any particular country, and the market for such commodities may remain the same, or very nearly the same, after such improvements as before. It should, however, in the natural course of things, rather, upon the whole, be somewhat extended in consequence of them. If the manufacturers, especially of which those commodities are the materials, should ever come to flourish in the country, the market, though it might not be much enlarged, would at least be brought much nearer to the place of growth than before, and the price of those materials might at least be increased by what had usually been the expense of transporting them to distant countries. Though it might not rise, therefore, in the same proportion as that of butcher's meat, it ought naturally to rise somewhat, and ought certainly not to fall." In England, however, notwithstanding the flourishing state of its wool and manufacture, the price of English wool has fallen very considerably since the time of Edward the Third. There are many authentic records which demonstrate that, during the reign of that prince, towards the middle of the fourteenth century, or about 1339, what was reckoned the moderate and reasonable price of the tod, or twenty-eight pounds of English wool, was not less than ten shillings of the money of those times, containing at the rate of twenty pence the ounce, six ounces of silver, tower weight, equal to about thirty shillings of our present money. In the present times, one and twenty shillings the tod may be reckoned a good price for very good English wool. The money price of wool, therefore, in the time of Edward the Third, was to its money price in the present times as ten to seven. The superiority of its real price was still greater. At the rate of six shillings and eight pence the quarter, ten shillings was in those ancient times the price of twelve bushels of wheat. At the rate of twenty-eight shillings the quarter, one and twenty shillings is in the present times the price of six bushels only. The proportion between the real price of ancient and modern times, therefore, is as twelve to six, or as two to one. In those ancient times, a tod of wool would have purchased twice the quantity of subsistence which it will purchase at present, and consequently twice the quantity of labor, if the real recompense of labor had been the same in both periods. This degradation, both in the real and nominal value of wool, can never have happened in consequence of the natural course of things. It has accordingly been the effect of violence and artifice. First, of the absolute prohibition of exporting wool from England. Secondly, of the permission of importing it from Spain, duty-free. Thirdly, of the prohibition of exporting it from Ireland to another country but England. In consequence of these regulations, the market for English wool, instead of being somewhat extended, in consequence of the improvement of England, has been confined to the home market, where the wool of several other countries is allowed to come into competition with it, and where that of Ireland is forced into competition with it. As the woolen manufacturers, too, of Ireland, are fully as much discouraged as is consistent with justice and fair dealing, the Irish can work up but a smaller part of their own wool at home, and are therefore obliged to send a greater proportion of it to Great Britain, the only market they are allowed. I have not been able to find any such authentic records concerning the price of raw hides in ancient times. 
wool was commonly paid as a subsidy to the king and its valuation in that subsidy ascertains at least in some degree what was its ordinary price but this seems not to have been the case with raw hides fleetwood however from an account in fourteen twenty five between the prior of burchester oxford and one of his canons gives us their price at least as it was stated upon that particular occasion namely five ox hides at twelve shillings five cow hides at seven shillings and threepence thirty six sheepskins of two years old at nine shillings sixteen calf skins at two shillings in fourteen twenty five twelve shillings contained about the same quantity of silver as four and twenty shillings of our present money an ox hide therefore was in this account valued at the same quantity of silver as four shillings four fifths of our present money its nominal price was a good deal lower than at present but at the rate of six shillings and eight pence the quarter twelve shillings would in those times have purchased fourteen bushels and four-fifths of a bushel of wheat which at three and sixpence the bushel would in the present times cost fifty-one shillings fourpence an ox-hide therefore would in those times have purchased as much corn as ten shillings and threepence would purchase at present its real value was equal to ten shillings and threepence of our present money in those ancient times when the cattle were half starved during the greater part of the winter we cannot suppose that they were of a very large size an oxhide which weighs four stone of sixteen pounds of adder de poise is not in the present times reckoned a bad one and in those ancient times would probably have been reckoned a very good one but at half a crown the stone which at this moment february seventeen seventy three i understand to be the common price such a hide would at present cost only ten shillings though its nominal price therefore is higher in the present than it was in those ancient times its real price the real quantity of subsistence which it will purchase or command is rather somewhat lower the price of cow hides as stated in the above account is nearly in the common proportion to that of ox hides that of sheepskins is a good deal above it they had probably been sold with the wool that of calf skins on the contrary is greatly below it in countries where the price of cattle is very low the calves which are not intended to be reared in order to keep up the stock are generally killed very young as was the case in scotland twenty or thirty years ago it saves the milk which their price would not pay for their skins therefore are commonly good for little the price of raw hides is a good deal lower at present than it was a few years ago owing probably to the taking of the duty upon sealskins and to the allowing for a limited time the importation of raw hides from ireland and from the plantations duty free which was done in seventeen sixty nine take the whole of the present century at an average their real price has probably been somewhat higher than it was in those ancient times the nature of the commodity renders it not quite so proper for being transported to distant markets as wool it suffers more by keeping a salted hide is reckoned inferior to a fresh one and sells for a lower price this circumstance must necessarily have some tendency to sink the price of raw hides produced in a country which does not manufacture them but is obliged to export them and comparatively to raise that of those produced in a country which does manufacture them it must have some tendency to sink their price in a barbarous and to raise it in an improved and manufacturing country it must have had some tendency therefore to sink it in ancient and to raise it in modern times our tanners besides have not been quite so successful as our clothiers in convincing the wisdom of the nation that the safety of the commonwealth depends upon the prosperity of their particular manufacture they have accordingly been much less favoured the exportation of raw hides has indeed been prohibited and declared a nuisance but their importation from foreign countries has been subjected to a duty and though this duty has been taken off from those of ireland and the plantations for the limited time of five years only yet ireland has not been confined to the market of great britain for the sale of its surplus hides or of those which are not manufactured at home the hides of common cattle have but within these few years been put among the enumerated commodities which the plantations can send nowhere but to the mother country neither has the commerce of ireland been in this case oppressed hitherto in order to support the manufactures of great britain whatever regulations tend to sink the price either of wool or of raw hides below what it naturally would be must in an improved and cultivated country have some tendency to raise the price of butcher's meat the price both of the great and small cattle which are fed on improved and cultivated land must be sufficient to pay the rent which the landlord and the profit which the farmer has reason to expect from improved and cultivated land 
If it is not, they will soon cease to feed them. Whatever part of this price, therefore, is not paid by the wool and the hide, must be paid by the carcass. The less there is paid for the one, the more must be paid for the other. In what manner this price is to be divided upon the different parts of the beast is indifferent to the landlords and farmers, provided it is all paid to them. In an improved and cultivated country, therefore, their interest as landlords and farmers cannot be much affected by such regulations, though their interest as consumers may by the rise in the price of provisions. It would be quite otherwise, however, in an unimproved and uncultivated country, where the greater part of the lands could be applied to no other purpose but the feeding of cattle, and where the wool and the hide made the principal part of the value of those cattle. Their interest as landlords and farmers would in this case be very deeply affected by such regulations, and their interest as consumers very little. The fall in the price of the wool and the hide would not in this case raise the price of the carcass, because the greater part of the lands of the country being applicable to no other purpose but the feeding of cattle, the same number would still continue to be fed. The same quantity of butcher's meat would still come to market. The demand for it would be no greater than before. Its price, therefore, would be the same as before. The whole price of cattle would fall, and along with it both the rent and the profit of all those lands of which cattle was the principal produce, that is, of the greater part of the lands of the country. The perpetual prohibition of the exportation of wool, which is commonly but very falsely ascribed to Edward the Third, would, in the then circumstances of the country, have been the most destructive regulation which could well have been thought of. It would not only have reduced the actual value of the greater part of the lands in the kingdom, but by reducing the price of the most important species of small cattle, it would have retarded very much its subsequent improvement. The wool of Scotland fell very considerably in its price in consequence of the union with England, by which it was excluded from the great market of Europe and confined to the narrow one of Great Britain. The value of the greater part of the lands in the southern countries of Scotland, which are chiefly a sheep country, would have been very deeply affected by this event had not the rise in the price of butcher's meat fully compensated the fall in the price of wool. As the efficacy of human industry in increasing the quantity either of wool or of raw hides is limited, so far as it depends upon the produce of the country where it is exerted, so it is uncertain so far as it depends upon the produce of other countries. It so far depends not so much upon the quantity which they produce as upon that which they do not manufacture, and upon the restraints which they may or may not think proper to impose upon the exportation of this sort of rude produce. These circumstances, as they are altogether independent of domestic industry, so they necessarily render the efficacy of its efforts more or less uncertain. In multiplying this sort of rude produce, therefore, the efficacy of human industry is not only limited, but uncertain. In multiplying another very important sort of rude produce, the quantity of fish that is brought to market, it is likewise both limited and uncertain. It is limited by the local situation of the country, by the proximity or distance of its different provinces from the sea, by the number of its lakes and rivers, and by what may be called the fertility or barrenness of those seas, lakes, and rivers, as to this sort of rude produce. As population increases, as the annual produce of the land and labor of the country grows greater and greater, there come to be more buyers of fish, and those buyers, too, have a greater quantity and variety of other goods, or, what is the same thing, the price of a greater quantity and variety of other goods to buy with. But it will generally be impossible to supply the great and extended market without employing a quantity of labor greater than in proportion to what had been requisite for supplying the narrow and confined one. A market which, from requiring only 1,000, comes to require annually 10,000 ton of fish, can seldom be supplied without employing more than ten times the quantity of labor which had before been sufficient to supply it. The fish must generally be sought for at a greater distance, larger vessels must be employed, and more expensive machinery of every kind made use of. The real price of this commodity, therefore, naturally rises in the progress of improvement. It has accordingly done so, I believe, more or less in every country. Though the success of a particular day's fishing may be a very uncertain matter, yet the local situation of the country being supposed, the general efficacy of industry in bringing a certain quantity of fish to market, taking the course of a year or of several years together, it may perhaps be thought is certain enough, and it no doubt is so. 
as it depends more however upon the local situation of the country than upon the state of its wealth and industry as upon this account it may in different countries be the same in very different periods of improvement and very different in the same period its connection with the state of improvement is uncertain and it is of this sort of uncertainty that i am here speaking in increasing the quantity of the different minerals and metals which are drawn from the bowels of the earth that of the more precious ones particularly the efficacy of human industry seems not to be limited but to be altogether uncertain the quantity of the precious metals which is to be found in any country is not limited by anything in its local situation such as the fertility or barrenness of its own mines those metals frequently abound in countries which possess no mines their quantity in every particular country seems to depend upon two different circumstances first upon its power of purchasing upon the state of its industry upon the annual produce of its land and labour in consequence of which it can afford to employ a greater or a smaller quantity of labour and subsistence in bringing or purchasing such superfluities as gold and silver either from its own mines or from those of other countries and secondly upon the fertility or barrenness of the mines which may happen at any particular time to supply the commercial world with those metals the quantity of those metals in the countries most remote from the mines must be more or less affected by this fertility or barrenness on account of the easy and cheap transportation of those metals of their small bulk and great value their quantity in china and Indostan must have been more or less affected by the abundance of the mines of america so far as their quantity in any particular country depends upon the former of those two circumstances the power of purchasing their real price like that of all other luxuries and superfluities is likely to rise with the wealth and improvement of the country and to fall with its poverty and depression countries which have a great quantity of labour and subsistence to spare can afford to purchase any particular quantity of those metals at the expense of a greater quantity of labour and subsistence than countries which have less to spare so far as their quantity in any particular country depends upon the latter of those two circumstances the fertility or barrenness of the mines which happen to supply the commercial world their real price the real quantity of labour and subsistence which they will purchase or exchange for will no doubt sink more or less in proportion to the fertility and rise in proportion to the barrenness of those mines the fertility or barrenness of the mines however which may happen at any particular time to supply the commercial world is a circumstance which it is evident may have no sort of connection with the state of industry in a particular country it seems even to have no very necessary connection with that of the world in general as arts and commerce indeed gradually spread themselves over a greater and a greater part of the earth the search for new mines being extended over a wider surface may have somewhat a better chance for being successful than when confined within narrower bounds the discovery of new mines however as the old ones come to be gradually exhausted is a matter of the greatest uncertainty and such as no human skill or industry can ensure all indications it is acknowledged are doubtful and the actual discovery and successful working of a new mine can alone ascertain the reality of its value or even of its existence in this search there seem to be no certain limits either to the possible success or to the possible disappointment of human industry in the course of a century or two it is possible that new mines may be discovered more fertile than any that have ever yet been known and it is just equally possible that the most fertile mine then known may be more barren than any that was wrought before the discovery of the mines of america whether the one or the other of those two events may happen to take place is of very little importance to the real wealth and prosperity of the world to the real value of the annual produce of the land and labour of mankind its nominal value the quantity of gold and silver by which this annual produce could be expressed or represented would no doubt be very different but its real value the real quantity of labour which it could purchase or command would be precisely the same a shilling might in the one case represent no more labour than a penny does at present and a penny in the other might represent as much as a shilling does now but in the one case he who had a shilling in his pocket would be no richer than he who has a penny at present and in the other he who had a penny would be just as rich as he who has a shilling now the cheapness and abundance of gold and silver plate would be the sole advantage which the world could derive from the one event and the dearness and scarcity of those trifling superfluities the only inconveniency it could suffer from the other end of book one chapter eleven part seven
Part 8 of Chapter 11 of Book 1 of The Wealth of Nations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Part 8 of Chapter 11 of Book 1 of The Rent of Land. Conclusion of the Digression Concerning the Variations in the Value of Silver the greater part of the writers who have collected the money price of things in ancient times seem to have considered the low money price of corn and of goods in general or in other words the high value of gold and silver as a proof not only of the scarcity of those metals but of the poverty and barbarism of the country at the time when it took place this notion is connected with the system of political economy which represents national wealth as consisting in the abundance and national poverty in the scarcity of gold and silver a system which i shall endeavour to explain and examine at a great length in the fourth book of this inquiry i shall only observe at present that the high value of the precious metals can be no proof of the poverty or barbarism of any particular country at the time when it took place it is a proof only of the barrenness of the mines which happened at that time to supply the commercial world a poor country as it cannot afford to buy more so it can as little afford to pay dearer for gold and silver than a rich one and the value of those metals therefore is not likely to be higher in the former than in the latter in china a country much richer than any part of europe the value of the precious metals is much higher than in any part of europe as the wealth of europe indeed has increased greatly since the discovery of the mines of america so the value of gold and silver are gradually diminished this diminution of their value however has not been owing to the increase of the real wealth of europe of the annual produce of its land and labour but to the accidental discovery of more abundant mines than any that were known before the increase of the quantity of gold and silver in europe and the increase of its manufactures and agriculture are two events which though they have happened nearly about the same time yet have risen from very different causes and have scarce any natural connection with one another the one has arisen from a mere accident in which neither prudence nor policy either had or could have any share the other from the fall of the feudal system and from the establishment of a government which afforded to industry the only encouragement which it requires some tolerable security that it shall enjoy the fruits of its own labour poland where the feudal system still continues to take place is at this day as beggarly a country as it was before the discovery of america the money price of corn however has risen the real value of the precious metals has fallen in poland in the same manner as in other parts of europe their quantity therefore must have increased there as in other places and nearly in the same proportion to the annual produce of its land and labour this increase of the quantity of those metals however has not it seems increased that annual produce has neither improved the manufactures and agriculture of the country nor mended the circumstances of its inhabitants spain and portugal the countries which possess the mines are after poland perhaps the two most beggarly countries in europe the value of the precious metals however must be lower in spain and portugal than in any other part of europe as they come from those countries to all other parts of europe loaded not only with a freight and an insurance but with the expense of smuggling their exportation being either prohibited or subjected to a duty in proportion to the annual produce of the land and labour therefore their quantity must be greater in those countries than in any other part of europe those countries however are poorer than the greater part of europe though the feudal system has been abolished in spain and portugal it has not been succeeded by a much better as the low value of gold and silver therefore is no proof of the wealth and flourishing state of the country where it takes place so neither is their high value or the low money price either of goods in general or of corn in particular any proof of its poverty and barbarism but though the low money price either of goods in general or of corn in particular be no proof of the poverty or barbarism of the times the low money price of some particular sorts of goods such as cattle poultry game of all kinds etc in proportion to that of corn is a most decisive one it clearly demonstrates first their great abundance in proportion to that of corn and consequently the great extent of the land which they occupied in proportion to what was occupied by corn 
and secondly the low value of this land in proportion to that of corn land and consequently the uncultivated and unimproved state of the far greater part of the lands of the country it clearly demonstrates that the stock and population of the country did not bear the same proportion to the extent of its territory which they commonly do in civilized countries and that society was at that time and in that country but in its infancy from the high or low money price either of goods in general or of corn in particular we can infer only that the mines which at that time happened to supply the commercial world with gold and silver were fertile or barren not that the country was rich or poor but from the high or low money price of some sorts of goods in proportion to that of others we can infer with a degree of probability that approaches almost to certainty that it was rich or poor that the greater part of its lands were improved or unimproved and that it was either in a more or less barbarous state or in a more or less civilized one any rise in the money price of goods which proceeded altogether from the degradation of the value of silver would affect all sorts of goods equally and raise their price universally a third or a fourth or a fifth part higher according as silver happened to lose a third or a fourth or a fifth part of its former value but the rise in the price of provisions which has been the subject of so much reasoning and conversation does not affect all sorts of provisions equally taking the course of the present century at an average the price of corn it is acknowledged even by those who account for this rise by the degradation of the value of silver has risen much less than that of some other sorts of provisions the rise in the price of those other sorts of provisions therefore cannot be owing altogether to the degradation of the value of silver some other causes must be taken into the account and those which have been above assigned will perhaps without having recourse to the supposed degradation of the value of silver sufficiently explain this rise in those particular sorts of provisions of which the price has actually risen in proportion to that of corn as to the price of corn itself it has during the sixty-four first years of the present century and before the late extraordinary course of bad seasons been somewhat lower than it was during the sixty-four last years of the preceding century this fact is attested not only by the accounts of windsor market but by the public fires of all the different counties of scotland and by the accounts of several different markets in france which have been collected with great diligence and fidelity by mr Massant's and by mr dupre de Saint the evidence is more complete than could well have been expected in a matter which is naturally so very difficult to be ascertained as to the high price of corn during these last ten or twelve years it can be sufficiently accounted for from the badness of the seasons without supposing any degradation in the value of silver the opinion therefore that silver is continually sinking in its value seems not to be founded upon any good observations either upon the prices of corn or upon those of other provisions the same quantity of silver it may perhaps be said will in the present times even according to the account which has been here given purchase a much smaller quantity of several sorts of provisions than it would have done during some part of the last century and to ascertain whether this change be owing to a rise in the value of those goods or to a fall in the value of silver is only to establish a vain and useless distinction which can be of no sort of service to the man who has only a certain quantity of silver to go to market with or a certain fixed revenue in money i certainly do not pretend that the knowledge of this distinction will enable him to buy cheaper it may not however upon that account be altogether useless it may be of some use to the public by affording an easy proof of the prosperous condition of the country if the rise in the price of some sorts of provisions be owing altogether to a fall in the value of silver it is owing to a circumstance from which nothing can be inferred but the fertility of the american mines the real wealth of the country the annual produce of its land and labor may notwithstanding this circumstance be either gradually declining as in portugal and poland or gradually advancing as in most other parts of europe but if this rise in the price of some sorts of provisions be owing to a rise in the real value of the land which produces them to its increased fertility or in consequence of more extended improvement and good cultivation to its having been rendered fit for producing corn it is owing to a circumstance which indicates in the clearest manner the prosperous and advancing state of the country the land constitutes by far the greatest the most important and the most durable part of the wealth of every extensive country 
it may surely be of some use or at least it may give some satisfaction to the public to have so decisive a proof of the increasing value of by far the greatest the most important and the most durable part of its wealth it may too be of some use to the public in regulating the pecuniary reward of some of its inferior servants if this rise in the price of some sorts of provisions be owing to a fall in the value of silver their pecuniary reward provided it was not too large before ought certainly to be augmented in proportion to the extent of this fall if it is not augmented their real recompense will evidently be so much diminished but if this rise of price is owing to the increased value in consequence of the improved fertility of the land which produces such provisions it becomes a much nicer matter to judge either in what proportion any pecuniary reward ought to be augmented or whether it ought to be augmented at all the extension of improvement and cultivation as it necessarily raises more or less in proportion to the price of corn that of every sort of animal food so it as necessarily lowers that of i believe every sort of vegetable food it raises the price of animal food because a great part of the land which produces it being rendered fit for producing corn must afford to the landlord and the farmer the rent and profit of corn land it lowers the price of vegetable food because by increasing the fertility of the land it increases its abundance the improvements of agriculture too introduce many sorts of vegetable food which requiring less land and not more labour than corn come much cheaper to market such are potatoes and maize or what is called indian corn the two most important improvements which the agriculture of europe perhaps which europe itself has received from the great extension of its commerce and navigation many sorts of vegetable food besides which in the rude state of agriculture are confined to the kitchen garden and raised only by the spade come in its improved state to be introduced into common fields and to be raised by the plough such as turnips carrots cabbages etc if in the progress of improvement therefore the real price of one species of food necessarily rises that of another as necessarily falls and it becomes a matter of more nicety to judge how far the rise in the one may be compensated by the fall in the other when the real price of butcher's meat has once got to its height which with regard to every sort except perhaps that of hog's flesh it seems to have done through a great part of england more than a century ago any rise which can afterwards happen in that of any other sort of animal food cannot much affect the circumstances of the inferior ranks of people the circumstances of the poor through a great part of england cannot surely be so much distressed by any rise in the price of poultry fish wild fowl or venison as they must be relieved by the fall in that of potatoes in the present season of scarcity the high price of corn no doubt distresses the poor but in times of moderate plenty when corn is at its ordinary or average price the natural rise in the price of any other sort of rude produce cannot much affect them they suffer more perhaps by the artificial rise which has been occasioned by taxes in the price of some manufactured commodities as of salt soap leather candles malt beer ale etc effects of the progress of improvement upon the real price of manufactures it is the natural effect of improvement however to diminish gradually the real price of almost all manufactures that of the manufacturing workmanship diminishes perhaps in all of them without exception in consequence of better machinery of greater dexterity and of a more proper division and distribution of work all of which are the natural effects of improvement a much smaller quantity of labour becomes requisite for executing any particular piece of work and though in consequence of the flourishing circumstances of the society the real price of labour should rise very considerably yet the great diminution of the quantity will generally much more than compensate the greatest rise which can happen in the price there are indeed a few manufactures in which the necessary rise in the real price of the rude materials will more than compensate all the advantages which improvement can introduce into the execution of the work in carpenters and joiners work and in the coarser sort of cabinet work the necessary rise in the real price of barren timber in consequence of the improvement of land will more than compensate all the advantages which can be derived from the best machinery the greatest dexterity and the most proper division and distribution of work but in all cases in which the real price of the rude material either does not rise at all or does not rise very much that of the manufactured commodity sinks very considerably 
this diminution of price has in the course of the present and preceding century been most remarkable in those manufactures of which the materials are the coarser metals a better movement of a watch than about the middle of the last century could have been bought for twenty pounds may now perhaps be had for twenty shillings in the work of cutlers and locksmiths in all the toys which are made of the coarser metals and in all those goods which are commonly known by the name of birmingham and sheffield ware there has been during the same period a very great reduction of price though not altogether so great as in watchwork it has however been sufficient to astonish the workmen of every other part of europe who in many cases acknowledge that they can produce no work of equal goodness for double or even for triple the price there are perhaps no manufactures in which the division of labour can be carried further or in which the machinery employed admits of a greater variety of improvements than those of which the materials are the coarser metals in the clothing manufacture there has during the same period been no such sensible reduction of price the price of superfine cloth, I have been assured, on the contrary, has, within these five and twenty or thirty years, risen somewhat in proportion to its quality, owing, it was said, to a considerable rise in the price of the material which consists altogether of Spanish wool. That of the Yorkshire cloth, which is made altogether of English wool, is said, indeed, during the course of the present century, to have fallen a good deal in proportion to its quality quality however is so very disputable a matter that i look upon all information of this kind as somewhat uncertain in the clothing manufacture the division of labour is nearly the same now as it was a century ago and the machinery employed is not very different there may however have been some small improvements in both which may have occasioned some reduction of price but the reduction will appear much more sensible and undeniable if we compare the price of this manufacture in the present times with what it was in a much remoter period towards the end of the fifteenth century when the labour was probably much less subdivided and the machinery employed was much more imperfect than it is at present in fourteen eighty seven being the fourth of henry the seventh it was enacted that whosoever shall sell by retail a broad yard of the finest scarlet grain or of other grain cloth of the finest making above sixteen shillings shall forfeit forty shillings for every yard so sold sixteen shillings therefore containing about the same quantity of silver as four and twenty shillings of our present money was at that time reckoned not an unreasonable price for a yard of the finest cloth and as this is a sumptuary law such cloth it is probable had usually been sold somewhat dearer a guinea may be reckoned the highest price in the present times even though the quality of the cloths therefore should be supposed equal and that of the present times is most probably much superior yet even upon this supposition the money price of the finest cloth appears to have been considerably reduced since the end of the fifteenth century but its real price has been much more reduced six shillings and eightpence was then and long afterwards reckoned the average price of a quarter of wheat sixteen shillings therefore was the price of two quarters and more than three bushels of wheat valuing a quarter of wheat in the present times at eight and twenty shillings the real price of a yard of fine cloth must in those times have been equal to at least three pounds six shillings and sixpence of our present money the man who bought it must have parted with the command of a quantity of labour and subsistence equal to what that sum would purchase in the present times the reduction in the real price of the coarse manufacture though considerable has not been so great as in that of the fine in fourteen sixty three being the third of edward the fourth it was enacted that no servant in husbandry nor common labourer nor servant to any artificer inhabiting out of a city or borough shall use or wear in their clothing any cloth above two shillings the broad yard in the third of edward the fourth two shillings contained very nearly the same quantity of silver as four of our present money but the yorkshire cloth which is now sold at four shillings the yard is probably much superior to any that was then made for the wearing of the very poorest order of common servants even the money price of their clothing therefore may in proportion to the quality be somewhat cheaper in the present than it was in those ancient times the real price is certainly a good deal cheaper tenpence was then reckoned what is called the moderate and reasonable price of a bushel of wheat two shillings therefore was the price of two bushels and near two pecks of wheat which in the present times at three shillings and sixpence the bushel would be worth eight shillings and ninepence 
for a yard of this cloth the poor servant must have parted with the power of purchasing a quantity of subsistence equal to what eight shillings and ninepence would purchase in the present times this is a sumptuary law too restraining the luxury and extravagance of the poor their clothing therefore had commonly been much more expensive the same order of people are by the same law prohibited from wearing hose of which the price should exceed fourteen pence the pair equal to about eight and twenty pence of our present money but fourteen pence was in those times the price of a bushel and near two pecks of wheat which in the present times at three and sixpence the bushel would cost five shillings and threepence we should in the present times consider this as a very high price for a pair of stockings to a servant of the poorest and lowest order he must however in those times have paid what was really equivalent to this price for them in the time of edward the fourth the art of knitting stockings was probably not known in any part of europe their hose were made of common cloth which may have been one of the causes of their dearness the first person that wore stockings in england is said to have been queen elizabeth she received them as a present from the spanish ambassador but in the coarse and in the fine woollen manufacture the machinery employed was much more imperfect in those ancient than it is in the present times it has since received three very capital improvements besides probably many smaller ones of which it may be difficult to ascertain either the number or the importance the three capital improvements are first the exchange of the rock and spindle for the spinning wheel which with the same quantity of labour will perform more than double the quantity of work secondly the use of several very ingenious machines which facilitate and abridge in a still greater proportion the winding of the worsted and woollen yarn or the proper arrangement of the warp and woof before they are put into the loom an operation which previous to the invention of those machines must have been extremely tedious and troublesome thirdly the employment of the fulling mill for thickening the cloth instead of treading it in water neither wind nor water mills of any kind were known in england so early as the beginning of the sixteenth century nor so far as i know in any other part of europe north of the alps they had been introduced into italy some time before the consideration of these circumstances may perhaps in some measure explain to us why the real price both of the coarse and of the fine manufacture was so much higher in those ancient than it is in the present times it cost a greater quantity of labor to bring the goods to market when they were brought thither therefore they must have purchased or exchanged for the price of a greater quantity the coarse manufacture probably was in those ancient times carried on in england in the same manner as it always has been in countries where arts and manufactures are in their infancy it was probably a household manufacture in which every different part of the work was occasionally performed by all the different members of almost every private family but so as to be their work only when they had nothing else to do and not to be the principal business from which any of them derived the greater part of their subsistence the work which is performed in this manner it has already been observed comes always much cheaper to market than that which is the principal or sole fund of the workman's subsistence the fine manufacture on the other hand was not in those times carried on in england but in the rich and commercial country of flanders and it was probably conducted then in the same manner as now by people who derived the whole or the principal part of their subsistence from it it was besides a foreign manufacture and must have paid some duty the ancient custom of tonnage and poundage at least to the king this duty indeed would not probably be very great it was not then the policy of europe to restrain by high duties the importation of foreign manufactures but rather to encourage it in order that merchants might be enabled to supply at as easy a rate as possible the great men with the conveniencies and luxuries which they wanted and which the industry of their own country could not afford them the consideration of these circumstances may perhaps in some measure explain to us why in those ancient times the real price of the coarse manufacture was in proportion to that of the fine so much lower than in the present times conclusion of the chapter i shall conclude this very long chapter with observing that every improvement in the circumstances of the society tends either directly or indirectly to raise the real rent of land to increase the real wealth of the landlord his power of purchasing the labour or the produce of the labour of other people the extension of improvement and cultivation tends to raise it directly 
the landlord's share of the produce necessarily increases with the increase of the produce that rise in the real price of those parts of the rude produce of land which is first the effect of the extended improvement and cultivation and afterwards the cause of their being still further extended the rise in the price of cattle for example tends too to raise the rent of land directly and in a still greater proportion the real value of the landlord's share his real command of the labour of other people not only rises with the real value of the produce but the proportion of his share to the whole produce rises with it that produce after the rise in its real price requires no more labour to collect it than before a smaller proportion of it will therefore be sufficient to replace with the ordinary profit the stock which employs that labour a greater proportion of it must consequently belong to the landlord all those improvements in the productive powers of labor which tend directly to reduce the rent price of manufacturers tend indirectly to raise the real rent of land the landlord exchanges that part of his rude produce which is over and above his own consumption or what comes to the same thing the price of that part of it for manufactured produce whatever reduces the real price of the latter raises that of the former an equal quantity of the former becomes thereby equivalent to a greater quantity of the latter and the landlord is enabled to purchase a greater quantity of the conveniencies ornaments or luxuries which he has occasion for every increase in the real wealth of the society every increase in the quantity of useful labor employed within it tends indirectly to raise the real rent of land a certain proportion of this labor naturally goes to the land a greater number of men and cattle are employed in its cultivation the produce increases with the increase of the stock which is thus employed in raising it and the rent increases with the produce the contrary circumstances the neglect of cultivation and improvement the fall in the real price of any part of the rude produce of land the rise in the real price of manufactures from the decay of manufacturing art and industry the declension of the real wealth of the society all tend on the other hand to lower the real rent of land to reduce the real wealth of the landlord to diminish his power of purchasing either the labor or the produce of the labor of other people the whole annual produce of the land and labor of every country or what comes to the same thing the whole price of that annual produce naturally divides itself it has already been observed into three parts the rent of land the wages of labor and the profits of stock and constitutes a revenue to three different orders of people to those who live by rent to those who live by wages and to those who live by profit these are the three great original and constituent orders of every civilized society from whose revenue that of every other order is ultimately derived the interest of the first of those three great orders it appears from what has been just now said is strictly and inseparably connected with the general interest of the society whatever either promotes or obstructs the one necessarily promotes or obstructs the other when the public deliberates concerning any regulation of commerce or police the proprietors of land never can mislead it with a view to promote the interest of their own particular order at least if they have any tolerable knowledge of that interest they are indeed too often defective in this tolerable knowledge they are the only one of the three orders whose revenue costs them neither labor nor care but comes to them as it were of its own accord and independent of any plan or project of their own that indolence which is the natural effect of the ease and security of their situation renders them too often not only ignorant but incapable of that application of mind which is necessary in order to foresee and understand the consequence of any public regulation the interest of the second order that of those who live by wages is as strictly connected with the interest of the society as that of the first the wages of the laborer it has already been shown are never so high as when the demand for labor is continually rising or when the quantity employed is every year increasing considerably when this real wealth of the society becomes stationary his wages are soon reduced to what is barely enough to enable him to bring up a family or to continue the race of laborers when the society declines they fall even below this the order of proprietors may perhaps gain more by the prosperity of the society than that of laborers but there is no order that suffers so cruelly from its decline 
but though the interest of the labourer is strictly connected with that of the society he is incapable either of comprehending that interest or of understanding its connection with his own his condition leaves him no time to receive the necessary information and his education and habits are commonly such as to render him unfit to judge even though he was fully informed in the public deliberations therefore his voice is little heard and less regarded except upon particular occasions when his clamour is animated set on and supported by his employers not for his but their own particular purposes his employers constitute the third order that of those who live by profit it is the stock that is employed for the sake of profit which puts into motion the greater part of the useful labour of every society the plans and projects of the employers of stock regulate and direct all the most important operation of labour and profit is the end proposed by all those plans and projects but the rate of profit does not like rent and wages rise with the prosperity and fall with the declension of the society on the contrary it is naturally low in rich and high in poor countries and it is always highest in the countries which are going fastest to ruin the interest of this third order therefore has not the same connection with the general interest of the society as that of the other two merchants and master manufacturers are in this order the two classes of people who commonly employ the largest capitals and who by their wealth draw to themselves the greatest share of the public consideration as during their whole lives they are engaged in plans and projects they have frequently more acuteness of understanding than the greater part of country gentlemen as their thoughts however are commonly exercised rather about the interest of their own particular branch of business than about that of the society their judgment even when given with the greatest candour which it has not been upon every occasion is much more to be depended upon with regard to the former of those two objects than with regard to the latter their superiority over the country gentlemen is not so much in their knowledge of the public interest as in their having a better knowledge of their own interest than he has of his it is by this superior knowledge of their own interest that they have frequently imposed upon his generosity and persuaded him to give up both his own interest and that of the public from a very simple but honest conviction that their interest and not his was the interest of the public the interest of the dealers however in any particular branch of trade or manufactures is always in some respects different from and even opposite to that of the public to widen the market and to narrow the competition is always the interest of the dealers to widen the market may frequently be agreeable enough to the interest of the public but to narrow the competition must always be against it and can only serve to enable the dealers by raising their profits above what they naturally would be to levy for their own benefit an absurd tax upon the rest of their fellow-citizens the proposal of any new law or regulation of commerce which comes from this order ought always to be listened to with great precaution and ought never to be adopted till after having been long and carefully examined not only with the most scrupulous but with the most suspicious attention it comes from an order of men whose interest is never exactly the same with that of the public who have generally an interest to deceive and even to oppress the public and who accordingly have upon many occasions both deceived and oppressed it end of book one chapter eleven part eight end of book one of the wealth of nations of the causes of improvement in the productive powers of labor and of the order according to which its produce is naturally distributed among the different ranks of the people.